attending. Um, I think almost everyone was able to attend the 90 minute kickoff online only meeting that we had uh, on July 13th. But there are a few who uh, are newer to this group and so just by way of background, uh, we didn't uh, take on much substantive things at the meeting. We were mostly organizational. Uh, we were focused on um, organizing the working group. So we now have Virginia as chair and Marshall as vice chair as well as we um, went over the study scope and the timing. And we'll talk more about the schedule uh, at the end of the meeting today, but it remains fixed. So you know when the meeting dates and times and locations are uh, at least through June of 2022. Those are the only ones that are um, hard fixed. We may not even need meetings after that, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, also at that last or the, the first meeting, the kickoff meeting, we um, put in front of you a draft description of the transportation revenue challenge that this working group has been tasked with taking on. And that came from Assembly Bill 413 and the legislature. So that is what we did last time. Today, the theme of the meeting really is trying to understand the transportation context in Nevada. And that means more than just the roadways, it's the whole system, all the elements, 
that have to operate as a connected network, as well as um, another dimension of transportation now, which is the energy and environmental imperatives to reduce emissions from the carbon, uh, carbon emissions from transportation. Um, the highlight of this meeting really is hearing directly from the owners and operators and trustees of the various elements of Nevada's transportation system. That's the MPOs as well as the state DOT. And by extension, uh, the counties obviously have a big role as well. At the end of the meeting, uh, we will revisit that draft uh, revenue challenge statement. I think maybe we should start calling it a charter because it's what this group will be doing uh, through at least June of next year. And that's all I have. Chair. Any questions about any of what um, Jeff just covered? Thank you. Jeff, do we have, I think, um, Morgan Cammy, the briefing book that you put out, do we have a chance to update that? Because we, we've got, we've got uh, new numbers in terms of our unfunded needs and like to, to make sure we, that we're able to implement that in the book. Yes, that's good. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, all of the advisory working group members received a background briefing book. It, it's really more like a elaborate brochure. It's high cliff and it was not, um, well, let me put it this way. It was the consultant team uh, trying to interpret what we understood to be the, the situations in each of the regions. Um, there are some updates that are needed that we've learned since we published that for you. So what we'd like to do then is treat it like a living document for the members. And we'll update that. Um, in fact, we'll have an open room call for possible changes and amendments to it, and we'll just update it and send it back out. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? <coughs> All right, the next item on our agenda is an overview of transportation revenue sources and uses in Nevada. Travis Dunn is going to give us a presentation. So, Travis, can we have you? He's giving us. Uh, presentation remotely. So um, Travis, if you are ready, can we kind of do a sound check with you and make sure everyone can hear you? Uh, yes. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you, Chair. Yes, you sound like you're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Well, um, thank you for the introduction and good, good morning, everybody. I'm disappointed I couldn't be with you in person today, but I'm grateful that you're willing to hear this portion of the program remotely. Uh, I will cover sources and uses of transportation revenue in Nevada, which will be a summary level presentation of the material in section three of your briefing books, which as Jeff just mentioned is subject to some updates, a few of which we will actually cover in this presentation. At the conclusion of the presentation, uh, there's, pl there's plenty of time for questions and comments that you may have about it or about the briefing materials on this topic, but please also feel free to interrupt me as we go with any clarifying questions you may have. Uh, in the briefing materials, you may recall it, we started out with some basic demographic information about Nevada and a profile of the state's infrastructure in section two. But then right after that, we thought the best place to start background materials for this working group was sources and uses of transportation revenue. So we'll move right into the subject at hand. What we will cover today are descriptions of existing transportation revenue mechanisms in Nevada. Specifically, we will cover taxes and fees that apply to the transportation sector, which it turns out are generally imposed on the users of the system. For each mechanism, we will cover the four things shown on the screen now. We'll describe what the mechanism is and how it works. We will describe the tax and fee rates for each mechanism. We'll quantify how much money is generated by each mechanism annually. And then finally, we will describe where that money goes. Next slide, please. There are a few items that we will not cover today. I want to mention them now in case you are specifically anticipating these topics, and I want to assure you that we will cover them in future briefing materials and meeting presentations. So first, we will explore in future meetings in more detail how the impacts of transportation funding in Nevada are distributed across the state. Specifically, we want to break down who pays the various taxes and fees by household attributes like type of vehicle driven, geographic location in the state, and where possible uh, by income level. We will also cover expected future trends for these existing revenue mechanisms under existing policy. We'll have a little preview of that topic in a few of the presentations later today, but we will reserve a more complete presentation of future forecasts for future meetings. So with that, we'll turn to the big picture. 
Looking at transportation taxes and fees in Nevada, we find that Nevada residents contributed over $1.4 billion in 2020 in transportation taxes and fees. Now, to be precise, this number includes transportation revenue generated from within Nevada, including local funding. However, it does not include three important items. These are not insignificant. The first is federal funding, uh, proceeds from the sale of bonds, and then transfers from general funds at the state and local levels. These three items are critical pieces of the infrastructure funding puzzle, but we will not delve as deeply into them for several reasons. Uh, first, for federal funding, uh, as the advisory working group focuses on state transportation funding policy, uh, it's of course critical that we understand and appreciate the role of federal funding in Nevada, but we devote less analysis to it, uh, basically because we regard it as outside of the state's control. We will have later today a, a presentation of the historical trends, which we can draw on to understand what federal funding levels have historically been and what they're available for. So for example, in 2020, the state received about $350 million in federal funding. That number has fluctuated over the past decade, ranging from a low of about 300 million to a high of nearly 500 million. It averages about $375 million per year. Also throughout this effort, uh, we will be monitoring the evolving conversations in Washington with regard to the infrastructure bill that is before the Senate as we speak, and later this year, potentially reauthorization of federal transportation funding bill. But needless to say, whatever we assume about the future of federal funding is subject to a high degree of uncertainty and opinion. Uh, next is bond proceeds. Um, although proceeds from the sale of bonds do represent cash available to invest in infrastructure, they are not truly a revenue source in the same way that a mortgage is not truly a revenue, revenue source for uh, purchasing a home. Uh, bonds are debt that must be repaid from other revenue sources. So for example, NDOT estimates debt service on its outstanding bonds will cost between 60 and $70 million per year through 2030. The state did not generate revenue from bond sales for transportation in 2020 and to the extent that we consider bonds as part of a long-term transportation funding solution of course would be necessary to identify revenue sources to repay them finally and probably most significantly are general fund transfers historically at the state level general fund transfers are not a meaningful source of transportation funding but they do provide significant levels of funding at the local levels so for purposes of laying out transportation revenue mechanisms, we did not break down all of the general fund sources used to invest in local transportation uh, infrastructure by cities, counties, RTCs, and other local agencies. But as a policy question, devoting general fund revenue to transportation is certainly an option at both the state and local levels. Uh, for example, the largest source of funding for the RTC of Southern Nevada is sales taxes, which generated about $225 million in 2020 and accounts for nearly 40% of the agency's revenue. We'll hear more about the importance of local sales taxes as a source of funding in presentations later today. But for now, we're going to break down this $1.4 billion pie in several ways. We'll start by going right into the lar uh, largest single component, which is also the most complex piece of the puzzle, and that is fuel taxes. So for the next few minutes, I'll try to be as precise as possible in the language that we use, uh, but I'm going to simplify a few of the technical details in the interest of hopefully presenting the big picture in an understandable way. So breaking down that $646 million piece of the pie, for the next slide, we'll start with some terminology. Um, first, uh, we hear several terms colloquially to refer to fuel taxes gas tax, fuel tax, gasoline tax, and others. In state law, Nevada, like most states, separates the taxation of fuels into two primary categories. First is motor vehicle fuel, and second is special fuel. Motor vehicle fuel is mostly gasoline, but it also includes some other liquid fuels like ethanol. These are all treated the same for tax purposes. In general, motor vehicle fuel is meant to apply as a user fee to passenger cars, of which the vast majority are powered by gasoline today. The second category is special fuels, which is mostly diesel. Uh, the statutes on special fuels taxes differ from statutes on motor vehicle fuels taxes in several important ways, most notably the rate of taxation, but also uh, the type of refunds available and also how interstate motor carriers are treated. Special fuel taxes are designed primarily to capture revenue from heavy vehicles to cover the, their costs of road use since the majority of heavy vehicles are powered by diesel. 
So for shorthand, we might you might hear motor vehicle fuel tax is being referred to as the gasoline tax or the gas tax, and you might hear the special fuel tax be referred to as the diesel tax. Technically, there's a little bit more to it than that, but those are the, the two primary types of fuel covered in those two categories. And often you will hear both taxes lumped together and just called the gas tax, but it's important to recognize that there are important distinctions between these categories. Next, we'll talk about state versus county taxes. So in Nevada, fuel taxes are all created in state law, but they come in two general flavors. First, there are state fuel taxes, which are imposed by the state on all motor vehicle fuel and special fuel supplied in the state. Next are county fuel taxes, which are also created in state statute, but they're put into effect by counties either through local ordinances or elections. County fuel taxes apply only to the fuel supplied within the boundaries of the county, and the rates differ from county to county, as we will see shortly. Uh, it gets complicated here a bit because there is a portion of the state fuel tax that by statute is distributed to local governments, counties and cities. And in the other direction, there is a small portion of some county fuel tax, specifically in Clark County, that it goes to the state highway fund, that is to NDOT. Uh, for use on highway projects in Clark County. We will factor these distinctions into some of our calculations that you'll see in a moment and some info infographics, but for the most part, state fuel taxes go to the state and county fuel taxes go to the counties. Finally, uh, excise fuel taxes versus indexing. Uh, like most states, Nevada has state fuel excise taxes. That is a fixed tax per gallon of fuel supplied in the state. But Nevada also has indexing, which is additional components of the excise tax calculated based on measures of inflation in the prior year. So the excise components and the index components of fuel taxation in Nevada are the most complex part of the statute and the calculations. But by and large, with a few small exceptions, indexing applies to the county portion of fuel taxes. OK. Um, OK, this was animated, but I'll talk through it next. Uh, we'll talk about how fuel taxes are actually collected and paid because um, you may have heard the term pay at the pump to refer to fuel taxes, but this is not strictly correct. Uh, in Nevada, as in most states, taxation of fuels generally occurs upstream on the suppliers or distributors of fuel. It doesn't apply directly on in consumers or motorists. So what we're going to do is follow a barrel of oil and you see a little barrel in the upper left corner. We'll follow that barrel of oil through the supply chain to understand where and how the various products of fuel are taxed and collected and how that money ultimately finds its way to, or excuse me, how that tax ultimately finds its way to in consumers' pockets. So in 2020, the average barrel of oil in the U.S. went into refineries and out came 19.4 gallons of gasoline, 12 and a half gallons of diesel, 4.4 gallons of jet fuel and 6.5 gallons of other products, largely uh, plastics and inputs that went back into the refining process. Refined fuel in Nevada comes largely from California and some from Utah by pipeline into the state where it is stored in tanks called those terminal racks. Jet fuel goes by pipeline generally directly to tanks at airports. It's taxed separately there. But focusing in on the next slide on the gasoline and diesel components or motor vehicle fuel and special fuel, if we could slip to the next one, there we go. Uh, the liquid fuel is stored in tanks and these are the little blue tanks illustrated here. Um, when the fuel is removed from those tanks, it goes into tanker trucks that deliver them to fueling stations. Fuel tax is paid by the suppliers at this point in the supply chain. Uh, when the fuel is, is uh, delivered into the tanks or removed from the tanks, depending on the circumstance. Um, the tax is paid, the federal tax to the IRS and the state and county fuel taxes to the Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV. The cost of this tax is passed on in the price that is paid down the chain to the distributor tanker and ultimately it's reflected in the price that consumers pay at the pump. But consumers don't literally pay the tax. It's paid over on the left by the suppliers. And in statute, we have a definition of suppliers that includes anyone who imports fuel from out of state or otherwise acquires previously untaxed fuel, anyone who produces or refines fuel, and there is some fuel refined in Nevada, and anyone who exports fuel for use out of state. By statute, the suppliers who pay the fuel tax will get to keep 2% of the gross tax amount that they owe. 
this is meant to reflect factors like their cost of accounting and, and collecting that tax, but also evaporation and spillage of fuel as it goes down the chain. There is nothing in statute that requires suppliers to pass on the precise cost of the fuel tax. They don't need to include it on receipts, for example, or invoices to end consumers. But as a practical matter, those tax costs are fully recovered by the suppliers and passed on fully uh, to the end consumers at the pump. So while you don't literally pay it at the pump, you effectively do. So that's how the fuel taxes are, are collected. Uh, if that wasn't complicated enough, we're going to do a quick detour to talk about IFTA. Uh, question? Yeah, so hey, Jeff, just so everybody knows, I know Julie knows and I know, how many entities in Nevada actually pay the fuel tax? Well, in Nevada, and it's you know the same nationwide. Less than 300. So we're collecting taxes from less than 300 entities for fuel. So those suppliers, the number of them is about 300, right? Yes. I think the federal uh, number is a similar number, the federal tax, because it tends to be applied at the refinery level. So there's a small number of federal taxpayers for the federal fuel tax as well. Exactly, which I just think that's an important component when we talk about fuel tax for everybody to know, because when you're going and auditing folks, it's not like you're auditing the 25 or 2600 gas stations in the state or you're auditing every vehicle. You're auditing 300 entities nationwide. All right. Good point. Thank you for that <laughs> clarification. Um, IFTA is the International Fuel Tax Agreement. This is a little bit different. Um, the question often arises when we're talking about fuel taxes, how do interstate motor carriers pay and how do, the, how do the states make sure that they get the tax to the right place where the driving actually occurred by the heavy vehicles? And the answer is IFTA. So I'm going to try not to get too far into the weeds, but this slide illustrates and it was animated, but I'll talk through it. This is just one example. Imagine you are a motor carrier and you're starting a trip in Reno and you fill your tank there with 140 gallons of diesel fuel, which is taxed at a rate of 27 cents per gallon. So for that, uh, for that tank, you paid $37.80 in state fuel tax to the state of Nevada, effectively. From there, you drive to Fresno, pick up a load, and then perhaps continue on to Las Vegas. So if we do the math, the first leg of your trip to Fresno was 300 miles, and 10 of those miles were in Nevada. We assume that your rig gets five miles per gallon, so uh, you burn 60 of those gallons on the first leg. On the second leg of the trip, you drove 350 miles in California and 50 miles in Nevada, burning the remaining 80 gallons. So how much fuel tax do you owe? Uh, you already paid that 37.80 up in Reno, but you only drove 60 miles in Nevada. And at five miles per gallon, we calculate 12 gallons of diesel were burned while driving on Nevada's roads. So you should have only paid $3.24 to Nevada. By contrast, you drove 640 miles in California and burned the other 128 gallons there at the much higher rate of 79 and a half cents per gallon of diesel tax. So you should owe $101.78 to California. In fact, in total, you owe $105. Since you already paid $37.80, effectively, when you bought the fuel in Reno, you owe a balance of $67.20. Under IFTA, you actually pay this amount. You pay it to your home state of Nevada, to the DMV, along with filing a tax return that shows the miles you drove and the gallons you purchased by state, by jurisdiction. DMV processes your tax return along with all the other tax return, uh, excuse me, tax returns of other uh, motor carriers that are registered in Nevada. And DMV participates in IFTA's International Clearinghouse with the other continental states and the 10 Canadian provinces. And the purposes of that clearinghouse is to ensure that each state receives the total, total amount of tax that it should have based on the miles that were actually driven and gallons presumably burned on the roads in your state. So if you didn't follow the math, the bottom line is IFTA is designed to make sure that interstate motor carriers pay fuel tax to the jurisdictions where they drive. So this avoids the issue where a carrier might try, for example, to fuel up in a low tax state, say at the border of Arizona and California and in Arizona, 
drive clear across a high tax state like California uh, and avoid paying the higher fuel tax there. They can do that, but it will catch up to them when it comes time to file their IFTA returns. So now that we know how it works uh, mechanically, how the fuel taxes are collected, and it's uh, it's despite the seeming complexity, is actually as, as a comment was made earlier, as, as a remarkably efficient tax to collect. It's a very low cost uh, tax. But now that we know how it works, we'll take a look at the rates. They're shown here. Um, the state gasoline or motor vehicle fuel tax rate is 24 cents per gallon, and special fuel or diesel is 27 cents per gallon. Uh, all counties have an additional optional excise tax on gasoline of four or nine cents, depending on the county uh, for, for motor vehicle fuels. I, I forgot to show here, there are also eight counties uh, that have an additional five cent optional excise tax on diesel, on special fuels. And then lastly, at the bottom, we, we see Washoe and Clark counties that have indexed taxes on both motor vehicle fuel, gasoline, and special fuel or diesel at the rates that are shown here. Uh, these update every year uh, with inflation indices. Okay, so next we did a little bit of mathematical magic in the back, background, but what I wanna show you here is breaking down the motor vehicle, gasoline fuel tax rates paid based on, um, based on where you live and where the money goes by county. Uh, these infographics are also in the briefing book, but I have to admit we made a couple of minor mistakes uh, and they're corrected on this slide. Uh, I double counted some of the supplier uh, components in the version that's in the briefing book. Um, nevertheless, um, despite the fact that the state gasoline tax in, in statute state component is 24 cents per gallon, some of that 24 cents per gallon is dedicated to counties and cities. So the effective amount of fuel tax, gasoline tax that, that you pay that goes to the state highway fund is 17.3 cents per gallon, regardless of where in the state you are purchasing fuel. The portion that goes to local governments varies based on the county you're in from 11.1 or Esmeralda, Eureka, Lincoln, and Story counties to 30.4 for Clark County and 52 for Washoe County and 15 cents for all of the other counties. Now it's important to note that those numbers I just mentioned actually break down into several subcomponents. So about seven cents of each of those numbers I just listed actually comes from the state tax. It's just distributed by the state by formula to cities and counties. The rest is which is the portion that comes from local option taxes, which is implemented by the individual counties. The remainder, which is that little orange sliver on the right of each car is a small but important amount uh, to keep track of. It's the portion that goes to the suppliers. So pulling it all together, the next slide, uh, fuel taxes in Nevada generate about $650 million in revenue annually. And if we advance one more, we can break this down into the county, county component or the local component, which is $367 million. And then the portion that goes to the state, if you add diesel and gasoline together, about $279 million. So we'll leave fuel taxes there. Uh, there's probably more to say. The statute is very long and complex. If you have questions, I have it up here on my desk so we can address any questions. Um, but I'd like to move on uh, to do a slightly simpler presentation on the other side of that pie chart, which is labeled other sources, but it basically uh, encompasses vehicle fees. Uh, this is a little bit less complex. Uh, there are six constituent vehicle fees shown here in this table. We have driver licensing fees, which generate a small amount of revenue for the highway fund, about $17 million. We have vehicle registration fees, which generate another $175 million. And we have motor carrier uh, fees that generate about $38 million or so. And as you can see, the, the motor carrier fees are tiered by vehicle weight. The bottom two line items um, are largely the governmental services tax or GST, which is a fee calculated based on a portion of the vehicle's adjusted value. Most of this, about 400 million goes to counties, but some was allocated several years ago to the state highway fund. So we can illustrate these six components on the next slide in that pie chart in summary format. One more slide will break down the left-hand side of that pie chart to show these uh, largely vehicle-based fees and how they break down. 
if we were to break this pie chart, uh, slice it in one other direction, which I uh, lamentably I don't have a, a, a visual for, but break it down into where the money goes, county versus state, we see about $680 million goes to the state and about $750 million goes to counties and other local agencies. Finally, to close, we're going to do a quick zoom in on the state highway fund over the past 10 years. And what we'll do here is re reflect that $680 million in 2020 that goes to the state highway fund divided by the number of miles driven in the state. So in other words, how much do Nevada's road users contribute to the state highway fund for each mile that they drive? And as you can see, it's fairly steady at about two cents per mile over the past decade with a dip toward the middle of the decade and then it picked back up again to just over two cents per mile when the GST was added to the state highway fund a few years ago. Um, I show this chart because I think uh, it'll be useful for us, especially in future meetings when we're talking about the highway portion of revenue sources to think about it, not just in terms of total dollars, but also the unit of dollars. If revenue is flat, total revenue, that may visually look okay, uh, quote unquote, but if vehicle miles of travel is increasing, then, then it could be problematic. So we like to normalize the revenue in this way to give a sense of both of those factors, revenue and usage of the system together. So with that, I will conclude this portion of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to try to address any questions or comments you may have. And I wanna note that uh, we have already started work on the upcoming presentations and briefing materials. So if you have questions on this topic or additional topics related to sources and uses that you'd like us to explore, uh, please do let us know. Thank you, Travis. Um, I'm going to ask if you have questions since we're all wearing masks and we're in two different locations. If you wouldn't mind just saying your name before you speak so we can capture that and we can get a better idea of who's asking questions and I'll help with a minute too, I believe. So. Um, with that said, anyone have any questions for Travis? No, that was great, though. That was really interesting. Yeah, so uh, MJ said that was great. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're kind of geeky over here, but I thought that was really interesting. So thank you for that. Ms. Taylor. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Kathleen Taylor. Um, can I speak like this, or do I have to wear the mask? We prefer you to wear the mask. Okay. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. So. Yeah. My question is, are there any uh, studies uh, or pilot programs that may have been federally funded to other states to, to look at the efficacy of transitioning from a fuel-based uh, type of system of transportation uh, into an electric vehicle? or a hybrid or more fuel efficient type of transportation of vehicles such as freight or consumer cars, so to speak. And how does that translate into impacting uh, the revenue streams of various taxes and infrastructures? So um, to your knowledge, are there any type of studies that speaks to that? Because the reason why I'm asking is that looking at that uh, chart or diagram that shows that the flow of from the natural resources of fuel converting to diesel and then uh, being dispersed and converting into revenue, that, that natural resource of fuel, it is depleting as we speak. It's no longer a, a question of if it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, it's happening now. So if fuel is being compromised, if the supply can no longer meet the demand and that translates into uh, revenue deficits, then how are we going to balance that or supplement that? Is it EV? Is it tech? Is it hybrid? And what does that look like when it translates into revenue and taxation? So. If you could um, provide us with any type of studies that may have been federally funded or state funded to, to look at a particular model, I would really appreciate that. I think you are touching on a lot of what we're going to have in our subsequent presentations and I, I you have 
kind of captured a big part of the mission. <laughs> 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 right, that's, right. Um, most of the, those yeah. are the questions we're seeking to answer here and make some recommendations on how, how best to do it. Okay, so, thank um, you. I don't know, Travis, if you want to take a shot at answering that or, or you want to add anything. I um, I, well, I don't want to give away the upcoming meetings, but I think we do have a lot of material coming up that will go over. A pr I mean, you basically you've identified the crux of one of the funding challenges, which is the expected decline or actual decline in fuel consumption, which will obviously lead to decline in, in revenue. Uh, and there are several policy options for how to respond to that. So I think. Um, We'll be exploring a lot of those options, and we have many uh, studies of, of examples of how that's been addressed elsewhere uh, through a variety of different approaches that we'll be presenting in upcoming meetings. Okay, thank you, Travis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, any other questions for Travis? All right, thank you very much, Travis. Uh, the next item on our thank you. is transportation funding challenges in Nevada's region. So in this segment, we're going to hear directly from four different metropolitan planning areas within the state. Um, these are called NPOs, if you haven't heard that term before. Uh, we'll hear about how they're planning for the future and the transportation challenges they're facing. So we've left time in this segment for questions. So um, I urge you to uh, please do ask questions. So um, we're going to start with Bill Thomas from RTC of Washoe County. So. Um, Bill? Good morning. Um, just trying to figure out the logistics. Do I just uh, tell somebody when I want a slide change? Or I don't have them. Don't have them? Yeah. Yes, you, you could do that, Bill. Okay, so um, good morning, Bill Thomas, Executive Director of RTC Washoe. Can everybody hear me through my mask? So far, so good. Okay. Um, well, thank you for this opportunity. I was going to this morning um, address some of the items. There's a little bit of overlap in what you've already heard, but I think it'll be much more specific in terms of looking at our county. But I did want to talk about who we are for those of you who don't understand maybe how we're structured and how we make decisions. We are a major um, user of fuel tax, so we're very, very interested in this conversation. And it definitely talks about an issue that we're very aware of, which is the future reduction in the consumption of fuel and what it means to us with a transportation network. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, just very briefly, we um, are kind of unique. I think we're, we're similar to what Clark County does and some of the other NPOs, but we're a little unique in the nation in terms of what were the three functions that we do under a single agency. Um, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which means our responsibility in Washoe County is to plan for and operate and manage basically the transportation network in Washoe County. In addition, um, we build, we have designed, we build, and we provide maintenance money for the regional road network in Washoe County. And then lastly, um, we run or provide the public transportation system. And I'm going to be talking about each of these, mostly the latter two elements in my presentation, but just to understand how we operate, we have 68 employees. We are very small in terms of the amount of work we do. And uh, pretty much everything we do is through contract, either directly with contracts uh, for construction companies or design engineers or consultants. So. Um, that's the structure and the way we operate. If you could go to the next slide. As far as decision making, um, we have a board of five elected officials. Um, two from the city of Reno, two from Washoe County, and one from the city of Spark. So these five members are the decision makers and the, the body that is responsible for managing the, the programs we do. Um, Christina comes to our meetings and sits as an ex officio member because um, we're very integrated in what we do with what NDOT does. So very important part of our ability to operate is having her engaged with us. Um, we were established, we're actually a creature of NRS 277A. So we're, we're an extension of the, the state in the sense that we're created by NRS. 
In addition, um, our ordinance that established us uh, was created in about 1970, late 1970s. So been around for a while and um, been using fuel tax for many years. So if you can go to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Washoe County. So this is a graphic that shows our roadway network. Um, we have on our regional roadway network, we have about 470, almost 480 miles of regional roads. That of course is expanding um, as the community grows. Right now in 2020, uh, Washoe County has a population of 461,858. And we're projected in 2050 to go to 591,294. So um, clearly it'll be growing uh, from the standpoint of the roadway network, as well as the maintenance and the increasing of the system to accommodate traffic. We are projected, well right now, um, we're at about 10.3 million vehicle miles traveled daily. That's 2020. Um, we're projecting to go to 14.8 million VMT daily by 2050. So uh, by the measures we follow in terms of providing our service, we're going to have, um, regardless of, uh, unless something really drastic changes, regardless of the source of energy propelling vehicles, we're going to have a lot more vehicles on the road um, in the next 30 years. Uh, just geographically to understand how uh, people and merchandise moves in our community. You can see from this um, map here that we're, we're, we're not really circular. We're very disparate in terms of the way our geography is laid out. Um, North-South roughly is about a 35 mile trip. If you look at the California border, our border town in the top left to the um, graphic and then going down to Washoe Valley. And then east-west, uh, primarily along Interstate 80, we're about 18 miles. Uh, the whole urban area is about um, 200 square miles. We have two urban cores, which will be relevant when I start talking about transit here in a minute. Um, the city of Reno, um, downtown, the older part of the city, basically where it started, Marvin Lake, and the crossing of the Truckee River in downtown Reno, and then also downtown Sparks. Generally speaking, I think which is very true of most um, communities in the West, we are very suburban. We don't have a lot of high density areas. We have a couple of the ones I mentioned, um, but we're fairly spread out. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is um, for a snapshot. Basically, it's fiscal year 2020, which is the most recent year where we've done our Whatever the new term is for not saying comprehensive financial report, it's no longer <laughs> supposed to be CAP or some other name, but I can't remember where it is. Um, this is the actual numbers that we've come up with in terms of what we spent last year. So as you can see, of the 124, 125 million dollars that we spent in one year, a significant part of it for our street and highway um, system comes from fuel tax. We're at about almost 69 percent of the money we spend. We have a fairly small percentage of sales tax, and I'll talk a little bit about how we got that and what, what its um, uses, options, uses are. Um, and then lastly, the thing I point out here is RIF, because that may not be a term that people are familiar with. That's a regional roadway impact fee. So all new development, whether it's residential, commercial in Washoe County, pays a fee to um, accommodate the increase in capacity needs. It doesn't take care of maintenance. It doesn't take care of other issues. It's just for capacity increases related to growth. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of how we spent that fuel tax money that I just mentioned that we came in and that came in in FY 2020. Um, as you can see, a substantial part <coughs> of the money goes to uh, pavement preservation. And when I talk about pavement preservation, um, most communities, us included, have a system to make it a lot more structured and not random, which is called a, a pavement condition index. PCI is the, the acronym people are used to in the industry. Um, we have as a goal to keep our uh, PCI at about 80. And what that means is that hopefully we'll be able to keep our roads longer than the design of 20 years. Most roads are designed to last 20 years. 
if you keep your road in a good shape, you can probably stretch it out for 30 years. As I said earlier, we have about 480 miles of roads, and that increases all the time. So um, everything we can do to have our roads last longer reduces the, the overall price in terms of reconstructing it. Just as a general rule, this may or may not come up with others. Um, the industry or the engineers that design it say, once you get below a 50, you're basically rebuilding the road. So rather than maintaining it, you're actually constructing it just like it's a brand new road. Um, you can also see here that we spend quite a bit on multimodal projects, which are projects <coughs> probably best described as other than capacity. Um, this fluctuates. So when you look at capacity, this is just, like I said, a snapshot of um, 2020, we spent about $11 million on capacity. That can vary based on projects because um, roadway projects are very lumpy. In other words, you know, every street project isn't the same price. They can range from $150 million down to $2 million. So each year you look at our budget, it's going to vary based on what the projects are. Uh, and then the part that is obviously a given that we have to pay first and foremost is a is the debt service, which goes out to 2040 for us. So about 23 million, $22 million a year we owe um, on bonds that were sold um, in the past to build some of the roads we've got out there. Now the bottom, the bottom line, the biggest number you see there, um, like I just described to you is those are committed funds based on projects. So in other words, we have identified, let's say a $60 million project on our need list. We won't necessarily spend it in 2020, but we have to allocate the money to be able to do that. And that's why you see the committed funds um, being pretty substantial there. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk about fuel tax indexing. And I think everybody saw on the slide that Washoe County probably has the largest um, assessment or levy of fuel tax. And this is basically the story behind how we got there. So, in um, 2002, the voters um, were asked if they wanted to increase the fuel tax in Washoe County. And again, as um, Travis pointed out, this is Washoe County specific. So it only is imposed on the people who live, well, actually the people who buy gas in Washoe County. And I don't think we have the same thing as the international. So if somebody wants to go to Carson City and buy gas, as far as I know, we don't get a piece of that, even if they drive, as soon as they leave Carson City and come and drive around here. So, um, this is strictly for gasoline that's purchased in Washoe County. So uh, with AB uh, 516, which is approved by the legislature in 2003, we created a CPI-based index. And we also, well, actually not, we, the voters approved a 1.8% sales tax that could go either to transit or to roads. And so we have that 1.8% that we use um, basically on what our needs are. For example, this past year, uh, fuel tax was down significantly because of the pandemic. So we use some of the sales tax that normally we would use for transit only striking mm -hmm. it to make up for the loss in revenue. So that tax was approved by the voters to go either way. Hey, Bill, yes. Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. In normal times, is that money, does that usually go all to transit? You know, with last year, of course, being that outlier. Um, I, it's hard to say does it always. It's been historically for the last few years used for transit, so yes. Uh, but as I talk about transit, you'll also understand with the pandemic some very significant things happened with federal money coming in to change the dynamic that allowed us to do that. But yes, I would say in the, historically that 8% has gone to transit. Thank you. Um, and then moving on to um, the more recent action, which was in 2008. Uh, when the voters were asked in Washoe County, um, well, first they were told that the CPI wasn't going to be enough to cover the needs. And the voters supported an increase that added also the uh, producer's price index. So that is an index that's based not on all the goods that are sold, but very specifically on the materials and costs of, for example, building roads. So it was more focused on what the cost of a road is, because the idea behind it was you know, for a dollar of gas tax revenue you get each year, it buys less and less. So the index was designed to allow us to keep up with increase, increasing prices. They also, the voters also approved applying it to diesel and special fuels, like Travis mentioned earlier, is kind of that second tier of revenue. Um, an interesting thing in terms of what was asked then is the voters were asked if they wanted to spend another eight 
percent sales tax on transit, specifically on transit, and they rejected that. So the voters did not want to um, increase their tax on for transit. And that's the last time we really asked a question like that. But I did think it was worth sharing in terms of what the voters in Washoe County indicated um, they wanted that. And, you know, I gotta say the legislature has been very helpful and supportive of our ability to do this. Um, and it has been very beneficial to us as I'll show you to have these levies and indexing to be able to meet, keep up with demand. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So these are some of the challenges we have uh, getting back to the whole conversation of fuel tax as far as where the money is going and how far the dollar can stretch. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're increasing the number of miles um, that are traveling with that BM BMT number I gave to you. So people, not only are there more people driving and more roads to drive on, but people are driving part of it. So that puts a greater demand on the need for not only building, but also maintaining roads. Um, we're building more roads, like I said, and um, vehicle weights do impact it. I know that's one of the conversations that's been kind of bantied about about electric vehicles is they weigh a little bit more than traditional. I don't know that it's significant. When I talk to our experts, they say it's not because the roads are designed for fairly heavy vehicles. So that increment between a gasoline car and an electric vehicle car is probably not significant in terms of the wear and tear on the road. Um, and then, of course, the cost of materials, like everything, is going up. So all the materials that go into a road um, are increasing every year. And then I, I can't ignore, and this is particularly challenging in terms of building new roads or even going into modified roads where we have to get more right away. The cost of property and um, buying the right away we need has gone up significantly. So those are the, are the main things that are happening in terms of our ability to continue to provide the service. So you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, when we got into the pandemic, one of the things we noticed is that um, gas, fuel sold, gasoline is consumed went down. Not surprisingly with the pandemic where everybody stayed home. There were a lot less, a lot less people out there buying gas. So we did a forecast based on some assumptions, for example, um, how many people are going to remote work? I mean, if you read the literature, some people say it's going to go back to the way it was. The highest number I think I ever saw was somewhere between like 24 and 30 percent of the people may stay home permanently, so they're not driving. That would mean at least the work trip, right? It doesn't mean they're not driving around to buy bread or go to the store or whatever, but at least they're not doing the daily commute. Then we added in um, some information that we got from the state in terms of the goals of the conversion of the fleet to um, low or no, primarily electric vehicles, but also you know just re reducing the consumption of um, petrochemicals in terms of how we provide the energy for vehicles. And you can see that what it would show is if, if we're successful as a state and a county and driving down the number or the amount of gasoline consumed, this is kind of what we forecast that's going to be happening to um, our revenues out to 2050 as far as um, fuel tax money we're going to bring. Uh, Bill, Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. What has the data shown you in terms of stuff rebounding back in terms of both miles and gallons of fuel? Are we are we back to pre-pandemic levels? Are we significantly lower? I mean, what does the data show us today? Where, where are we at? So for us in Washoe County, as recently as I think I looked at it yesterday in, in the monthly report of gas mm -hmm. being sold, we are getting back to where we were. Um, and so that's a lot of a question in this graphic. Is it just going to go back to what it was where it's going as an upward curve, either you know, it's a J curve or some other curve where it's rising? Or are these policy objectives, much of what we're going to be talking about here, that reduces, if it works, is going to reduce how much fuel people consume? Um, that's our question because, you know, what this says is we have a huge need. There's a big, a huge need. There's a big gap now. That's part of why we're here. How are we going to get the money to, to maintain the systems or are we just going to let the systems fall apart? My guess is we're going to have to find the money because people drive electric cars are on the same road as people driving gasoline cars, and they probably don't like potholes anymore than people who drive gasoline cars. Um, so the other thing, maybe just 
Well, I'll go ahead and move on to this because I don't. How much time do I have left? Like three minutes? Ten minutes? Okay. Um, I'll try to, to crank through this. This is uh, a major part of what we do as a transportation system. We provide a fixed route bus service. And um, I've listed up here, kind of in the description of it, it's much smaller than Clark County, but it is pretty significant in terms of how many people ride. As you can see there, pre pandemic, we had 7.6 7 million passengers per year, which, you know, I don't know if you could say it's one for one, but significant number of people who aren't driving cars by riding the buses. Um, I would say, I would share with everybody that we're about 36% down right now from pre pandemic. Um, one thing about transit is um, it's hard to get people who don't have a choice to get on the bus. So most of the riders and the ones you can count on are people who just don't have, either they can't drive a car for whatever physical reason or other reason, they can't afford a car. Um, and so our challenge is going to be getting back to those large numbers to try to get the riders who have a discretion or a choice over where they ride the bus or drive a car back on the bus. And then lastly, the point I wanted to point to, or the one thing I wanted to point out to everybody is, there's a <clears throat> common conversation, and we're very supportive of transit. It's our business, it's our world, it's what we do, but people need to understand that a fixed route service is very expensive. So in Washoe County, it's about $700,000 for one new fixed route, and that's forever. That's basically, it's gonna escalate over time. In addition, it's about 1.4 million in capital. So adding a fixed route bus route is very expensive, not only capital-wise, but also from the standpoint of ongoing maintenance. Yeah, Bill, to that point, once again, Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. I know that RTC had a on-demand um, transit service. Is that something that is still moving forward? And what are the costs in something like that compared to the, the fixed route and defined schedule? Uh, good question, Paul. I was just headed there. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to help. Okay. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So here's how we fund transit. And in Washoe County, about 50% of the services provided by sales tax. The other thing that um, is not common knowledge, but is important for people to understand is that the passenger fares are basically insignificant. It's about 7% of the cost, so it's not even real to think that transit would ever be self-sustaining. And the push right now in the national sense is there's more and more conversation about free trips. So totally getting rid of that 7% and just letting people ride the buses for free. So that's just one more increment of revenue that we need to run the system that possibly could be going away. We're not talking about that locally, but I can tell you nationally that is a big conversation. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, before I get to the on-demand, I did want to talk a little bit more about our fixed route system. So we, we've been an early adopter, actually an industry leader in terms of going to electric buses. We have 30% of our fleet, which is fairly high at the national level, as all electric. Um, it's done great in terms of reducing fuel costs. Also, as you can see from this graphic, a lot of carbon has been removed from the air for those electric buses. Um, we do also use on our paratransit, which is um, you know for disabled people, people who don't can't ride the regular buses. Um, we have 45 of those, of those 55 buses are um, natural gas, so it's a low, it's not no, but low emission. Um, and then the one thing I did want to point out, because this is something, you know, as we move over to these new technologies, a lot of it's going to be perfecting it to see the challenge we've had is we had a goal of being totally electric. But as we started running our system, we realized that's not in the near term achievable. And the reason is because the EVs, buses we can buy really can only do 50 miles a day and that varies if it's really hot you get less miles out of it if it's really cold you get less miles out of it if you're running your heater or your air conditioner so the challenge we have and we've, we've moved it around is we put our electric vehicles on certain routes and then other routes we've had to go to um, hybrid and so as we bought new buses we've been moving towards hybrid um, diesel electric because we just can't run our system it's totally on electric. We'd love to get there, but until the technology improves, we're not able to run our whole system on electric. We 
did recently, and I know um, not stealing any thunder from you, MJ, but we did get a grant this year <clears throat> from the federal government to do a hydrogen fuel cell project. Um, and the advantage for those who aren't familiar with that is that's a um, basically a, I don't know if you can call it no, because it does have some emission, but it's closer to no emission than low emission. Uh, but it does work more like a conventional vehicle in that you fill the tank up and you drive till it's gone, as opposed to the charger where you have to sometimes stop midday, park your bus to let it charge back up, which means people aren't on it, you know, the driver's sitting there. So those are the challenges. If I can move on, I'll try to rush through these real quickly. Um, flex ride program. So this is the, the newer one that Paul was talking about that really is kind of, I would describe to you probably the future of how transit's gonna work. And the way I would describe it is that we're living in the world where people want more and more things on demand. The challenge with traditional fixed route systems is people have to come to the system, they have to adapt their needs to what the system is because it runs on certain times. You know, it all, it's there at a physical location, it's not moving, it only runs at certain times. So people have to adapt their behavior to use the system. More and more people want on demand. They want door to door. They want to be able to move where they want and not be constrained by our system. So this is one we started in 2019 um, with two buses. Um, it's been very, very successful. And essentially what it is, we create these geographic zones and these um, smaller transit buses move people around on demand, curb to curb, door to door in those geographic areas. What's really worked well for us is these now have been able to feed our fixture. So it's a better way to get that last mile to get people to the buses on the fixed route and get them distributed. And then lastly, if I, do you have another question on that one that I answered? No, nope, that's good. I, I, I have a question. Ann Silver, for the record. Um, Bill, if you were to assume where people go back to work and, and resume their patterns, does this model really work? Um, or is this released for such a specific group that, that it, it will increase just based on people who need this demand service, but will not really assist with the average commuter. Um, you know, it'll be telling to see. This this is closer to an Uber than a bus, right? Because a bus, like I said, you have to go to it. You have to wait there. You have to change your Uber is whatever you want to even call it. So we're thinking this is really going to fill in that gap of the last mile. But the question really becomes one of convenience for people. And these are 15 minute service. So you call, you make a reservation. It's not driving around. You have to go and schedule this much like you would an Uber or a, a taxi, but it still takes 15 minutes. So the challenge is gonna be how many people are willing to wait 15 minutes versus just get up out of their chair and jump in their car and go. And that's the convenience question that I think all of us are struggling with is will people change their behavior that causes them a little bit of I wouldn't call it pain, but they may. Or they just want to, when, I, when they want to go somewhere, they want to go. They don't want to wait. Um, but I think this is going to be very much um, a significant part of our future because those fixed route systems are so difficult to implement. And once you put them in place, they're not flexible. So now I do have a question. So cost effect, Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. Um, Cost effective, it costs you know up to 1.4 million dollars for a fixed route. What is the cost on this, and what is that cost per rider? And if you're going to look at comparing the two systems, um, looking at cost per rider for the flexible route versus the fixed route. Um, I happen to have that here. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, it's not in here. Just short in terms of the aggregate, we've we realized about um, eleven ten thousand two hundred dollars a month in operating costs monthly to go to these two flex rides versus a fixed route. So, um, well, I know the question is, well, what was the overall amount? So you can see what the percentage is, but I don't have that. Um, and it did. Sorry, just bear with me a second. So, I mean, less than 10% cost of a fixed route. It saves um, 55 to 75% of okay. cost per okay. trip. So, it's significant. All right. You know, you don't have, just like looking at the driver, these are not CDL drivers, so you go to a lower tier in terms of your cost. Vehicles are smaller, they're less expensive, the fuel is less, so they're much more efficient. 
So it is significant in terms of operating costs. Now, I was skeptical when I first saw this, but I mean, that hearing those numbers makes me more of a fan. So thank you. Um, and the other part of the equation, which I didn't mention, on the other kind of the flip side of the flex ride is what we call our bus rapid transit, which is close. I, I would describe it as trying to get buses to run like rail, which is very frequent and predictable. So we've been able to, um, mostly with the help of the federal government, but um, we spent about 150 million in Washoe County to create a bus rapid transit system where the buses run every 10 minutes. So the idea would be if you use these flex rights to get people there, that people can move within those areas where the bus rapid transit is to get to different places because the wait time is so short. Um, last thing, last two slides I had was um, another program that's been wildly successful for us is our van pool program. And um, this one's been increasing by double digits. And essentially what this is, the way I would describe it is um, we work with enterprise rental cars. They um, provide a van to a private individual. That van is subsidized by RTC money. So the person who buys the van working with enterprise and enterprise subsidizes it too, gets a reduced price. But in exchange for that, they have to, um, and also companies pay. So some of the companies that tripped it are doing this, they kick in some money too. So it's a combination of RTC and the businesses paying uh, private individuals to basically ban pool or pool, you know, the thing we've been trying forever, but it's been very tough to get people to kind of co-ride. This has been very successful at reducing, um, particularly for longer trips like Reno or Sparks to Tahoe Reno, Reno Industrial Center. Um, to get more people, you know, per vehicle. So this isn't very significant, not only in the, the sense of the cost and the people riding it, but it's also significantly saved on CO2 emissions. So if I, so I will just wrap up with the last little slide of what we're looking for. Um, I think, as I mentioned to all of you, we are early adapters or adopters of electric vehicles. So we're very, very supportive. Our board had a goal to go 100%. So we're all in. Um, our challenge, though, is how do we accelerate, as we see it, how do we accelerate that transition, but do it in a way that basically doesn't break the system that's working fairly well? I mean, that would be our goal. Let's figure out how to get there, but let's not break everything while we're doing it. Um, so that's why maintaining and increasing funding levels for our system is, is paramount in terms of our perspective on this conversation about um, how we have sustainable funding. Um, and then lastly, of course, we have our debt, which we can't get out of. So any diversion or repurposing or reduction in fuel tax, we still have that debt we have. To. Um, and then lastly, you know, what we would like to see is whatever we end up doing as a group, that um, we make sure as best we can that there's some, somebody's tested it, somebody's checked it, not really interested in being the, the guinea pig, because we have a lot on the line in terms of what we do. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. If you have uh, questions for Bill, Bill. Any questions for Bill? Bill, I have one. Which, uh, which state or federal or local taxes are government exempt from? Um, <clears throat> you mean in terms of Fuel taxes. Do you, you pay those federal fuel taxes, the state fuel taxes, the Washoe County fuel taxes? Um, as far as I know, everybody pays them. I'm not a, no, I'm not aware of any exemption, but I'm not an expert on that. Thank you. It's not, it's I believe we're as a public agency, we're, we are exempt from some paid some taxes. Um, uh, 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 even I think on the fuel we buy. If I understand, but let me check. Let me check on this. I do know as a agency, we are exempt from paying some taxes. There are no other questions for Bill. That's a pretty good uh, segue to uh, MJ Weiner. Uh, MJ is the uh, CEO of the RTC of Southern Nevada. MJ? Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I apologize in advance. I think many of you have seen this presentation or various iterations of this presentation. Time and time again, I think we spent the last year and a half talking about our challenges. So uh, I'll, I'll go through this briefly. I also have a phone, a friend here in the audience, David Swallow, uh, that I may call just so we can make this more conversational. 
I'll try to keep you awake. So next slide, please. Uh, like Bill, you know, I think at the state of Nevada, I guess we like to be unique because we are unique. Uh, we're the only agency in the United States that houses all these functions under one roof. We are the public transit provider. We are the MPO or the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and we work closely with all of the local jurisdictions to fund all of the roadway infrastructure projects. So unlike Washington, we don't do that. We work. We are the funding mechanism for all of the cities and the county. Uh, as the MPO, we are also we oversee the regional transportation planning process for the region. Uh, don't throw rotten tomatoes at us. We are also the traffic manager for the entire region. And then we oversee the bike lane pro bicycling program in downtown Las Vegas, as well as other cycling initiatives. Next slide, please. So the MPO region uh, covers all of Clark County, including the uh, urban core uh, in the Las Vegas Valley, as well as outlying areas such as Mesquite and Laughlin. This area covers over 8,000 square miles. But to put that into context, that's the same, that's similar to the size of the state of New Jersey. Historically, we welcome 45 million visitors uh, to Southern Nevada each year. 2.3 million residents call Southern Nevada home. Uh, we expect that uh, population to grow to about 3 million folks living here by 2050. But you know, Southern Nevada continues to be one of the fastest growing regions in the US. And so the growth and location of housing, jobs, shopping, retail, all those travel patterns are going to continue to change. And we're seeing that right now because most of the development in the Las Vegas area is in the periphery of the area. So we're getting, um, we're watching the demand for transportation options in out the outliners where there is none right now. Today we have more than 7,000 mile, 7, miles of roadway that needs to be maintained in good working order for both our residents and our visitors. Growth in suburban and rural areas. Uh, the additional trips to from within the urban core uh, and the, the Las Vegas Strip are expected to increase vehicle miles traveled 37% by 2050. And then I think people are always surprised to learn the, the RTC is the 12th uh, busiest, we're ranked 12th busiest bus system in the US. Uh, even during the pandemic, when ridership declined drastically, the resort quarter, we, we almost went down to not transporting anybody. We still moved 56 million passengers on our fixed route service, about 1.4 million passengers on our paratransit service, and approximately 75,000 uh, senior veteran trips. And so it, uh, it, we know that we, uh, we play a significant role in how many uh, of our folks that live here move about, particularly those customers that have no other option uh, but our public transit system. Next slide, please. So let's talk transit. You know, for the RTC, again, MPO is one of the hats that we wear. Uh, our funding really, go, we put that in about two, in two, two categories. It's uh, roadways and transit. So for transit, Currently, we're funded by sales tax, passenger fares, and we use federal grants mostly for our capital programs. So the over 800 buses that we operate, all of that, all of those buses have been paid for by federal grants. Uh, dissimilar to Washoe, passenger fares make up about 30% of our total revenue. And uh, what makes us unique as a, as a transit agency compared to our peers, the fact that our main funding source is just one bucket called sales tax. Transit agencies around the US, they, they usually have multiple buckets in which to draw from. Sales tax can be regressive, it can be uh, very volatile, and we saw that not only in the recession in 2008, where uh, we, we lost a significant amount of funding for transit, had to make tra a lot of cuts. The same thing with the pandemic. We saw a huge decrease in sales tax, and because of that, we had to make almost $10 million uh, worth of transit service reductions. So despite these revenue sources, uh, I think you'll hear over and over again, at least from RTC Southern Nevada, that funding, identifying a, a long-term sustainable funding solution is our number one priority. Next slide. This is the infamous slide. I know everyone has seen various iterations <laughs> of this slide. And so this slide just represents, this is again, pre-pandemic, we knew that we were gonna face a, a deficit in our transit fund as early as 2020. Pre-pandemic, we were, we were aghast at, oh my God, we're, it's, we're gonna be $6 million on the whole. We, we thought that, how are we gonna, what, that was significant. Well, little did we know the pandemic was right around the corner and that those numbers were gonna change drastically. And so what you see here, 20, in fiscal 2020, the uh, deficit actually was $30 million instead of $6 million. In fiscal 21, uh, we cut about $40 million from our, our operating budget, 
we did that by um, reducing uh, reducing or postponing capital projects. We cut a lot of professional services contracts. We uh, implemented a hiring freeze. We furloughed and laid off about 15% of our entire workforce. Everybody took a pay cut. And we the deficit then was, it, this is what we're projecting about a $15 million deficit. But, you know, there's this year over year uh, look ahead where that deficit um, is going to not only increase but grow. Next slide. Okay, so good news. Um, like every trans agency here in the United States, we receive federal stimulus funding that is helping us address, at least in the short term, that funding deficit. You see here on the slide, we received $303 million, um, $112 million of CARES Act. We've spent that already. $60 million in CRISA. Uh, we've also spent all of that money. We're one of the first transit agencies in the U.S. that have actually drawn down very quickly and are spending the money uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, we received $131 million in American Rescue Plan funding. Now, this, this funding is very prescriptive, how we can spend it and when we can spend it. And I think some people are, are have, I've heard, hey, RTC, you've got, you've got a deficit. You've received over $300 million. Just sit on it. Just kind of spend a little bit every year, and then you don't have to worry about the steps that you're facing. But that's not how it works. So the Federal Transit Administration is overseeing how we're spending the stimulus funding. And it is, uh, it's, the intention of this money is to ensure that transit agencies are bringing back transit service to pre-pandemic levels. We just did that. We just implemented a, a very large service change on Sunday, August 8th. Uh, this money is, to be, is used. You must bring back your furloughed and laid off employees. We've done that. This, this funding is to be used to continue your enhanced safety and cleaning protocols within your uh, facilities and on your buses. Uh, the federal uh, the FT is very aware that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and want to make sure public transit is safe. We right now are we're buying thousands of PPEs every month because as tourists come to Las Vegas, they don't come here with a mask. They're required to wear public, a mask on public transit. So uh, on the strip, you'll see staff passing out masks. Uh, the tourists put them on, they get on the bus, they throw the mask away. So we're, we're, that we're using a lot of this money to, to buy that PPE. And this is, the, this is probably the most important part. We have five years in which to spend this money. Next slide, please. Oh, yes, please. Um, Marie. Marie Steele with MB Energy. So does your deficit already contemplate the, the CARES Fund Act or the, the federal stimulus that you had? So does it have that 303 in it? No, so that so that that dreadful slide with all the red. Yeah. No, that is pre-pandemic. So we believe that, okay. again, in five, within, within five years, it'll take us to 2027, uh, the fiscal cliff is still there. Okay. So this is, a, I think this is a, Probably one of my my favorite slides because it really speaks to the level of public investment here in Southern Nevada. So the National Transit Database collects data from every transit agency annually, and uh, this represents if you look at the blue bars, the RTC uh, Southern Nevada on annual um, excuse me annually per capita, uh, Southern Nevadans invest about 114 dollars. Uh, per person uh, in terms of public transit investment. When you compare that to our peers, so Los Angeles, LA Metro, Salt Lake City, UTA, uh, Denver RTD, our peer agencies, they they invest 60% more in public transit than we do here in Southern Nevada. So this slide just, it shows that we are, we continue to significantly underinvest in public transit here in Southern Nevada. Next slide, please. MJ, can I? Yeah, please. This is um, this doesn't give any consideration to that 30 percent of fare backs recovery because I think that's probably higher than any of your other peer. Rates. This actually this takes in so this takes into account all of our all of our uh, operating costs uh, in relation to our revenues. So, so this all of your revenues. yes. Thank you. MJ. Yes. Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. Just Hi, Paul. Look, how are you? Good. So good to see you in person. Um, just taking a gander at those other cities that you were comparing Las Vegas to, I think every single one of them has a rail or a, you know, either a light rail or I think monorail in Seattle. How much of the cost that that 
kind of cost increase per capita is attributed to operating their rail system as opposed to just kind of a apples to apples um, transit comparison? So that is a great question. So Paul, w knowing that we want we wanted this to be an apples to apples comparison. So in the NTD report, you're able to break out bus mode versus light rail versus heavy rail, commuter rail. So this is just our bus system and what we spend on it versus their bus system. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. So we were asked, uh, RTC, what are your what are your challenges and what are what are the potential opportunities? So the first, uh, the most important challenge is identifying a long-term funding solution. The opportunity, uh, we've been given authority by the Nevada Legislature. Thank you. Uh, to go, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, to go out to a ballot question uh, in 2024. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation around that, that, that ballot questions. It, right now, we're only allowed uh, to ask for an inc that ballot, excuse me, is based on sales tax. Uh, that can be problematic, but that right now that we certainly have that option. Uh, another challenge, uh, so I think everybody in this room knows transportation continues to be the largest emitter of greenhouse gases as a, as a public transit agency. Um, Meeting, uh, helping the state meet the sustainability goals, addressing climate change is, is a top priority for the RTC. Because of that, an opportunity that we have, we uh, just finished uh, a plan that will transition all of our vehicles to battery, elect battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell. Now, certainly that uh, will be contingent upon additional funding for the infrastructure, uh, but we believe that's, that is, that's a great opportunity. The only way, the, we, we're part of public transit has to be part of the solution. The only way that we're really going to make an impact in reducing our carbon footprint is to move people from their cars to to other modes. And uh, so, while public transit represents a smaller piece of carbon emissions, uh, we're part of the solution in terms of ensuring that there's another choice for people that are that are using a car. And then the third challenge challenge is, um, you know, our tr current transit system has not kept up with our population growth, with our customer demand, even with our geographic growth. And so our, we look at an opportunity is, um, is listening to the community. Uh, we spent the last three years or so asking the community, what would you like? What do you envision for future public mobility or public transit, future mobility in Southern Nevada? And uh, we surveyed hundreds um, of, of folks that live in Southern Nevada and we received their feedback and put it together in our onboard plan. It's our, it's our uh, regional transportation plan that uh, has identified not only things like we want more frequent service, we want more paratransit service, but we'd also like other boats, high capacity transit, light rail, et cetera. It's an opportunity, but, but again, the challenge will come back to um, the, the funding uh, to implement the entire plan. Okay, let's talk roads. So roads, are mainly funded by motor vehicle fuel tax, fuel revenue indexing, and sales tax. And I think just walk with you real quick. So I wanted to, you know, certainly in 2016, without uh, the successful passage of the the ballot for fuel revenue indexing, uh, Southern Nevada would look very, very different. Uh, Dave, do you want to speak to that real quick? You and I talked about this earlier. Sure. Thank you, MJ, uh, Madam Chair. David Swell, RTC of Southern Nevada, for the record. Uh, yeah, we we had the gas tax, you know, which was enabled originally, I think, back in 1990. And then in 2002, we had a measure to add a quarter percent sales tax that was split between roadways and transit. Uh, but as we got into the depths of the, the, the first recession, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, especially 2010, things were getting really uh, dire as we're trying to get projects out to keep everybody working. At the same time, our, our funding levels were dropping dramatically. And I think at that point, we were projecting uh, maybe $22 million per year going forward for a number of years, uh, just because we had so much money tied up with, with bond repayment, and we just didn't have that cash flow to keep the projects going out. Thankfully, industry got together, both the engineering, uh, the contracting community got together and really talked to the legislature about bringing forth the, the opportunity for, for indexing. And so with that <clears throat> enacted in 2013 uh, and, and taking effect in 2014 as part of a three-year pilot, 
we were able to deliver 225 project or 225 projects, I think totaling about $570 million. Uh, really getting the wheels back in place. Again, as MJ mentioned, we're trying to keep up with the growth of our community. I think we all enjoy having that growth, but at the same time, uh, it's really tough to keep the infrastructure getting out to, the, to our community to serve it. Uh, thankfully, we were able to, with, with the partnership of all the local jurisdictions with NDOT, deliver the projects so that um, in 2016, uh, the voters went and said, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and authorize another 10-year extension of fuel revenue indexing, uh, really creating an opportunity for us. I, we just had our board approve uh, the, our capital improvement program for the next 10 years, which right now is totaling $2.2 billion in, over the next 10 years. And the, the jurisdictions are really delivering on that. Getting projects out, we're seeing a lot of increased... Dave, I'll go to the next slide. You can talk to that. Next yep. slide, please. Yep. That's exactly it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so as you see here, this was our, our quarterly report back in March, but to date, and when we say to date, this is going back to uh, January of 2014. Altogether, uh, fuel tax, fuel revenue indexing uh, together brought forth about $1.6 billion in projects that we've gotten out, uh, 540 design and construction contracts, employing somewhere, you know, over 11,000 people. And another key component here was engaging the small business community to make sure everybody had an opportunity to participate as we were going forward with this funding program. But this is this indexing is in effect until 2026, at which time we would have to go forward uh, if we wanted to continue the program to get another authorization from the people. Right. Yep, and I'll talk. That's the last. That's our last slide. So, hey David, uh, yeah, Marshall please Desai, uh, ACEC, uh, the 2.2 billion dollar capital program. Mm -hmm. How much of that is for roadway versus transit? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so or it's all roadway. Yeah, that that the majority of that is roadway. Um, keep in mind, fuel tax can only be used for roadways. Uh, we do have a little bit more flexibility with the sales tax. It's a portion. A lot of that sales tax is is programmed for. Uh, multimodal projects, the uh, multi-use trails, uh, bike and pedestrian facilities, and even some of the transit connectivity that, that we are doing. But the large majority of it, uh, over $2 billion, is, is strictly for roadways. And of that, I think uh, one thing to point out, over $800 million is for maintenance of the roadways. We often look at building new roads, but we really have to program in the maintenance uh, going forward. Um, this is Virginia Valentine. So, Dave, that 800 million is in. The 800 million is part of the 2.2 billion. And so, the, this is our la the next slide is our last slide. So, you know, again, I think the, the reoccurring theme is going to be the challenges and, and the opportunities. The opportunities really are identifying again a, a sustainable funding source for both public transportation and all of that. that that, that you know we're also implementing a, a microtransit pilot so it's not just about the bus and that identifying a funding uh, a sustainable funding solution for roadways because dave is right uh first and foremost fuel tax is not sustainable we know that fuel efficiency standards those continue to increase the adoption to electric vehicles that's going to continue to increase and there is the expiration of the fuel tax in 2026 however that statute uh, that statute allows us to go back to the voters in 26 to continue to index fuel tax to inflation. Uh, but again, it's a it's a that's great again, but not sustainable given the way given the way that mobility is changing in the future. And I think the other opportunity is going to come quite frankly from this working group. So I, I want to thank NDOT for coordinating this effort. I think uh, at the end of the day, that's going to be to and I've funny listening to you, everything that um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, Kathleen. You were I, as you were speaking earlier, I thought she's identifying exactly why we're here. <laughs> and and so I do think that we'll have some opportunities uh, from this group that will help us identify uh, how we get over that hump and how we, we uh, figure out how we're going to sustain both uh, roadways, infrastructure, and public transit here in Southern Nevada. So thank you. Thank you, MJ. Do we have any questions for MJ? Herschel uh, Desai, another question. 30% of your uh, transit revenue is from passenger fares. Did I hear uh, correctly that of Washoe it was 7%? Thank you. 
Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Kathleen Taylor. Uh, uh, this is a comment specifically for RTC, uh, but maybe um, Nevada transportation in general. It would help me personally uh, to have more of a historical perspective, uh, specifically looking at the deficit. And again, this is not signaling out RTC, where if we could see, let's just say that it, it just seems that the, the deficit is, is uh, increasing over time. Historically, what were some things that were discussed or decided upon when the deficit was negative 100,000? Uh, what what, what the, the leadership, the, uh, the, the community, um, what things were, were said or put in place to address it at that point? And then, and then how did it increase despite those conversations and, and policies and regulations or, or, or uh, um, construction plans or something of that nature? Because for me, in order for me to, to, to understand where we're, go where we're at now and where we're going in the future with this, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. So that's where I'm at. Well, I can tell you this on the transit side. Um, yeah, you're right, history does repeat itself. So we've always, you know, as a, as a business person, we manage to our budget. And so uh, the perfect example would be when the recession hit in about 2008. We saw, again, we have that, that one sales tax bucket. When the sales tax, we saw a dramatic decline in that. Uh, and we had a deficit. We had to manage to that and we did the same thing similar to what i just told you. we had to cut transit service we had to look for uh cutting contracts uh, we didn't lay off staff then but we had implemented a hiring freeze uh everyone you know salaries and, and wages were frozen I and mean, we we have always managed the budget and that's our job uh the cost of business continues to rise even our contracts we contract out our, our fixed route service and our paratransit service uh, we see annual contract increases. That's part of the agreement with those with those uh, public with those private sector agencies. They have union employees. Their uh, as labor their labor increases. The labor costs increases. The union contracts. That's also something else that we that we uh, respond to. So uh, when looking at the deficit, it, it, it again we will manage to to that deficit, but it it uh, it doesn't speak to the fact that we we. We have uh, committed the same amount of public spending. So think of the community in 2002. We'll go, even go back to 1995. We continue to receive, receive, generally speaking, the same amount of investment. Yet our, our community, our population, has significantly grown. Uh, in in uh, the southwest area of Las Vegas, so Mountains Edge, that area, uh, we've watched it grow. We heard from employers and employees over the last seven years. We want service. We want service. We couldn't. We could not offer them service, and so with this, uh, with the stimulus funding, uh, we we decided how can we, how can we ensure that we geographically can meet the needs of these folks, 185,000 folks that want need service. 20,000 of those folks live out of below the poverty line. Many don't have a way to, to access transit. 13,000 uh, persons with disabilities live in that area. 18,000 seniors that have no access to public transit, and so we took. Um, we took some of that money that the FTA said, bring back transit service to your communities, and we were implementing a microtransit service as an example of ways to meet the needs of the community, uh, but there's a cost to that. And so uh, in the future, again, we have a chance. We've been speaking, uh, we've been working on our board. We started working with the Nevada legislature back in 2017. And at that time, they said, RTC, you can go to the vote of the people in 2020, in 2022, or 2024. Uh, we may work again with the legislature in 23 to maybe do we extend that out and, and for, to 26. I mean, there, there are those kinds of conversations. We're also talking to our board about other revenue streams, and I can't go into that quite yet because uh, we're still having discussions with our board. But uh, there's a problem we're trying to solve for it now. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Christina Swallow. I just wanted to also just um, Kathleen, some of that historical perspective is. Um, I think part of our charge here, where we're going to talk about the decisions that we've made and our priorities as agencies and policies, um, and and broader than that, where we start talking about some of 
MJ alluded to it, but like land use decisions that are being made. So part of our charge, our primary charge is the funding, um, but secondary to that funding is really talking um, about urban transit and the urban transit needs, because that will help make the, our funding solution more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of that is actually talking about land use and its role in the challenges faced both on the roadway side as well as on the transit side. So I think we're going to have an opportunity to really explore that in the coming meeting, um, not to tip Jeff's hand at all. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're, you're asking all the right questions. <laughs> any, any other questions? Sure. Okay. So again, uh, uh, with Nevada Contractors Association. Um, Bill from RTC brought the RIF. I've heard bits and pieces about that before. Do we have anything like that in Clark County? I'm not an actual roadway infrastructure fee. I not think is what it's not, it's not coming to the RTC. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not aware. I, I'd have to, the jurisdictions would have to speak if right. they're collecting any kind of fee. Right. Uh, yeah, as the funding agency upheld, that certainly isn't any, any if, if it is, if there's a, a different kind of funding source, it, it's not coming to the RTC then to be distributed to the jurisdiction. So, so yeah, too, I mean, it, it kind of goes to the fact that you were just talking about with Mountain's Edge. Mm -hmm. Right. And they build a community out there, but yet now they want the community to fund what they did, and that becomes a bit of a challenge. Yeah, and, and we, we get that even when, uh, so North Las Vegas, they had a lot of tax incentives to bring private industry to North Las Vegas, Amazon, Fanatics, et cetera. Uh, the roads were built, the utilities were brought in, and then they said, oh, wait, wait, we forgot. How do we get our employees out here? And we find that uh, in West Henderson, et cetera. And I think that, again, we'll go back to I think what Christine is talking about. We, we for a while, we had a pilot where the, the employers helped pay for some of the service. And, and that's, that's always part of our discussion uh, when those situations occur. Other questions? From, from DMV, I, it occurs to me that um, in the intersection of all the, the transit needs and the population growth, I, where do we intersect with affordable housing? Because the reason you're seeing this urban sprawl is people can't, you can't afford to buy a house in Reno. You're going to move out to Silver Springs. You're going to move out to Dayton. You're going to move out to Fernley. You're going to increasingly move out to these outlying areas uh, because that's what you can afford. You know, for a, for a starting couple, you know, a young family starting out, you can't afford a $600,000 house in Reno. So to what extent, you know, as we look at climate goals, which are noble, as we look at transportation goals, which are noble, and we need to do all this, but, you know, it's, uh, if I'm living out in, in Silver Springs and my job is in Carson City, I got to drive, right? And there's no way around that right now. So, you know, what, it, where is this, where does this federal funding intersect with affordable housing? and land use planning to get people to where you know maybe we have uh, some enclaves of more affordable housing in in our more urban areas so that we're not having to pr continually provide transit to these outlying areas um, i'm sure you bring up a, an excellent point and one of the reasons that we focused on the southwest part of uh, clark county was that uh, in conversations about affordable housing that that was the one area that they said well there is some land, there's some area there to be developed. Maybe that's where we, we implement affordable housing. And I, I don't think that made everybody happy for that very reason. If you're mm -hmm. going to build affordable housing where there's available land, yet there's no transit system to get folks to jobs, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things I think there's no answer. There's really no adequate answer right now, on, but that has to be consideration when you're when you are developing in areas where you think part of that mixed use or that that TOD, that transit or de development is going to be, for example, that that it is for affordable housing as part of that. It has to be part of that discussion. I think also, Christina, as well, I think one of the other pieces of that is when we start talking about affordable housing, which I don't think we're going to talk extensively about in this group other than kind of in the land use space. Mm -hmm. But you talking about the total cost of housing and transportation. Unfortunately, I think we often forget the transportation piece of affordable housing. And um, so while the housing may be less expensive in one location, if it requires car ownership, it, when you do the total cost. So I think um, 
we're going to have some really good conversations here, <laughs> and we're going to have a really robust report to get back to our legislators. Um, and some of that uh, will hopefully be able to directly impact our transportation space, but some of it might be food for thought um, implementation that helps us both with our affordable housing as well as achieving some of our climate goals. It, it, all, it all connects together. It's a complicated um, and interesting challenge, which I think is why we're all here. So, Madam Chair, uh, excuse me, what's your name again and the agency you're representing? With the last, the last Julie Butler, Butler from DC. I'm sorry? Julie Butler from DC. Okay, uh, Ms. Butler, Kathleen Taylor. Uh, I would like to connect with you offline to discuss the affordable housing uh, point that you made. I'm also uh, a Nevada appointed commissioner for the Nevada Department of Business and Industry. And I'm also the co-chair of the housing subcommittee on behalf of the commission. And we would be, you know, open to continuing the conversation with you. So uh, I'll make sure to track you down and connect with you. So thank you for that, for, for piecing that together and making that connection. Great, thank you. Do you have any other questions? Yes, yeah, in Virginia? Yes, Paul? Uh, Paul Enos, Nevada Trucking Association. I mean, Julie, I think, brings up a really good point. And I mean, this has kind of been an area that's just caused me some consternation over the years. Looking at where we are putting, you know, big new developments. I mean, I, I look at, I look at um, on Pyramid Highway. You know, 20 years ago, Pyramid Highway, great road to go on. When you put 40,000 people or 40,000 homes out there on a state-owned asset, uh, I just think we need to start talking about how local governments in some of these developments, where they go there, how are they going to share some of that burden? Because you took an asset which didn't require a lot of investment, and then you have to put a quarter of a billion dollars into it to make it sustainable. And I think there's really some kind of disconnect. I, I don't want local planning to land use planning to be a state decision, but I think when we're gonna have an impact on state assets, and when there's gonna be a requirement from the state to come in and put money into those assets because of decisions that are made on a local government level, we need to start having a conversation about how they bear some of the burden in getting that asset back up to where they need it. And I mean, that's a problem that we've had for a number of years. I know that there's been legislation that was talked about with that that's uh, been pulled, but I do think that's a conversation we need to have. And I know why local governments do it. For them, new housing means more revenue. So you want to put that out the there, you want to drive that revenue. What's that? In the face of depreciation. Yes, in the face, 100%, in the face of depreciation, the face of depreciation and, of depreciation and lowering property tax, that's, that's definitely an issue. But the local governments do get the revenue from those new developments, and the state oftentimes is left kind of holding the bag on that. So I do think that's something that we do need to put in the conversation a little bit or just be aware of that issue moving forward. Like a religious conversion. Or something. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we didn't even talk about some of the tax abatements that some of those developments get that also take money from local government. So um, I, I don't know how far we're going to be on the regular road right now. Um, we're about due for a break, but before we take a 15 minute break, I do want to acknowledge that some time to go now. Um, Chairwoman. Monroe Morena, who is the chair of the Assembly Growth and Infrastructure Committee, joined us. So I just wanted to announce yes. present you. And you're listening quietly and intently. So um, thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, take a break and we will recess until 11 a.m. Okay.
All right, if we can have everyone take their seats, please. We're going to uh, restart the meeting here and continue with our presentation. Okay. We'll give everybody a minute to get seated, get settled. And we are going to continue talking about uh, the funding challenges in the uh, NCO presentation. Um, I believe we have Lucia Maloney, who is with the Parson Area NCO. Lucia, are you ready? Hmm, it sounds like they're muted. Uh, can you unmute in Northern Nevada? If you are muted, we can't hear you in Southern Nevada. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Can you hear us now? Yes, we can hear you. Ready? Ready. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Maloney. I'm the Transportation Manager in Carson City. I'm the Transportation Director for Carson Area MPO here in the Carson Metropolitan Area. Um, pulling up my slides, uh, building on some of the themes, I think MJ and Bill did a fantastic job of setting the stage at a big picture. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different spin to supplement some of that information, but I'll just preface this by saying ditto both of them. Um, you'll hear from me and then you'll hear from Julie Reagan in a few minutes that we're unique. We're all unique. Um, and I think that's what makes Nevada unique. Um, and as part of the themes for my presentation, um, you'll hear a need to diversify funding streams um, to increase our resiliency and our sustainability of our transportation system. So moving on to the first slide, I'll hit on um, who we are and what we do a little bit of history in our region and then some initiatives that are being taken locally. Um, you saw in the briefing book, Campo uh, is comprised of the Carson City. Uh, we, we serve as a city, but also the county, Northern Douglas County and Western Lyon County. Go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, um, so this is pulled from Campo's 2050 transportation plan uh, for the 30-year cost estimates we're looking at about 1.1 billion uh, over the next 30 years which comes out to about 38 million a year and I'll note that this includes the regionally significant project it does not include uh, local road maintenance or traffic op or transit operations um, now is as is the case um, just generally it's sort of a rule of thumb more urban areas tend to have more mature um, models for how they calculate costs and based on their data. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to zoom in a little bit to Carson City um, and talk about what, what we do here in Carson specifically. We are unique um, in that we're responsible for maintenance of all of our roads, not just the regional roads, but also the local neighborhood streets as well. We maintain about 284 center line miles of roadway. Uh, we do all of the maintenance, including everything shown on the screen. We handle weather events, uh, trees, ditch clearing, graffiti removal, anything related to asphalt. Also complete streets, um, planning and implementation, safety improvements, bike head. We operate the Jump Around Carson Transit System. Um, and all of the control systems in the four county area of Carson, Douglas, Lyon, and Story counties. You move on to the next slide. Carson City manages its assets using a, an adopted payment management plan. We've divided the city into five performance districts, which each span two districts of each of the county supervisors. Um, they have approximately the same number of road miles and approximately the same payment condition. You heard Bill talk about that payment condition index, and we use that here too. Um, all of our money is divided and prioritized into one district each year. This year we're in District 4, uh, fiscal year 22, and we have about $1.2 million to maintain all of the roads in that district this year. Um, so there, it's hard to quantify how much money is needed for the transportation system. You heard Bill talk about um, individual roads being bumpy, I think was the term he used. Um, you know, depending on the needs of an individual corridor, the, the cost for that project can increase dramatically. Um, so I want to simplify it to give you an understanding sort of order of magnitude of what we're talking about in Carson City. Uh, pr approximately 71% of our roads are local roads, 
those are your neighborhood streets. The regional roads are pretty much anything that collects you to a different neighborhood or takes you to a different community. You go to the next slide. Um, since 2017, in accordance with the adopted pavement management plan, no local funding has been invested on local roads. All of it has been invested in the regional roads. So from the start, before you even leave the gates, we've left 71% of our roads untouched since 2017. Next slide. I use 2020, fiscal year 2020 here because it's sort of a pre-pandemic normal. Uh, for the fiscal year 2020 funding for our roads, of the 281.4 centerline miles, we left all of the local roads untouched. And of all of the regional roads, we were able to touch only 4.7 centerline miles, which is less than 2%. So regardless of how you quantify your system need, um, you can see on this slide, I think it's really powerful. We're not even close to the same ball game of what we need to maintain our system. And that leaves roads like these roads on the slide. Um, they've just been continuing to degrade. We have roads all over town. I think um, it took our team about five minutes to identify these roads, but um, they, they all look like this. And every year there's more roads that will cost more to rehabilitate than our entire annual budget to maintain. There's one on this slide, but I just uh, echoing some of the earlier presentations. Our transportation revenues come from five different sources of fuel tax. We do have the 15 cent uh, fuel tax of the gasoline that comes to Carson City. After the 2% that's retained by the state, we take about 14 <coughs> in Carson City per gallon sold in Carson City. We also recently enacted the 5 cent per gallon diesel tax. That was approved by the Board of Supervisors with a sunset clause that it needs to go to the 2022 general election. Um, in order to continue. So we are, as staff, working on preparing that package. Additionally, Carson City has taken a creative approach to revenue, right, and trying to um, bridge that funding gap. So we have a BNT sales tax and a portion of the, the payment after the bond repayment um, goes to streets maintenance, and that was approved by the Board of Supervisors in a revised plan of expenditure in 2019. <laughs> When Carson City approved its waste management contract, there was an acknowledgement that the heavier trash trucks in increase maintenance liability on our local roads. So there's a provision in that contract that has a 3% franchise fee that goes to road maintenance. Um, and then we also have periodic general fund transfers for different projects uh, when money becomes available. Uh, since others have spoke to it, I will say that our transit system is funded through about $400,000 in general fund transfer. Um, again, um, fuel taxes aren't eligible for use on the transit system, so we use general fund to match with the FDA, the federal transit money. Um, and then on the bottom right, you'll see we do a really good job of leveraging local dollars. Um, we don't have a large tax base. Uh, the Campo area has about 60,000 residents. Um, and since 2017, We've leveraged just about $7.8 million to complete uh, over $38 million in transportation capital projects. Um, so that comes out to about 20% local match, which is pretty good. Um, I will take the opportunity before I leave this slide just to note um, federal funding is not eligible for use on local roads. So for those of us that, that maintain and operate on local roads, that money is not eligible. Um, it never has been, and we don't anticipate that it will be. So that's a major gap in the funding system uh, that we, we try to help cover and manage. Um, Bill also asked that I talk about <laughs> operations. Uh, the federal grants that we receive, um, you get a better match rate for capital costs. Generally, we get 90 or 95% uh, federal match uh, for capital investment. But when it comes to operations, like say for transit, generally it's a 50% match. So operations are much more expensive for locals to, to cover. Um, and that's that's another consideration for the funding system. So really briefly, um, Carson City, you know, in an effort to be creative and try to fix the gap, you know, um, we don't have the fuel tax um, indexing that they have in Clark and Washoe. That went to our voters in 2016, uh, and it failed by 65%. It was 65% voted no. Um, we have given an opportunity to talk about this and look to address it again. I think the appetite is there. 
Um, and we've, we've spent the last year looking at potential revenue options. Uh, there's the traditional user pays options, and I think those, those discussions are happening here at this level. We're also looking at assessment and sales and services taxes type options. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we have at SAC level analyzed uh, eight different options for how we might bridge that transportation funding gap in Carson City. We've weighted them uh, based on evaluation criteria and the Carson City uh, adopted strategic goals. Um, if you go to the next slide, and we pull potential illustrative um, revenue rates for each of the options. Um, oh, nice, nice zoom in. Thank you so much. Um, and where we are right now is, you know, with that $38 million a year, you know, for the regional transportation plan uh, funding need, even any of these uh, options alone uh, won't be the magic bullet to cover our funding. So we've been given direction as staff to look at four different options right now. We're looking at a program of local improvements under existing NRFs, potentially general improvement district, um, and then two different transportation sales tax options. So over the next six months or so, staff are looking at uh, the legal and the fiscal implications and the framework for how we might start covering those gaps um, here in Carson City. Um, and that has to work in tandem with the work that's being done in this group here uh, today over the next year uh, because there's different needs, right? And you've heard that we're all unique um, and we all have different needs and our travelers are unique and those different modes are unique. And so I think the more that we're able to talk about funding that is resilient um, and funding that can be used in different ways for different modes, I think the better chance we have to bridge that funding gap. Um, so scrolling ahead, um, those are the three slash four options that we're looking at. You can skim through that and go to the next one. Um, and for us, with that 65% that voted no to the indexing, uh, we're looking at a different approach, um, and we're looking at how we can better communicate with our taxpayers. I know that the rural counties aren't here. I don't think NACO is presenting today, but um, and talking with them as well, um, there seems to be you know a broad understanding that some of the more rural counties in Nevada um, have an have an openness to discussing funding infrastructure. Uh, but those voters need to understand what they're getting when they when they pay money toward that. Um, and so we're, we're looking at speaking to that in Carson City um, as well and really focusing on that in the next uh, year or so. Um, finally, for us, looking at the revenue approach and the implementation approach, so we're kind of taking a, a look at two pieces in parallel. One is the technical details, as I mentioned, and the other is that implementation and stakeholder outreach approach. Um, so we can understand and better communicate you know, how we're collecting revenues, how we're prioritizing investments, and how will we monitor and report that so that our, our voters really understand it in a better way. Um, as each of the agencies presenting here are looking to explore opportunities to self-fund their infrastructure, I think the work that we're doing here and coming together as a state is really important um, for ensuring that the funding needs of the system holistically are covered um, into the future. And so with that, I will end and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Lisa, you have questions for Lisa? Yes, Madam Chair, Ann Silver, Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. It, are the demographics for the aging of the population in Carson City, do you think that's responsible for the 65% no vote that you got? And how would you imagine addressing that second time around? That's a, that's a great question, Ann. Um, you know, we've talked about that. I think that that certainly played a role. Um, but what we have heard, especially over the last couple of years, as we've talked about this, is it had less to do with the demographics and more to do, I think, with the messaging and communicating, you know, what it is that people are going to get when when they write a check, when they pay those taxes. Um, because the costs of transportation are so variable, right? Even the cost of, of lumber and the cost of construction this season are so high, but how do we compare that? And every time it seems like when we go out and we get these costs, very hard to firm them up um, and so I think that that can um, unintentionally create doubt in the taxpayers minds of, of what that number is or where, it, where it's going and so I think this group to define that and better be able to communicate it better and consistently as a state is really important. Thank you. Other questions? Alicia? Paul East, Nevada Trucking, you know, looking at, you know, since it's traveling down Carson City today compared to 20 years ago, 
so much easier because of the Carson bypass. And while that is a state road, that was something that the citizens of Carson City also participated in by putting an additional uh, nickel tax on themselves. So I just wanted to you know, recognize Carson for doing that. You know, I think that that's probably, you know, something that we should think about in the future, not just where folks do it the wrong way, but also do the right way. And I mean, I think Carson City is a great example of having the citizens invest in that state infrastructure because it would actually help improve the lives of everyone here. And, you know, I take advantage of that every time I come down to this meeting after the wait, you know, 15 lights coming down Carson Street. Thank you, Paul. Um, other questions? Madam Chair? Uh, and I promise I'm not going to ask any more questions. Kathleen, Kayla, this is a kind of like uh, looking, from, looking at this from a futuristic perspective, looking at just the concept of revenue. If by chance, if by chance, there is a federally, federally regulated digital dollar currency that's coming down the pipeline, maybe as a parking lot issue, or maybe as a potential little caveat contingency plan that uh, the Nevada, Nevada uh, transportation powers that be, or even we can start the conversation here with this group could uh, look at potential systems to put in place when that transition comes and how that's going to affect revenue being generated from the transportation dollars into digital currency. So it, it, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. There's a, I mean, there, there's a house that went on sale uh, with cryptocurrency three months ago here in Vegas. Uh, a couple of NFL, NBA teams are using cryptocurrency in order for consumers to buy tickets. So, just up to speak. Okay, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just going to encourage you all to keep asking questions. So I don't, I don't know how often we're going to get a chance to ask all these MPOs together. So um, there's no, I, you, we don't have a budget for questions. So <laughs> please feel free to ask away. Um, so, Lucia, this is Virginia Valentine. I have a question. This might be a question for Bill. But I noticed you, um, you've estimated here um, the potential gross revenue on fuel tax indexing and what that would generate. When you, in the calculating of that number, has anybody looked at, like, um, how much revenue Washoe County might be missing out on if people are, in fact, buying you know, if they are selectively buying gas in a place where they are not paying indexing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that goes on in Clark County and Knight County too, but um, I'm just interested if that, I, and I, that's probably a little bit out of the scope of what we're going to look at today, but I'm just interested in what, what kind of disparities there might be between counties. So if I might, Bill Thomas from RBC Washoe, um, it's been a subject of conversation for many, many years. But no one that I'm aware of has been proactive about trying to address it. I think it's just a comment so far. Nobody's nobody's initiated or proposed anything that I'm aware of to try to rectify that. But it does, I mean, I would say it does make it harder to justify inter-regional transportation planning when people are looking at their bucket of money saying, well, how would I want to partner with somebody if they're not just going to come in and take the money I have. So if there were some way to use that kind of revenue to get more regional coordination, inter-county coordination, I think that would be really positive, particularly up north where you have, you know, four or five counties that are all inter-relying on each other for transportation. Madam Chair, so we, uh, I speak quite frequently with Mr. Bill Brady on the law fund, and I think we all do, right? <laughs> and, and he certainly has brought up a, a good point, though. Uh, and border cities, and I actually talked to Guy Hobbs about this, where there is fuel, fuel revenue indexing, those border cities um, do pay that. There is an impact. Uh, in, in Laughlin, for example, these cross the bridge, and the folks that live in Laughlin will go to Bullhead City and fill up their cars. 
with gas. So it's not unique, and it's it's really consideration how impactful it is. I I, I don't know in terms of um, you know the financial impact uh, to those local businesses, but uh, it is something that um, is not uncommon. Mr. Wellman. Uh, Bill Wellman, uh, Nevada Contract Association. In response to that, in 2013, when we started the AB 413 process for fuel revenue indexing, this conversation came up because it was a model after Washoe. And I, <clears throat> I've had offices in Carson City dating back to 1985. And the two counties have always competed with each other on the gas tax or gas costs. So when we actually got into it, we started really looking at it. And even today, if you go there and try to buy fuel in Carson City, the, the base cost of fuel in Carson City is the same as what it is in, in Reno. If you go to a Chevron, it's going to be the same. If you go to a Shell, it's going to be the same as a Shell. It may not be mm -hmm. exactly the same in the computer. So they're, I don't think they get the leakage that they thought. And we had that issue with, in Laughlin, mm -hmm. you know, when concerns about that, and they wanted to opt out. Right. And we had a, we addressed it as we don't have the same situation here in Clark County as they do in Washoe with all the competing counties right adjacent and people commuting back and forth more, on a more regular basis in the year. But as you look at it more and more and more, and I, I travel up there several times a month, and I buy gas in both places, and this is about the same. What I find interesting, two weeks ago when I'm there, uh, their indexing uh, costs are 20 something cents a gallon more than here. Mm -hmm. But the fuel costs are actually cheaper in Reno right. than they were here in Clark County. And I only should use Chevron because it's business. But um, So I thought that was quite interesting that we surpassed that at this point at the end of the state in itself. And there's a 20 cent gap in the So I don't think that's as big a deal as people actually think it is. I think that's something we may need our consultant to bring back kind of the data showing what fuel prices are across the state because the public doesn't understand that's right. that. That's right. And so the public thinks because they hear that they're paying a lot more so i think that would be good for us to understand as we, what, because it it'll impact our decision making it'll impact the legislator decision making but i think that would be good thanks um Bill, for bringing that up yep good good information to have um other questions for lucia All right any of the mpos maybe at this point We've got one more to go all right then um we will move on to Julie Reagan. Uh, she is the director of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. Julie, are you ready to go there? That's great. We can just queue up the slides. We are ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of this working group and NDOT for sponsoring it, members of our legislature for taking this on. I appreciate it. I'm Julie Reagan, and I am the Chief of External Affairs and Deputy Director at the TRPA. And uh, as Lucia said, uh, we're all unique in our own way, but what I'm struck by hearing in uh, the conversation this morning is this common thread that we all have to do something differently. And I think it's really exciting that we're on the verge of really something transformational. We're looking at a systems change. How we fund transportation in this country has to change, and that is difficult. And the one thing I know in my 17 years of working in Lake Tahoe is that, you know, public policy matters on these on this scale is a challenge. And so it's going to really take all of us working together. Uh, we're um, unique in another way compared to what we've heard this morning in that TRPA uh, as the bi state interstate compact with California, uh, we serve as the MPO, but we do not run transit, we do not implement road maintenance and other things. We partner with our agency. So we are part of the Nevada family, but we have this much larger extended family with the state of California, the federal government, all our local jurisdictions, other implementing partners like the Tahoe Transportation District, which is also mentioned in our compact that formed us uh, now 50 years ago. And so I'll get into a little bit of that nuance, but I'm gonna to try to stay high level and look at more the policy lens of what we're trying to achieve in making some of these changes that really matter um, to the state. And for us in Lake Tahoe, as I always say, what happens on the land affects the water. So not only are we talking about the economy and the quality of life for our local residents and our visitors, but we're talking about how the clarity of the lake 
is affected because the fine particles that run off into the lake are what's driving the clarity loss and pollution. So we look at it from a few different aspects, really that triple bottom line of the environment, the economy, and the community. So I will go to the next slide. A little background, uh, as we've all started out in explaining, uh, we have a lot in common, but we all are unique. And uh, I think Lake Tahoe is more unique even in the whole country than probably a lot of folks are familiar with. So uh, looking at the, the big document, which you probably can't read on the right, that's an excerpt from our compact. And that was first passed and ratified in 1969 when Governor Laxalt was the governor of Nevada and Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. And their friendship really said, we're not going to let Tahoe turn gray on our watch. So in 1969, President Nixon signed our compact. And uh, on the left-hand side, that's a picture of the flag flying over the Capitol. Our congressional delegation was kind enough to have a flag flown in honor of that 50-year anniversary back in December a couple of years ago. And we had a proclamation by Governor Sisolak just last year recognizing this really unique 50-year partnership. When you think about uh, the scale of what that's taken to keep it whole, it's, it's quite impressive. There are about 200 interstate compacts in the country in, in transportation world, think Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. But really, there is only one like ours, and that is us, Lake Tahoe, where we have the land use authority, the enforcement to back it up, to really manage growth and development, interspersed with transportation and all the planning of natural resources in the area. Everything from air and water quality to vegetation like forest health, right down to scenic resources and noise standards. So the compact was a visionary document and it has really uh, formed as our, it has served as our constitution for the basin of our governance, how we bring all these partners together. We have like nine federal agencies that work in Tahoe. 80% of the land is managed by the US Forest Service. So we have a huge tract of federal land we are not a national park, so we don't qualify for programs like Yosemite. And just a, an interesting fact, we are about a third the size of Yosemite. We're much smaller than Yosemite, but we get about three times as many visitors. So we get about 15 million annual visitors on a population base that's roughly the size of the Carson City area. We're at about 55,000 uh, full-time residents, and that's basin-wide, Nevada and California. So that's a huge swell, and we're going to talk a little bit about the challenge of how we how we manage that. But in terms of that connection of land use to transportation, uh, I heard it from Paul from the Trucking Association. Like that's a big challenge for the state. We actually are set up in Tahoe to affect more positive change along those lines with the authority that we have. But as anyone who's been to Tahoe on July 4th or really any day this summer, you can see we have not solved this problem. We have massive amounts of private automobiles and getting people out of their cars and into improved transportation solutions is, is a real challenge. So I will take the next slide, thank you. So this is a map that is showing the greater metropolitan area really from the left-hand corner down to the San Francisco Bay Area up to the right-hand corner of Reno and beyond on I-80 and a, uh, a heat map really of the trip intensity and if you look at the stats in the basin entry point with on the right hand side, we're looking at a snapshot in time from July of 2019. And so the point of the story is the, the traffic in summer is generally split north to south shore. It's about 55% um, intensity of trips on the south end of the lake. So the, the entry points of Spooner Summit and Luther Pass and Kingsbury and Echo Summit, of course, Echo coming up from Sacramento and the Bay Area. Also on the North Shore, you've got Tahoe City, Kings Beach, Mount Rose, entry points, and it, that's about a 45% concentration of the trip. So uh, it's just a complicated system to manage those really intense peak times. And what we're just seeing in new research that's being conducted by the Tahoe Science Advisory Council is that when it goes above 100 degrees in Sacramento, we're seeing just you know, very significant jumps in our trips. So, and we know that days are getting hotter. And so this is something that we're watching very closely of how do we manage that increased demand of day trips into the basin. Um, in addition with destination visitors that are flying in, most likely from the Reno or Sacramento airports, um, how do you manage that with the goods and services and the local quality of life? 
which has almost hit a tipping point in certain areas in the last couple of years. You know, a lot of tourist destinations in the world were shut down with COVID. Uh, we actually saw huge increases because people were clamoring to get outdoors. People wanted to get outside. So our public lands, places where it was, you know, a local like myself, our secret spots are no longer secret. You know, everyone's putting them on the Instagram and really just think, this is my new secret spot. And people are, are enjoying their public lands, which is the idea, but we are almost at a point of not just overcrowded, which we're used to being crowds and peaks because we're a resort community. And uh, it's a $5 billion annual economy that drives tourism, and drives our economy. But we're almost at the point of being overwhelmed with some of this new demand and the patterns of demand that, that we're seeing. So I will take the next slide, please. So this is really uh, a seasonal map, the map of the lake on the left. And you can, of course, see the state line and the various communities around the lake. The left side is winter. And that's from 2019, also around February. The right map is the summer in July. And so the left, not a surprise, the yellow and red are the hottest amount of trips. Look down on the South Lake Tahoe end and the lower right on the left side of winter and you see Heavenly Ski Resort. It's just, it's lit up. And there are amount, a lot of trips that are going to ski and on the north end as well. The west side, not so much, often avalanches and snow uh, loads close portions of the west shore at Emerald Bay. So not a surprise, but still um, shows some, some heat tendencies there. On the right side, trip density, uh, you know, as the kids would say, it's just lit. Like, it's lit. <laughs> like, the whole map is lit up, and it is very busy, and we have actual pings of cell phone data that show where those greatest concentrations are where people are mountain biking, where people are parking around Emerald Bay, around Sand Harbor, these two very, very intense corridors. Uh, and I know many of you uh, have experienced that where at the point now, people are parking where it says no parking all along Highway 28, all along Highway 89. We've, we've been forming corridor planning working groups. We have stakeholder involvement. We've involved our law enforcement partners. We've had to involve our judicial partners because uh, at one point our our judicial partners were not really interested in enforcing parking tickets if there are no other ways for folks to get there. So we've had to work through that over time to say we need to provide other options for folks, uh, but we are we are just not there yet. And a lot of that relates to how we're structured and the balkanization of funding at Lake Tahoe. But really the point about this map is how do you scale a system? How do you go from a system of like 50 some thousand people up to 15 million people on your peaks, which you know used to be maybe about uh, 10 or 12 days a year was your peak. Now we're seeing much more smooth peaks throughout the summer into the fall. What we used to know as uh, shoulder season where locals could go out and enjoy without crowds. That's really changed a lot in recent years. So that's that's the challenge to highlight there. We'll go to the next slide. So a little bit on the revenue front. Now I know uh, I have learned so much from all of our partners here of, on the revenue and expense side. I'm just going to be very general in this conversation, but we just adopted our 2020, uh, just this spring in 2021, our regional <coughs> transportation plan. And that acronym up at the top, RTP, Regional Transportation Plan, SCS, in California, we also have something called a sustainable community strategy that's required by law. And um, it's essentially what we do in Tahoe already of connecting land use to transportation planning and looking at this now under the lens from both states of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we just went through this giant process where we looked at all of our funding, constrained versus unconstrained. Uh, the language uh, nomenclature and transportation alone is enough to make your head spin, but basically constrained. What is like the foreseeable funding opportunities that you have? What's feasible? Unconstrained is kind of like, I really don't know how we're going to pay for that. So overall, we have about a three and a half billion, 3.4 billion transportation plan. We envision that we could come up with about 2.4 billion, uh, a shortfall of over a billion. This is over the length of 20, 25 years we're talking about. 
And we've identified Nevada shortfall at 30 million, but that's just one part of the picture. We have a much bigger unfunded need in California as well. And so um, if you look at the bar chart, uh, what's interesting in our transit bar that we haven't talked about much today, and that is water transit. We have an envisioned system for ferries and small water taxis that are integrated with our land use system, and that's in our 2020 plan. We're looking to do a lot more with technology. Things like when, if you're in Reno and you could get a ping that Sand Harbor is already full or get a picture of what the 28 corridor would look like before you decide to drive up over Mount Rose or up over Schooner, you know, we can do a lot better on that front. We can do a lot better with reservation systems. We're just starting to pilot some of those um, and we're researching what other destinations around the world are doing, but that's what the technology sliver really references and that's that you know, traffic, uh, travel demand services. Operations and maintenance, we've covered a lot of ground on O&M today. This is a huge problem for us. You know, the other thing that we're different in terms of our MPO status, you know, we don't do O&M, that's our local implementers. We don't get much in the way of fuel tax. We don't get much in the way of sales tax. So because we have these six independent jurisdictions, it's really difficult to have, you know, voter referendums and initiatives that move forward in a regional direction. Um, we have had some improvements in that. I'm gonna to talk to you about in a second, but it's very difficult. It is a balkanized system. Our job as the MPO is to bring that together. Uh, but we've just had the status as MPO really for 20 years. It was our congressional delegation that recognized that Lake Tahoe needed these tools um, at the federal level to bring money into Tahoe. The corridor plans, that's where we're focusing a lot of attention right now. I mentioned around Highway 28 at Sand Harbor and Emerald Bay are the two big ones. Um, and active transportation, so biking and pedestrian facilities, we've had a huge push on that in recent years, which we found that if we build these facilities, people will use them. We're right now at about an 85% auto share, 15% non-auto share. For a rural community, that's pretty darn impressive. It used to be over 90, 95 um, personal automobile. So it's really by investing in active transportation that we've seen when people want to come to Tahoe, they like to get out of their cars. We just haven't had many opportunities for them to do that. So we're really looking at the blueprint of this plan to move us in that direction and to reduce greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled. We have about 1.4 million annual vehicle, uh, daily vehicle miles traveled, VMT. So we actually just looked at an amendment to that with this package of the regional transportation plan of how that is structured in terms of our overall regulatory framework. And that was a big, heavy policy lift, um, but we feel like now we're in a per capita VMT model and we feel like that's gonna be much more uh, supportive of going more multimodal, which is our goal at, at Lake Tahoe. I will take the next slide, please. So we have something called a bi-state consultation on transportation, and you're going to hear later from Director Cole. He is a co-chair of that uh, initiative from Nevada, DCNR. He works with the counterpart in California, Secretary Wade Crowfoot, to convene a stakeholder working group around transportation. And so we spent a considerable amount of time at looking at our full RTP, our Regional Transportation Plan, to identify what are the top regional priorities. Sounds easy, right? You know, I mean, the great news about Lake Tahoe is that everyone loves Lake Tahoe, everyone's committed. Uh, the bad news about Lake Tahoe is that everyone's committed and everyone wants to get involved <laughs> and everyone has a little bit of different idea of how we move the needle on solving the transportation problem. So what we, we came to consensus around the policy goals for transportation at Lake Tahoe, which is reducing our vehicle miles traveled and congestion, improving our community connectivity and prioritizing our, our trails and our network of biking and pedestrian facilities. And those are the overall policy goals. And that tears right back to the compact. The Bi-State Compact actually gives us a policy mandate to reduce dependency on the automobile and to reduce air pollution from emissions. So uh, that's a lofty goal. And I think we are finally poised with the leadership of both states around this consultation to enact positive change to really move the needle in reducing greenhouse gases and making Tahoe a more walkable, likable, friendly experience where you could come to Tahoe, park your car once, and get around otherwise without your personal automobile. Uh, everybody needs a dream. This is our dream, and this is where we <laughs> a lot of new policy and revenue solutions to get there. 
So I, I won't go through all of these, but basically what we've done is broken down our big regional capital investments, the corridors I mentioned, US Highway 50 community re revitalization down on the South Shore, and that's looping the highway around the casino core and building in a, a Main Street pedestrian friendly experience. We've got transit trails and technology bundled into those priorities and we've identified priority projects in that direction. And then again, the operation and maintenance. Our, our local governments um, are very, very challenged. They have some of the same challenges that Lucia pointed out with Carson City. It's difficult to get initiatives passed. You know, just for an example of some of the miles of road that we've talked about, we have about 550 miles of local roads in Lake Tahoe in the basin alone. We have about 80 of state highway. That's essentially the route around the basin in California and Nevada, and Don and Caltrans manage those. We have spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars retrofitting those roads with stormwater infrastructure and infiltration technologies. That was our first, our first push. Let's reduce the amount of sediments going in. And we have fortunately been able to, to achieve a great deal there. But now we need to do better in terms of the mobility, and that's where the focus of this plan is. So we'll go to the next slide. And so this is a pie chart that basically shows our revenue shares. I mean, we're funding anywhere from 50 to $100 million of transportation projects at Lake Tahoe any year. The money often flows through us as the MPO, and then we allocate that out through the FTIP and other, other mechanisms. And we share that with the Tahoe Transportation District, who, who implements transit on the South Shore. On the North Shore, Placer County implements the Tahoe Area Rapid Transit, the TART system. And um, the interesting thing I wanted to pull out of this slide, there are about 40 different funding sources that fund this, this investment in transportation. So it, it gets complicated fast. But the local share of 30%, this is our envision for the next uh, chunk of couple of decades. We actually have a TBID that passed the Business Improvement District on the North Shore. That's going to generate substantial funding for transportation, additional, you know, transient occupancy taxes and things that are more traditional. But the TBID was a heavy lift for our local community there. The South Shore um, has been looking at different methods of funding as well. Um, the big nut to crack is the regional 20% at the bottom lower right. And this is new revenue that we basically, our governing board, 15 member board from both states with one non-voting presidential appointee, when they adopted this RTP, they said, we are going to commit to finding a minimum of 20 million a year of new revenue. And so that was embedded into all the assumptions for our BMT standard change and the RTP decisions. And so this is what we're engaged in now with the bi-state consultation on transportation to come up with a consensus plan. And as you well could imagine, you know, there are a lot of ideas. A lot of you have gone through all those different revenue options. Something that was bandied about in a recent study was an, a basin entry fee or some kind of transportation user fee. We do not have consensus on that in our community. So we are working through that as we speak in real time, like all of you are. But we are on the hook to deliver this 20% regional revenue, which is a minimum of 20 million new. And we're really starting the clock there um, in 2023. So we are due a report back to the interim committee. We have a, a legislative oversight committee uh, here in Nevada. And we are due a report back to that committee when it convenes later this fall. So we'll be doing a lot more work between now and then to really flesh out a lot more of these revenue opportunities. I'll take the next slide. And so the regional share, as I said, is really designed to address our climate goals, reducing greenhouse gases. Um, the transportation sector is significant. What we just found in a recent inventory that actually the heating sector, the energy sector has jumped above transportation. And that is largely because a lot of our development is old in Lake Tahoe. Um, but again, connecting land use to transportation really is the sweet spot that we're identifying for whatever revenue potential uh, opportunities we have. And when you look at the revenue solutions, equity is a major issue for us because we know if we were to impose a transportation user fee, we, we have many disadvantaged communities right here in our local community, as well as our surrounding neighbors. So this is an issue that's of great concern to our board and to all the stakeholders in uh, the Tahoe Basin. I will take my last slide. And really, um, it's just a reminder that Lake Tahoe is this shared priority. 
uh, not just for the state of Nevada, uh, not just from our con congressional delegation in Nevada, but really our congressional delegation in both states and at the administration at the highest levels in both states and in Washington, D.C., right down to our local elected officials, our local community, and the 15 million people who visit here. Everyone really um, shares that goal to do their part to protect the lake. And that is what we call our environmental improvement program. We are celebrating our 25th annual summit. Um, probably a lot of you have participated in those summits in August. This year, it's largely virtual because of the COVID situation, but that gives us an opportunity to shed a light on these very um, but unique, but also similar challenges to what you're having. And so we are embarking on that next week. If you haven't registered yet, it's online uh, at the Take Care Tahoe website. And we will be featuring um, discussions around this very topic. So uh, everyone is um, feeling the pain of this. We are in good company, uh, but we really believe that the model of Tahoe has been partnership and collaboration. And that's what we expect to solve this yet next huge challenge. So appreciate your time. Thank you, Julie. Do we have a question? I have, I have one. Um, Virginia, can you talk a little bit about how you're impacted by climate policy? Climate policy? Is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Great. Great. Thank you for the question. So. Um, Interesting question. It should be an easy answer, but it's a little more complicated. I'll, I'll give you the, the short version. So Tahoe, we have an independent board. We have our own climate initiative for the basin, but we are a creature of the two states. So we really, our job is to harmonize policies at the state level of California and Nevada, and then also the Congress because Congress consented to our compact. So our job really is to connect the dots of all of those different climate policies we also have local governments, Placer County, the city of South Lake Tahoe is a couple examples that have their own climate initiatives. So we actually work together through that partnership umbrella of the EIP, the Environmental Improvement Program, to harmonize all those goals. So we're just really embracing the greenhouse gas reduction goals of both states, but looking at a local level of how we can facilitate that continued transformational change. For example, we did a plug-in vehicle foot program to look at identifying all the infrastructure opportunities, really from the I-80 corridor up to Truckee and into the Tahoe Basin. So when we do hopefully have additional investment in that kind of infrastructure, we already know where the plug-in facilities will be. So that's where we can add value to customize the climate goals in the Tahoe Basin, but be generally supportive of the initiatives of both states. So the TRPA compact really gives our board independent authority around climate, but we uh, consider ourselves more part of the overall family of trying to do our part to reduce greenhouse gases. And, and quite honestly, as Tahoe always is, is to be um, an inspiration and a leader in those spaces to show that in an area that's regulated and has a lot of difference of opinion, that we still can come together to get things done when it benefits our triple bottom line of the lake and the economy and the community. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to make sure that I understood you correctly, uh, going back to your reference my reference which you can make that slide. So, uh, are local governments from California also involved with that revenue share portion, or is that just bad local, local governments? I'm not sure. Can you just with the, I just need a repetition of the question. There was a little. Oh, so the the yeah. uh, the local government share, right? So so we apply there. Yeah. I'm looking at some of there, and that also includes California local government as well, right? Yes. So yes, the answer is yes. So we have three counties. Um, we have two counties and an incorporated city in California. We have one. The only incorporated jurisdiction in the basin is the city of South Lake Tahoe roughly about 25,000 people. We have El Dorado County, which is there's some unincorporated areas within Tahoe that are in their bailiwick and Placer County, which really starts on the North Shore of Tahoma up through Tahoe City up to the Nevada line at Kings Beach. So those three jurisdictions are on the California side and they are all part of this plan and this program. And everyone's doing things um, a little differently. I'll give you an example, it's a good question. The North Shore um, just went very bullish on a new microtransit program. 
They are seeing huge success. It's configured in with the TART, the public system, but it's an on-demand, uh, more like a minivan shuttle. It's like Uber in a van. It ties into their public system. And at least 35% of the passengers have never taken transit before. So we're already seeing some innovation in that space. So they're definitely part of it. And then they are a huge partner in the corridor planning that we're doing from a regional scale and breaking it into their components that affect their local area plans and their community plans. And then on the Nevada side, of course, we have Washoe County and Douglas County. And then Douglas County splits the state line, uh, which is the largest bed base at the casino core. Uh, so for example, um, the July of 2019, those, those heat maps that we were looking at with the transit or with the travel information, you know, that is the booming area of Tahoe. In July, there must have been some really good concerts. Maybe Dave Matthews was playing at the Hardy's Outdoor Amphitheater because that was showing a lot of traffic in from Schooner. And we know we have a lot of drive up for those weekend attractions. That's where the largest bed base is in the basin. And so Highway 50, which is a federal highway, goes right through the heart of that South Shore. So it spans the city of South Lake Tahoe's jurisdiction and Douglas County. And then, of course, further into the state of Nevada. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We have other questions for Julie. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we are about 10 minutes early, so we're going to go ahead and take our break now. Um, would you all, I think we're scheduled to get together at 1.10. Are you all good with getting back together at 1? Ben? All right. So um, you're free to, of course, stay here or leave. Um, Lunch is somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure. Back. I'm not sure where lunch is in Carson, so I'll defer to them to tell the team up there where it is. It looks like oh, it looks like it's in that back corner. Thanks, DJ. <laughs> lunch down here is, is right here in this other room off um, to the back. Okay. Um, and we really do want you to uh, try to stay on campus. Both sides stay on campus because we do want to start on time at one. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll start the stampede. Yes. So, uh,
Okay. Okay, we're going to get started here again in another minute. So if everybody wants to kind of get settled, get some water, get seated, and we'll Sorry, I'm Next item on our agenda today is an overview of federal funding for transportation. Um, so before we hear about the state uh, transportation system managed by NDOT, we're going to hear from Felicity Denny, and she oversees NDOT's financial planning, which includes the federal funding. Good afternoon. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch, and then you can all hear me all right. Um, if we could go to the First slide there, Nick. Uh, I'm Felicia Denny, Assistant Director of for NDOT. And I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the highway program. It's an important source of revenue for the state. And that's what we're really happy about it. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Nick. So, the FHWA is the agency that supports the federal aid highway system. There's also a federal aid, uh, highway, uh, federal lands highway program that helps with various federal and tribal owned lands. Uh, we have a federal aid, uh, federal highway administration, excuse me, office right here in Carson City, and that's where they're headquartered. And uh, they partner with us and provide oversight and guidance and we're regular support. And, and as was mentioned previously, this federal aid supports the higher volume roadway. We can't use federal aid on the local road. And um, there's a very small amount of funding available for other things, such as planning and, and things like that, uh, bike and, and ped, but it's, it's really a very small subset of the program. Uh, also, maintenance activities that we use to keep the roadways open, such as plowing snow, uh, weed control, those types of things, picking up uh, debris off the highway, uh, those are the responsibility of state and local government. So the federal government does not participate in that. They're expecting the state and the local governments to take care of that. Uh, and uh, we're also a pass-through for federal transit for the rural. And uh, we have a, a really great rural transit program where we pass through on average, uh, average you know, seven to eight million dollars to the rural transit authority. And the uh, MPOs, they have their own funding that they receive directly from the federal government. And the federal aid, it amounts to about 45% of our budget. And so we're very grateful for it. It's, it's a significant chunk of money for us. Uh, go ahead. Um, so we're talking about revenue. I wanted to talk a little bit about where, where the federal government gets their revenue for this. And they established the Federal Highway Trust Fund in 1956 to support this federal aid highway program. And the trust fund has two accounts. It has a mass transit and a highway account. Uh, similar to our state highway fund, about 84% of the revenue that comes in to this highway trust fund is from gas and diesel tax. Uh, they also get tax from tires, over truck trailer sales, heavy vehicle use, and some, some interest. And the federal tax, the last time it was raised, was October 1st of 1993. This is not indexed to inflation. And uh, I looked up a, a publication from the Tax Policy Center. is a briefing book, and it said if it had been indexed, that the federal rate on gas would be around 33 cents per gallon, and diesel would be around 44 cents per gallon. So you can see from that measure how we're just not keeping up with inflation. And 
not a surprise to anyone sitting in this room. Uh, one of the misconceptions that a lot of consumers have is that when you fill your tank, if gas is now $4 a gallon versus $2 a gallon, that we're somehow collecting more taxes and we're not. We're getting that 18.4 cents or the you know 27.5 cents for diesel or, or, or regular gas. And same with the federal government. The state is a little bit better than the feds as far as keeping up to date with inflation because we updated our tax rates in 1995. So still, we're still behind on that. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. Thank you. Oh, Jeff's doing it. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I thought Dick was in charge of everything. <laughs> so, as we were just, as I was just mentioning, we haven't been able to keep up with inflation. And one of the things that the federal government has done to offset that is they uh, put in one time transfers from the general fund, primarily to shore up the federal highway trust fund. And if you look at this graph that's showing on the screen, the blue, the blue portion of the bars are receipts and interest and revenues. The green portion of the bars are one-time transfers in, and that red line, those are outlays or payments that the uh, federal government makes to eligible entities such as NDOT. And so looking forward, uh, those projections from based on Congressional Budget Office figures show a gap between receipts that are anticipated and expenditures that are expected to go out. And so that is something that will have to be dealt with. Uh, can you go ahead and look at the next slide, please. And so how do we deal with this and how do we get our funding? Uh, basically, federal highway funding is provided in multi-year surface transportation acts. And the latest act that we had that was passed was passed in December 2015, providing funding through September of 2020, which was called the FAST Act. Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. And that also provided a, 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 that influx, that green bar that we saw in the previous chart to shore up the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, this act was extended one more year, so it goes through September 2021. And Congress is currently working on new federal funding legislation. And the, the current uh, legislation we're looking at is bipartisan in nature, and it's called the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, IIJA. And this is expected to cover fiscal years 22 through 26, and also includes an infusion of funding to shorten the Highway Trust Fund. Um, a nice thing about this, and again, it's a proposal; it's not a done deal, and we all have to we all have to keep that in mind because I get really excited about any increases in funding. But it proposes a roughly 25% increase, um, with larger increases in the first year. Uh, for instance, it's estimated that Nevada would receive about a 21% increase in the first year from about 397.5 million to 481.1 million. So it's an $83 million increase, not enough to meet the, the needs that we've identified, but certainly a welcome addition. Uh, subsequently, in subsequent years, we're looking at around 2% increases to end up in 2026 with about 123.2 million more anticipated than what we're seeing now. Um, also in that act is uh, some new money for bridge replacement, a new program is proposed, and a new electric vehicle infrastructure program, which is a, a welcome addition. And so uh, keep your fingers crossed. We're hoping that <laughs> that does get passed and we'll see that new legislation. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the next slide. So once the legislation passes, uh, we don't, unfortunately, we don't get sacks of money delivered to our office, which I would just love. Uh, we have a lot of steps to go through to, uh, to access that money. Um, the money is provided to the state, about 92% of it is in apportionments. And those are, are distributed to the various programs, and those are originally designed to be given to the states by formula. And the formula that we were looking at looked at lane miles on federal aid highways, looked at vehicle miles traveled and fatalities on federal highways, 
contributions that states made to the Highway Trust Fund, and also population data. But in 2009, uh, those formulas were largely frozen. And uh, so even though it's apportioned, those formulas aren't getting updated. Uh, Nevada, and, and uh, as like many states, has done quite well, though, receiving more money out than we've paid in, largely due to those general fund contributions. Um, most of the, the uh, programs go directly to MDOT, and some others pass through MDOT and are controlled by local entities, uh, MPOs, or are suballocated to be spent in some areas. And so we work very closely with our MPOs. Our projects are required to be in our statewide transportation improvement program or STIP document and showing how they're funded and how much they cost. And the local entities also have uh, a tip that aligns with our STIP. Um, the, the federal government, when they pass the funding, they also pass what's called an obligation limitation, which limits the amount of funds that a state can obligate in any given year. And so we'll receive a certain amount for, for the funds and then a slightly lesser amount for obligation limitation. And this is done for budgetary control. Um, it's also important to note that this funding is reimbursable. And so what happens is when we have a project that's ready to go, we have the funds identified. We've met all the federal requirements, whether they be certifications, uh, being in the STIP, any requirements we need. We provide all the information for the Federal Highway Administration. The FHWA enters into an agreement with us that allows us to obligate the funds. They're free to reimburse us as to make expenditures. So that little green chevron on the screen that shows expended, once we expend money and pay our contractors first, then we'll get reimbursed <clears throat> the appropriate amount less the matching funds. And so no money actually changes hands until we get down to making expenditures. And then last but not least, we'll bill the FHWA and they'll reimburse us an appropriate proportion. And Nevada is very lucky because since we have so much federal land, our matching requirement is very low. It's typically 5%. <laughs> programs that have a, a higher match, but the vast majority of them are 5%. And just out of curiosity, I looked to see if anyone else had that generous of a match, and they don't. But Alaska comes close because their programs are covered 94.95%, and next is Arizona at 943 and Utah at 93.23. So there's a few states, mostly Western states, that enjoy a high match. Look at our next, next slide. Um, we, we do have some opportunities to uh, to gather some additional obligation limitation to use more of those funds. Uh, there's a process called August redistribution where the FHWA redirects obligation authority out of accounts that aren't going to use them up. And states will put in their plans and request additional obligation authority. And then um, <clears throat> the Federal Highway Administration will see who has projects ready to go. You have to have the funds, of course. And NDOT has been very successful in getting quite a bit of that August redistribution extra obligation limitation to be able to make the best use of our funds possible. And if you look at that chart, last year we received 46.8 million additional obligation limitation. So while it's, it's very late in the year, we can't put out new projects, it allows us to fund those projects that are ready to go. And so we, we typically plan to have extra projects or, or hope to have extra funding that we're able to use that we that extra federal money in it. Uh, we also have the capability of applying for discretionary grants. And we recently, uh, in 2020, we got a 9.8 million bridge program grant. We're excited about that one. And a 50 million infra grant. And so that has also helped us to bring in additional federal aid. Uh, I believe that's my last slide. I, I tried to try to complete this in about 15 minutes, so it looks like I've done it. I don't know if anyone has any questions, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Gleason. Um, Brad Pro with BCNR, um, and I was watching online this morning, so I've been uh, aware of the discussion today. Um, is there a, a step in that 
federal funding process um, slide you had up that where the, where the state has a role in approving the NDOT spending plan or is there are there, are there state level hurdles that you have to go through as well to get school spend? Uh, well, yes. Um, there's several hurdles. One is we have to have the budget authority through the legislature overall. And so federal, federal and state, it goes through the legislature. Uh, second is we have a state transportation board that meets every month and they approve our agreements over 300,000 and our contracts over 5 million uh, for construction. Anything below that is an informational item. It also has to be in our statewide transportation improvement plan uh, and the regional tips. And is that, is it, so that, that helps answer my question. And then I guess, is that process working or is it more of a burden in Nevada than say in other states to go through that? Or are we on equal footing in terms of, of having those processes? I'm I, I'm guessing we're on equal footing. I don't I don't know if it's on or do you want to yeah. add anything to that? <coughs> I can add to that a little bit. I think it depends. Some states have a harder time. Some states have an easier time. There's one or two states that doesn't have a transportation board uh, and has a lot of flexibility from the legislature. There are a number of states where the legislature approves their specific program, like every single project. So in a lot of ways, we have it a lot easier than some states, a little bit harder than others. I would say we're, we're probably... We probably have more flexibility than the average other state DOT, but pretty close. Yeah, I'm as excited as anyone else is about this federal funding coming in. It's huge, but sometimes Nevada is not well equipped to get money on the ground quickly or smartly. And um, just want to make sure that, that we're doing that. I think NDOT probably has a little bit easier time than some of the other agencies do. Um, but that, that begs the question of us keeping up with you. Um, so just want to put that out there. Okay, do we have any other questions? Let's just Alicia. 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 I'm having a hard time talking after lunch. Do the math. I'm sorry. I'm on the math. Um, why? I have a question, and you may have covered this on this, but what are last day funds? So last day funds are exactly what they sound like. On the very last day of the federal fiscal year, any obligation limitation from anywhere uh, used to be scraped up and there were <laughs> there was a, a fabulous person at the FHWA that worked, worked for our Nevada office that knew how to get his hands on those funds and if we were sitting there at our computer the very last day of the federal fiscal year we were able to put them in a project and it was approved unfortunately if you go back to the the chart uh, that was something that hasn't been done in years anymore, and it's not due to a lack of capabilities from our FHWA office. It's just something that uh, was no longer done anymore. Thank you. Other questions? I do. Uh, Carlos Gomez, I think Chamber of Commerce. Felicia, how the state of us, different agencies, how we can push to get more, more federal funding? How we can advocate for more funding for the state? Because if we are looking for the future, we need a lot of money for the whole state. <laughs> but how we can push to be not a low state getting funding from the federal highway administration, but more? How? That's a good question. Uh, a majority of the funding is appropriated by formula, and so as well as the obligation limitation, and so. We would have to get the federal government to change their formula. Uh, we can also apply for grants, which we which we do do. Um, I know our director has a wonderful re relationship with Ashto and and other agencies like that, and that's the American Association of State and Highway Transportation officials, and they do keep tabs on what's going on in Washington. And sometimes we'll write letters to suge make suggestions about you know, our funding needs. Um, we're open to all kinds of ideas <laughs> that anyone might have. Uh, one thing that we try to do is always have extra projects ready to go on the shelf so that if we are successful in getting additional funding, uh, we, can, we can make it happen. 
I, can I just jump in there? Um, and you guys get to hear a lot from me here in a minute. But um, when it comes to the formula, a lot of other states have looked at the formula and wondered whether it's time to reset the formula because it's not been reset in a really long time. Uh, Texas in particular did an analysis of the formula by how the funding gets distributed. And they came up with some formulas. They didn't come up, they didn't do an exhaustive, but they came up with some. And in almost all of the cases they came up with, and this is important because it's where it gets political, in almost all of the cases that they came up with, um, which of course they're going to look at ones where Texas would do better than Texas is doing now, um, Nevada loses. And so when you start thinking about the politics of how, how a formula reset would look, we're actually doing pretty good in Nevada and we stand to lose more than we likely stand to gain. So I think it's important that, as Felicia mentioned, we apply for as much discretionary money as we can get and we do what we can locally to leverage our money. And for instance, the August redistribution, we do fantastic on that relative to other states. And then the other thing to remember is um, we, um, our reimbursement rate is far better than almost all of the rest of the states in the nation because so much of Nevada land is federal land. We actually are reimbursed at 95.5 for most of our capital programs. The rest of the states aren't, don't get that same level of reimbursement. So we, are, we stand in pretty good ground. Could we possibly get more federal funding? Definitely, the more we apply for discretionary grants, yes. Is there a scenario where a, a, a formula rewrite would work? I'm sure there are those scenarios. It's just would we politically, we have enough political weight in, in D.C. to get Nevada to the place where we're winning when we're competing against much larger states who have far more uh, significant, far larger federal delegations. So it, it's a really good question and it's something I think we would all love to see. It's just the political um, hurdle to get over that is. That's that's the totally point. But uh, remember, the 20, year, uh, 20 years ago, we were less than a million citizens in South Carolina. We are over two million and a half and growing and growing. Looks like a, we are part of California right now. So <laughs> my point is, you see the traffic out there. You see, uh, I remember the Spaghetti Bowl, we were supposed to solve the traffic. Now, yeah, neon okay. project come out, and you can see the neon project is full. So, we need to figure out the ways to get more money to solve the problems for some and not in the Yeah. Question: uh, Not to get too uh, Jay's farmer, you may be not to get too deep into the weeds, but is, is the formula based upon uh, metropolitan areas? Uh, um, you know, I. <clears throat> I don't have all of the things of the formula in my head. It is population. It is lane miles. Okay. Um, I feel like there's two or three other criteria in there. It was actually frozen, I believe, at MAP 21. So it was frozen in 2012 back to what it was in 2002. So when you start looking at it, our lane mileage on a statewide basis is um, lower than a lot of other states. Like if you drive through the Midwest, they're like crisscross by roads. And right. we, because of our federal land, we don't have a lot of lane miles. Right. Right. Our population has grown proportionately, right. but not necessarily in total numbers. Other states' total numbers population may have grown more, even though proportionately they didn't. Yeah. And so when you start getting into the intricacies, I am sure there is a formula where Nevada wins, but if we do that, you also have to have the formula where those states that have larger delegations also win. It starts to become a, a bit of a, and uh, I worked in DC for three years and we had lots of conversations about this and pretty much no one on the Hill wants to open the formula. So that's just another, it's the political background mm -hmm. of it. Um, there's, there's challenges. If you base it on lane miles, then, and it's no longer based on any of that anymore. They froze it. So whatever anybody got at the beginning, I think of safety loo, what their percentages were, is what they get now. So it's not even based on those old schools anymore. It's just the percentage. If Nevada got two and a half percent, Nevada gets two and a half percent today. So um, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really that's helpful. A, that's a good question and um, something to I'm 
we're, we're moving along quite pretty much on schedule. So unless there are more questions, um, then maybe we'll move on to our next presentation, which is me, which is you. So now I'm <laughs> presentation funding challenges for the state managed system. So we can hear more about this now from uh, Director Swallow. Yeah, so I am going to, um, I have a lot. I'm going to try and go fast. I'm going to also try not to repeat too much what you've already heard from the four MPOs. I do want to just touch on two things, though, and just say I appreciate how much everybody, all the MPOs, and I mean, they are transit delivered. They deliver the transit. We do not. You heard Felicia say we have a role in providing funding for rural transit, but we don't do urban transit. We recognize that the critical nature of urban transit and solving our funding solution. Um, I truly believe transit is, is the public utility. It's as critical and important as police and fire and parks. And it's something that our communities as a whole should support because it is the most efficient and effective way to move people. The more people you have on a bus, the less cars you have on a road. It's, it's very cost effective. The more robust your urban transit system is, the more people will get on the bus. You know, if you have headways of five minutes, it's a lot easier than if it's a 15 minute. So strong believer in transit, you're probably gonna hear about that from me throughout this whole process um, and probably even a little bit more on this. That maintenance piece, um, Dave Swallow mentioned the $800 million in their program on maintenance. Every new lane mile of road that, you put, that we put down has an annual maintenance liability of roughly twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Sometimes it's less. Like the the road right in front of your house doesn't have as much volume, so it's a little bit less. I fifteen that lane miles costs a little bit more to maintain, but it's an annual maintenance liability of about twenty thousand um, dollars. We don't have to spend it every year on that road, but it's like your roof, right, or an oil change in your car. You have to periodically invest, and it's about twenty thousand. So. Something to think about when we're thinking about long-term sustainability of the highway fund and that growth. Um, Kathleen, you mentioned that growth and how do we how do we keep doing it if we keep adding new mileage? So I'm going to give you a little background about NDOT to start with, um, because funding our program is the main part of our of our charge here, and so you need to know who we are. So our um, we're responsible for the planning, construction, operation, and maintenance of nearly 14,000 lane miles in the state, 86% of which are rural, and 1,200 bridges. We have construction, pre-construction, administrative personnel, maintenance folks, and um, there's about a total about 1,800 team members that are responsible for delivering this program. We also are multimodal. Um, you've heard of that term a few times today. Uh, not only is it bike, ped, um, and bus, but also we oversee our general aviation airports and make sure that they are up to snuff and help with the pass through of funding for them. Next slide. So a little bit about Nevada and population. You know we are the seventh biggest state. I talked briefly about how so much of our state is federal, which helps us with our federal funding, which is fantastic. And over time, we're growing. We all know this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Well, our roadway network, our roadway network is about 13% of all roads in the state. So we have the minority of the roads. Um, the MPOs that you've talked to, they're engaged with a good number. The rural counties, though, have the majority. And um, we have that minority, but 70% of all truck traffic is on our roads and 50% of all vehicle traffic. So you think about how you got here today. Almost all of you got on one of our roads. Um, Yep, yeah, you can't get almost anywhere without getting on an NDOT road. So we carry the road, the traffic for the whole state. This is how we're distributed. All those little yellow dots that you can barely see on that screen, those are maintenance stations throughout the entire state. In some cases, we actually have residential housing for some of our team members because they are located so remotely, they, there is no housing available for them. Um, and we need to make sure that they're within appropriate driving distance to respond to what they're responding to. And when I talk about what they're responding to, yeah, there's crashes. Our team is often the first responders on a crash. Uh, uh, last year, we had our largest earthquake in 60 years. We had significant landslides the last two years. Wildfires, floods, there's a gamut. We're responding to them, and we need to make sure we have team members that are local and can readily respond and make sure those roads are safe for everybody to drive on. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about our funding a little bit more. Felicia gave the broad federal framework for it. You can see on the left, that's the overall highway fund. 
Um, these are 2019 numbers because 2020 wasn't very typical. It was the start of the pandemic. 2021 was more of the pandemic. I was going to say the rest, but <laughs> it was just more. So um, these are 2019 numbers. They're more typical of what you would see in a year. Roughly our revenue in 2019 was 1150 Of that state user revenue, was just shy of $600 million. What's important to note is the majority of the revenue is a user fee of some sort, whether it's a driver's license fee, an operation license, a registration fee. It is some sort of a fee that may or may not be closely linked to your use of the system. So you may have a driver's license because you know you need one for the periodic time when you might rent a car. So you have to pay into the system. But you're not necessarily paying until you drive a car and pay for some gas. But even that gas is not directly linked to your use of the system because if you um, drive a 93 Ford Bronco, which we I have in our household, it's not as fuel efficient as someone who drives a 2005 Honda Civic. So we're charging different amounts in the user fee to use the system. And obviously, the EVs, as we brought up, aren't paying anything to use the system. So um, just a little bit, you can, by and large, it's user fee funded. That federal aid, as Felicia showed us, is a gas tax, but it's not entirely a gas tax. They started to throw other money in there, um, so it's not entirely gas tax. Um, I should note, oh, there's a little gray blue or a little blue sliver on the right, which breaks out the state user revenue. A little blue sliver, it shows $10 million for FRI2. That was as of 2019. For those of you keeping track here in Clark County, um, through 10 months of 2021, so I think through March of 2021, we've now collected almost $40 million in FRI revenue, fuel revenue indexing revenue here in Clark County. All right, so how do we spend that money? Um, you heard, uh, you, you guys, we met Julie Butler earlier from DMV. She gets some of that um, billion dollars that's collected at DMV, NHP, at DPS, Department of Public Services. They get some as well. And that maintains the lion's share of the of the revenue on approximately $900 million on an annual basis. And then we spend it on the next slide across the state. You sh uh, this is the 2011 to 2020 actual expenditures across the state, with 56% of those going into Clark, 16% in Washoe, and the rest of the county is at 28%. Now remember, 86% of our roads are rural. So this is, a, this is a challenge. It's something that we balance every day when we're delivering our program. How do, we, how do we balance where the revenue is generated versus where the needs are? Um, some of this also we have to think about, a lot of that revenue that we're spending in rural is spending on just pure maintenance, making sure that we're keeping those roads functional, open so people can travel across the state versus in Washoe and Clark, and um, in some of our more developed communities where we're having to build new interchanges. So that balance between new growth and maintenance is a challenge that we face every single day. We've been spending the money over the last few years. You can see the actual expenditures go up and down over time, and this has to do with, um, as Felicia mentioned, our obligation limit. We're allowed to obligate a certain amount every year but that doesn't necessarily align always with our with our spending curve so when we uh, decided to build an obligated for project neon it took us several years to spend all the project neon money so that's why the curves go up and down but overall and over time 78 percent of our revenue and spending goes towards construction and engineering 16 percent towards maintenance operations and equipment making sure for those up north that we have the snow plows ready to keep those roads open Although we've had some plowing needs lately in Southern Nevada too. So um, making sure that we have the equipment and the people ready to respond to the events when we have them. And so that's a little bit about our revenue. And I know I went through really fast. And I, 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 don't, I think I said, we're gonna share all this with you after the fact so you have it, you can really deep dive into it. So let's talk about some of our challenges. So vehicle miles traveled over time have, uh, over the past a decade, has increased by 30%, and we're anticipating that increase to trend to continue. The increase in vehicle miles traveled is largely due to population growth. Obviously, you have more people, they're driving more. 
but it's also linked to how we built our network, where the people are living. And we had um, Paulinos mentioned earlier about the people who are living in remote areas of northern Washoe. We also have that here in southern Nevada and the proposed developments north of Powell Canyon and south um, Clark. So there's that. But then there's also this other, when our roads are functioning well, people drive more. So there's also that. And that's just being fully honest. If you live in LA, you're not going to go visit your friend five miles away because it's going to take you two hours. Here, a five mile drive is not a big deal. So we do, and it's just something to be aware of, we do drive more when the system is working well. Our VMT is outpacing, as we'll see on the next slide, our population growth. Because our system in Nevada works generally well, people are driving more. It's not just a population growth effect. It's also a sprawl effect. It's also a functioning effect. I use the example of um, when I'm up north in Carson, uh, I live in Reno because uh, 580 is so beautiful and awesome. I just get on that 580 and I can get straight to work. But if I still had to drive all 395, I might have made a different decision. So things to think about. The more we grow the system, the more maintenance liability we take on, but also the more the needs grow with us. I should also note that this VMT per capita growth is further complicated by actually the pandemic. The pandemic, I don't think it changed our shopping habits. Our shopping habits were already changing, but it certainly accelerated our online shopping habits. Our ability to just have more stuff delivered, it accelerated that. It made it a lot easier because all of a sudden we didn't want to go. So that I anticipate we'll see is going to change. That was already happening, but it accelerated that part. So just something to be aware of an outcome of the pandemic. What do you attribute the drop from 2016 to 2017 to under your last slide? You know, I, I don't know, and I haven't dug into that. I think, Sandra, do you, have you dug in at all? Sandra Rosenberg is our assistant director of planning, and she's also our my alternate if I'm ever not able to be here. Sandra, do you know of that 2016? Uh, I do not know, but we can look into that, maybe report back. So let's go back to revenue and look and the demand. Uh, the top orange line is VMT growth. The bottom blue line before it grades, so even the very bottom blue line, is actually the highway fund revenue. The left of the chart is 2008, the right is 2018. And you can see that um, revenue it fell dramatically um, during the recession. But VMT didn't. People kept driving. Even though the revenue fell, people kept driving um, and continued to drive. And you can see that gap gets wider and wider. So on the far right, it's, it's the widest. In the intervening years there in 2016, the legislature provided us additional revenue from the GST, which is a vehicle tax. So it's a user fee, but not necessarily related to use of the system. So they did help plug that hole a little bit, um, but it's not a long-term fix, and it certainly doesn't address the fact that cars are becoming far more fuel efficient. And I'm, I'm looking, and I see Marie, Marie gave me a look. She's like, how did revenue go down? The miles <laughs> went up because they're still buying gas, but they're not buying as much gas because cars are becoming more fuel efficient. And EVs are a threat. But right now, they're mostly just a threat. There aren't that many EVs on the road, but there are a lot of hybrid vehicles and just far more fuel efficient vehicles. If you bought a car in 1990, it is nowhere near as fuel efficient as it is today. So that gap we expect to continue because VMT is continuing to grow. Cars are continuing to become more fuel efficient, whether they're EV or otherwise, we expect that gap to grow. We have, um, next slide please. So um, in the brief, background you saw that Christina this is Craig Medol with AGC I just had a question on your last slide where you showed that GST revenue were all of those years that GST revenue were accessed by the highway fund or were those years the GST went to the general fund I think that this chart actually reflects the GST that we received um, the additional GST that we received uh, Felicia can you answer that uh, yes, we started receiving GST into the highway fund in 2017, and we received 50% of 
of the allocation for the new GST. Then in 2018, it went up to 75% to the highway fund. In 2021, we, we took a break and the money was given to the general fund to help short problems in the general fund. And now we're back on track in 22 and 23 to collect that 75% again. Thank you. Thanks, Felicia. Sure. All right. Sorry, uh, how much money was diverted uh, to the general fund from the GST? In uh, during the pandemic, yeah. in the last legislative session, Felicia? I was around, oh, I'm going off of memory now because I have a shit that says zero, but I, we'll say it was around 64, 65 million dollars was projected. Um. And, and again, just to be clear, when Felicia said that and that question partial asked, that was a decision that was made by the legislature last summer as a and in response to the, the economic realities that the state was facing with the COVID pandemic. And and um, that is the I, I'm going to get there, like not this slide, but the next slide. Um, so actually, let's go to that for a second. Our funding source is constitutionally protected. And so I want to make sure I stop on this slide and and, and have everybody understand how truly critical this constitutional protection is. It enabled our program is a long term program like the MCOs, um, and we all rely on the ability to be able to project the revenue that we're going to have, which we can do because it's constitutionally protected. This helps us with our bond rating. We have an extraordinarily strong bond rating and we're able to bond against this revenue because it is constitutionally protected. Um, I just a couple things on this slide before I go back and then go back forward again is um, it that constitutional protection isn't just for gas tax it's for any sort of a user fee so that's something as we start diving into solutions we need to be thinking about and the way it's written it's exclusively for the construction maintenance and repair of the public highways of the state um, limits our ability to be a truly multimodal organization um, so Right now, there isn't enough money to pull out for transit, so I wouldn't say so we can't spend it on transit, but we also don't have enough to spend on transit. But it also makes it difficult for us to um, do bike facilities or do sidewalks, and, and we do that to the furthest extent that we can, but we do have some constitutional limitations. So just wanted to stop on this slide. Now we'll go back. <clears throat> the GST is one of the resources because it's not a user fee directly. It's a tax on your car, that it has been considered a little more flexible and that's why they were able to do that. Um, we were prepared for that in, in conversations with um, the legislators and the governor's office, budget office while they were doing that. So <laughs> full transparency, because I know that that was a hard, the hard decisions were made last year. So as mentioned in the briefing book, we estimate over $500 million in annual unfunded needs for our state transportation projects and programs. And that's that's primarily the actual investment need. It doesn't include any projections of increased salaries. It doesn't include the consulting teams necessary to deliver that program. When you combine the, the two of them, you're actually looking at almost uh, the same as our capital program annually. So, I mean, it is a significant shortfall. It does include things like um, increasing the amount of uh, revenue we invest in pay pavement preservation. It includes all of the, maybe not all, but a significant amount of the additional needs for new interchanges and new growth to the extent that we can do that. It does include, um, it does include our salt and sand sheds across the state. So it includes a lot of different things in our actual facilities needs. Um, so it is broad based and it is essentially equivalent to our, um, to our capital program. But in addition to the needs that we've already talked about with growth in BMT and population growth, Alicia mentioned construction cost um, increases, 96%. Um, should, uh, the highway revenue is continuing, um, it's going up, but it's not keeping pace. We saw that on the previous graph. And then the increasing um, use of uh, fuel efficient vehicles. All right, so we don't have enough money. <laughs> we don't have enough money. So that really means that we have to focus on achieving the goals determined by the state, statewide, the goals in a data driven process. And so um, we did mention briefly uh, we are governed by a board in response to um, 
a broad poll question. We do have a board of directors that is led by the governor. Um, it has, so it's the governor, the chair, the lieutenant governor, the controller, and then we have four members at large that are appointed by the governor that are um, members of our community. Virginia is one of those board members from the um, south, and they annually approve our program. And it's based on the One Nevada Transportation Plan, which was a broad statewide program that was completed in 2018, where across the state we came up with the six goals that we as a state agree with. We base it on that. We're also working on really making sure that the data is driving our decision making when we do this. So I'm moving forward. Um, we set our goals and objectives. Those goals, there's six goals, I'll go into them on the next slide, but um, we set our goals. We assess our needs related to those goals and the priorities. We develop our strategies, prioritize the projects, harmonize the projects. I want to stop and talk about harmonization. We talked a little bit about that 86% are rural, but you know, 75% of the population is here in Southern Nevada. How do we balance that? So when we're harmonizing, we're looking at um, the readiness of the projects. We are looking at a little bit of that geographic distribution. Um, and we're looking at, you know, what are the overall performance objectives and how can we achieve those? If we can't do them all, what can we do? So we balance that. And so that's the harmonization. Then when we get done with the project, we deliver the project, we get done with it, we see whether or not it works. I'll give a good example. Sometimes we have to adjust. Uh, HOV lanes, when we opened them, they weren't working quite the way we wanted to. Um, so we created some new access points to them to help them work better. So sometimes we can deliver instantly a change. Sometimes it takes a couple of years to see whether or not the safety improvement we installed was significant enough or if we need to do something more. And then we start the process over. So what are those six goals? Those six goals are here on the screen. Um, preservation, safety, connecting communities, sustainability, transforming economies, and optimizing mobility. They are the same six goals that I think everybody would agree, yeah, that's what a transportation system should do. We assigned weightings to them. It's hard to say, like, preserve safety is your number one goal, but then do you give it 75% or 22%? How do you do that when you have five, four, five other goals to weigh? This is what we've done. We continue to adjust these. We continue to adjust the criteria that feeds into them. So in this past year, we added some more refined criteria around equity and specifically also around greenhouse gas reduction. That is a goal. Um, that is something that we play a role in. So we're we're adjusting these criteria. And I, I'm stopping and talking about this a little bit because in the briefing book, for all of the agencies, you saw capital needs, you saw maintenance operation needs, you saw active transportation needs, you saw these different needs. As we work through these and achieve the goals of the state, it, we may find that we may need to spend more on active transportation than on one of the other buckets. It doesn't change our unmet needs our unmet need is still the same. You know, over time, we may not need to spend as much on, on new capital as much as we'll have to spend it on operations and maintenance. So just something to think about as we're working through this, the unmet need is, is still the same. And if we continue to build new roads, it will grow because of that maintenance liability. And there's a little bit more on the harmonization there on this slide too. All right, so I think Felicia talked about future infrastructure funding a little bit. Federal government, they're getting ready. We're so excited for them to get a new bill across the finish line, and we're really hopeful that they will. It will have a good bump in it. Um, right now, we're anticipating it'll be about a 25% increase in our federal proportion, which our federal proportion is 300 million. Out of that 1 billion, it's 300 million. So 25% is sizable. And then they will have some additional programs in there where we may get additional money, such as the bridge program that they're creating, a resiliency program that they're creating. We're excited about that. If any of you were here in Southern Nevada, uh, I think it was about four or five years ago when we lost the bridge on I-15 due to Moapa flooding. Um, we, it's far more expensive to replace infrastructure than it is to build it resiliently in the first place. I'm not saying it wasn't built resiliently in the first place. You can't predict everything that's going to happen. But to the extent that we can, we want to make sure we're investing in resilient infrastructure. And then another thing that we're excited about in this bill is um, the EV infrastructure piece. Um, they are, um, the administration and Congress are really looking at how they can help advance state investment into EV infrastructure. So excited about that is the new program. Um, to Brad's point, each of our agencies have a little bit different level of flexibility and to the extent that we can be that partner in helping deliver 
our infrastructure, we're going to do that to make sure that we can spend that federal money as fast as possible. Some other solutions that um, aren't explicit in there, but we do work on in case you guys are interested. I-11 and I-15 are things that we're having conversations with Arizona and California all the time about. Those are complicated because the needs are actually in other states. And so how do we make sure that the funding gets it, that they prioritize um, those needs? So, all right, our role in greenhouse gas emission um, across the nation and in Nevada as well, transportation is the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So when our state takes up a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it is going to fall into the transportation space. Now, does that fall on NDOT? Yes and no. Um, the emissions happen from our cars. <laughs> so um, I can't change the cars that you guys choose to drive. But that creates a challenge for NDOT. EVs are a critical and important piece of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. But the higher the rate of adoption of fuel efficient vehicles in general and EVs, the less revenue we will have to provide a roadway network for them to drive on. The other piece of it is the lot, you know, if you've heard anything about, you know, Las Vegas has been the fastest heating city in the in the nation uh, our, our temperatures have risen the fastest in the nation over the past 30 years and that may have to do with greenhouse gas emissions but that's largely because of development it's rooftops it's parking lots it's roads if we continue to build the same way we have built to accommodate the same type of driving but just an electric car we will still have that same problem we will still continue to have warming in our communities because of the urban heat island effect that more roads more pavement more parking lots so just something to think about we are actively thinking about that's why you hear me talking not just about evs and ev infrastructure i talk about that because it's important and it's critical and it's going <clears> to <throat> devastate our revenue but i also talk about transit and i talk about how we grow and where the affordable housing is like all of that is part of this challenge that we face for a sustainable transportation fund. And so um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversations we're going to be having because these are they're all interlinked and they're critically important. And so my last slide, and then I'm happy to answer um, any questions, is you know, we've seen during this pandemic how critically important it is that our roadway network works. Um, it, whether it was it was all the good, the toilet paper at the beginning, but everything, you know, making sure that people could get to where they were going, making sure that the goods got to where they're going. We've also seen the impact when we've had fires and when we've had earthquakes on a breakdown in that connectivity. We, as our committee, we're, we have a huge task ahead of us to really address that long-term funding solution. And I think one of the key words in there, and I think the legislators are very deliberate about this, was sustainable. If we're going to take up and ask our legislators to make hard decisions about how to address the funding, remember I said our shortfall is the equivalent of our capital program, which is essentially doubling our state and federal fuel taxes. If we're going to ask them, and even if that's not the way we do it, even if we figure out another way, if we are going to ask them to help us raise revenue, we need to make sure that we're thinking about this whole them, and they're not going to want to do it again. So that's sustainable is not just sustainable for the climate, it's sustainable for us. It needs to support our roadway network for decades to come. So it's a huge challenge that we have. And, you know, I mentioned it's the greenhouse gas is all connected. At NDOT, we truly believe in our role as environmental stewards. And I had somebody ask me about that recently, and I'm like, it's so connected. And, and um, Julie knows like how much work they've already done up in the Tahoe Basin. And we've been partners in really trying to reduce our impact on the Tahoe Basin from sediment, et cetera. So we truly believe in that. And I think the as I just as I continue to think about what we want as our goal outside of those six goals, but it's linked into those six goals, is we want a system that's safe for every single person who gets onto the system. We want, you know, whether they're on a bike, whether they're on a car, whether they're walking, whether they're on a bus, we want a system that's safe for everybody. We want it to be reliable. I can't fix congestion. I just, I can't. I can do something about it. I can try. I can make it reliable. But, you know, I, 
and, and we can make it safe so that you don't have that unreliable because of crashes. But at some point in time, I can only widen our roads so much. So we're using technology to help with that reliability in Southern Nevada. The ATM signs help with that reliability. So I want our system to be reliable so that if you get into your car today or if you get onto the bus tomorrow, you know that you're going to be at your destination at the same time every time. We want it to be safe and want it reliable and we want it to be sustainable. Um, we can't afford to ask our legislators again in two to ten years to look at our revenue. They're, they're going to look at us and say, why didn't you fix it the first time? <laughs> We can't afford to continue um, to have the climate impacts that we're seeing today. And we can't afford to have the social impacts that we're having on our various communities across our, our cities. And so I want our system to be safe, reliable, and sustainable. And, and I think all of that is baked into the challenge we face as a committee. So I, I didn't say it before, but I, I think I have to say it, and you're going to hear me also. Just like transit drum that I'm beating on, <laughs> you're going to also hear me say thank you, because I know we're asking a lot of you to give your time for the next you know, year plus, because I don't know if we said it at the beginning, but we're going to ask for you to help <laughs> during the legislative session. <laughs> we're going to need your help during, throughout. Like This isn't a just, oh, here's your report. So um, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Christina, so first of all, a great report, um, but I really appreciate the fact you talked about equity because that that's a key piece of, um, it has to remain part of the criteria that we use. Whatever funding model we determine uh, should be studied. I think that's a, that's really, really important that we keep that in mind. And, and I think it's important, and we're going to dive in, uh, Virginia and I, and Jeff has been talking about, like, we need to tell you guys what's to come in these next couple months. But we're going to dive into the equity of the funding model. And a lot of times we think about, you mentioned sales tax isn't always equitable and can be very regressive. Mm -hmm. The fuel tax is also not equitable. Very much so, so the system right. we have today has its own That's equity sure. challenges, yeah. which is part of why we're having this conversation. Right. So, yeah. Other questions for because um, I'm not quite sure how this all kind of ties in together. Could you go back to the con to the uh, to the slide with the content of, from the Constitution? Oh, the Constitution. Yeah. Okay. So, is it is it possible that since Nevada is a majority uh, federal land, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible the reason why we can't tap into that fund is because th that federal fund of money is because Nevada benefits from being a majority federal land? Oh no, so this is our state constitution. Yeah. This is our state constitution. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. So there's no there's no intersection between the two at all. There's no influence at all. No, okay. and, and, and the reason why that, that actually was established in, in 1930, and it's common across most of the states, um, which was in the briefing book, most of the states have some sort of protection for the money, and, it, and it's really to, to say, hey, if you're paying a gas, if you're paying to a tax, you, that tax is going to go back to investing in the facility that you use. So it's like, a, it's like paying your water bill or your power bill, only it's kind of buried into the gas bill overall, right? Does that make sense? So yeah, that's, it that's what it is. But you're paying into it. It is one of the reasons why um, we're challenged there is um, to be transparent. There's a lot of people out there who think that if you're paying a gas tax, it really should be, like ours is written, for the road. It shouldn't be allowed to go towards transit because the transit riders should pay their full freight. Transit is a different beast. Mm -hmm. Transit is like police and fire. Like it is something, the more people I get on transit, the less roads I need to build, which is more sustainable and it's more fuel efficient and effect, or more cost effective mm -hmm. and efficient. But that's why that protection exists. There are other ways to fund transit and we're gonna have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Like you, may, you don't necessarily need to change this um, to solve that. Um, there are other things that we can talk about and have conversations around, so. Okay, on this on the same topic, Carlos Gomez, Latin Chamber, on the same topic, you view, let's say, 
speaking, a special lane for uh, major transportation, let's say a train, subway, or a special lane for buses so they can go from point A to point B, a special lane, so it's part of the, your funding. But now another entity or agency can do this station where the people can, okay? That is one way that we've done it, is we've built the, the roadway, the pavement, the asphalt, so we don't build any of the, the I but I can't build the rail. So if it was a subway or a light rail, I can't. <laughs> I can't, I can't pay for, for track. I can pay for asphalt, uh, but I can't pay for track. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, this form on UNLV. Um, so regarding this constitutional uh, provision, so it's not only said that, you know, the money can't be used for other things, but basically, I'm just, I didn't read it thoroughly, uh, I'm bad at that, but, <laughs> uh, but this is also mean that uh, the state just can't come in and cut funds, right? So basically it's like non-discretionary funding that you all are, are have. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like to me to kind of put you in sort of a, of a conundrum, because going back to Felicia's presentation, if I recall, she said that, you know, you all had to transfer money from the general fund, right, to subsidize yeah. some of your, your spending. Uh, is there a limit uh, on how much money can be used in the general fund to uh, offset uh, revenue shortages? So we receive, I think I understood the question. So we receive zero state general fund dollars. Okay. All right. There is no general fund that goes into our state transfer. Okay, so I misunderstood. No, federally, okay. federally, they have been for years finding ways. When I said it's mostly fuel tax, it's mostly fuel tax. But there's lots of other things that they're putting in there because they haven't adjusted that fuel tax, and the fuel tax isn't keeping up. Okay. So that so that's what makes their conversations federally equally hard. Um, yeah. But they have other sources. Here in Nevada, financially, we're so constrained that our, our legislators I mean, maybe they could, but they just don't have the resources to give us if we need mm -hmm. to help fill our gap. They just don't, um, and which is why they did take that one bit that is flexible. They took that last year. Gotcha. And um, and I, I, the decisions that had to be made, I can't even imagine. And we, um, we fully respected and understood it because um, everybody was taking cuts. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, but we received no general fund in the state okay. the portion. Christina, I'm glad this slide is up because I have a question about it too. So when it says the uh, any excise tax on gas or any other vehicle fuel, would, would is electricity a vehicle fuel? And would something that collects or measures vehicle miles traveled or collect some kind of a tax on other energy sources for vehicles be allowed without a constitutional amendment? I think we're going to dig into that in the future meetings and really try to understand where those limits are and, and why and those interpretations are. So, so we'll wait, I'll wait for yeah. that then. Um, and I want to point out to um, Jeff in the has put together in this um, the operating procedures and ground rules some of these other issues that you might want to talk about today that are coming up later. Um, he's got a process here for coming back and checking in on some of those issues. And I think you have a name for it, Jeff. Mm -hmm. if, if you'd like me to describe what we're doing over here, uh, every time you bring up one of these topics that we need to go back and uh, either research or we have a kind of plan to come back to, we refer to it sometimes as a parking lot. I think we may have called it something else there. So I'm keeping a long list. And then after our meeting adjourns today, uh, myself and the rest of the project team, we meet and we make sure that we captured everything that we heard that you want us to look at, even if it wasn't within the scope of today's meeting, and then we'll come back to you on that. And this topic of what constitutes a motor vehicle fuel is one of them. So thank you. I think you've called this an issues register here, though. That's so right. if, you don't, if you don't answer your question today, um, please know that um, Jeff and his team are taking uh, note of those issues and that we'll have an opportunity to circle back on those questions. So again, um, we want you to ask as many questions as you have, and we may not be able to answer today, but we won't lose track of it. So uh, any questions in Northern Nevada for Christina? Yeah, this is Brad Kroll with the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, 
First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very helpful. Some of the data I was looking at just quickly as you went through increases in uh, vehicle registration over the last decade, increase in Nevada driver's license, and then obviously the big increase in VMTs. Um, I leaned over to my friend Paulinos to ask if that if the VMT increase includes uh, interstate commercial trucking, and, and his inclination was that it did. So I guess my question is, does it capture um, uh, visitor miles traveled from passenger vehicles? Yeah, so that that's all vehicle miles travel on our roads. We have count stations throughout the state um, where we track and estimate based on um, those stations what the total VMT is across the state. So it includes all um, it. The DMV doesn't actually have a way of like comprising and they aren't measuring across the whole state of comprising all the act, our passenger vehicles or the vehicles that are registered. So it's actually all the on road miles based on count stations, not based on registration data that's submitted. If that makes sense. Is it by class or by weight, or is it just? I think we, I think we can break it out by class and by weight. Um, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Other questions for Christina before we take a short break? I have one more question. Uh, Kathleen Taylor, regarding the Constitution's line, so the last time it was re revised or amended it was in 1939. So in 2021 is it a possibility that as a result of what we come up with is it possible that there can be an, 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 an amendment to the state constitution as it relates to the allocation of funding it is possible okay. um, there was actually a, a bill draft and i think actually a bill that um came out on the floor in this last session taking up the constitution is really hard it requires, I think, two um, passages, two subsequent biennia exact language. So nothing can change in those two. And then it still has to go to the public for a majority or two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, two -thirds, to, the two -thirds to the right. So it's and and everybody has to agree on it. And so I, I think that the critical piece of this is if our recommendations require it, it, it'll be because we had a really broad based conversation with all the stakeholders at the table and we will all have all agreed on the safest way to do that. It's very risky to do it because this is how we bond. This is how we long term plan and whenever you similar to the formula fund, but any any legislation, whenever you try to change something, you open the door to all kinds of other changes. And so it's just something that if we want, if that ends up being the recommendation, that that is one of the examples of why our tenure as this committee doesn't stop in December of next year. If our recommendation comes to the legislators and we say you need to open the Constitution and these are the words, we won't just have to support the effort this session. We'll have to support it the next session and we'll have to support it at the ballot. So um, these are they're hard conversations, but yes, it can be opened. It's just hard. So the reason why I was asking that, because in reference to, to change, changes evolution, changes, you know, transformation. Um, and in order for, for us to evolve beyond what we've, we've been doing for years now, to, and, and in order to, to go to, to the next level and to sustain at least Nevada and the transportation side, then some type of change must occur even if it's short term that will drive long term. So one of the examples of a risk is that if you change the words to say um, public highways of the state and transit operations, but you don't actually come in with the additional revenue to support the transit operations, our bond rating may go down because the bond agencies may look at that and say, are you really going to have that revenue available to build your roads? because you can come this transit operation. So they have to go, if we make a change here, it really does have to go hand in hand mm -hmm. with increased revenue to accommodate whatever that change is. I understand. Thank you. Other questions for Christina? Christina? Yeah, I have um, I, I was supposed to talk. Can we just get everybody to sign in? Just a reminder, if you haven't signed in up north, sign in. <laughs> okay, we have another question in Northern Nevada. Uh, yes, Bill Thomas from RTC Washoe. I think there may be value to having some kind of uh, handout or some basic information so we're all in the same place about the difference between taxes and fees and charges. 
because they all have different rules and processes and actually a lot of case law about how they can and can't be used. So it would seem to me that would be helpful for, so we're all talking the same thing when we interchangeably talk about revenue sources to understand they're not necessarily the same thing. Just wrote that down. I'm not going to call it a parcel lot anymore. I'm calling it an electric bike rack. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe you just call it the bike rack, not the parking lot. So he put it down on the bike rack. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That's a, that's a good point. We should have some understanding of the terms that we're talking about. And to that point, though, Marie Steele with ND Energy, because I know that's what we talked about in the interim, you know, looking at that change to the constitutional language mm -hmm. and then also talking about why, you know, maybe additional background for everybody who wasn't a part of oh, the interim last yeah. time. Because um, that's where I was like, like, yeah, that did, you know, <laughs> that it might be helpful to just have that conversation of what happened to that bill and why it turned into this and, you know, the change in the language and that, that risk analysis of why we didn't move forward with it would probably be good okay. for everybody. Other questions? Okay, let's get back together then at uh, 25 after. 25 after. Thank you. Okay. I was staring at the language and I was like, we changed that. Yeah. I swear we, did. we changed that. Yeah. It just didn't get anywhere. All right. I because get it. I didn't I, have the money I, to go with the language change. Like, I could totally get like, why, but yeah. I was just like, it's like, what did you end up talking with this? <laughs> right. <laughs> It is. It's like, yeah. 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 Yeah.
the piece, the parking, the number that they they built around the stadium, that's not a long number. But when you look at the rest of the ecosystem, the building ecosystem, we could have everyone take When I left the strip, is when they built the team over, I was done. I was like, Nope. No. I just dropped my daughter in Chicago uh, uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. And that's the first time she'd be on the bus. She's like, yeah. We got the L. We got the like, A. There's just, yeah. But she's never been on. Okay. She's like, this is great. Reliable. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, before we get started, I want to um, let you all know that um, the Nevada Taxpayers Association, uh, Cindy Creighton and Barry Duncan, who I believe is with you up north, have offered to donate a copy of their tax facts. This is a really handy little book that goes into everything you ever wanted to know about every tax in the entire state and some local taxes. So it's everything from property taxes to transient lodging taxes to fuel taxes to Excellent. That answers all yeah. those questions about taxes, fees. Uh, it, it's a great reference. Uh, Barry has them, I believe, for you up in the north today. Cindy will bring them to those of us in Southern Nevada at your next meeting. So um, thank you, uh, thank Sarah, you. And Cindy, and the Nevada Taxpayers Association. Yeah, that question that came up about could we get a description of taxes and fees, and I thought, I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> This is everything you ever wanted to know about taxes. It's a great reference. Madam Chair, just on speak on taxes, your question earlier about fuel taxes, do we do we get taxed on fuel taxes? Uh, we do not. We don't pay the main federal, state, or local taxes on. We pay a, little, a small fee on just on diesel. It's an yeah. FYI. I would think there was yeah. an exclusion for you. Yeah. Maybe school districts too or something. So, yeah. Um, thank you, MJ. Uh, the next section of the agenda is the adopted statewide policies, energy policy, carbon emissions, and reductions from the transportation sector. And before we begin that segment, I've asked Jeff Doyle with the consulting team to provide a very quick high-level overview of the types of action states can take related to the environment. So, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to admit, we uh, put this together, the next slide, uh, before we had seen everyone's presentations. And uh, the purpose of this slide was to make sure that everyone understood the difference between, particularly as we start talking about policies, um, a, a law and an executive order and regulations and policies, uh, because oftentimes we get questions um, from our clients and, and others about, well, I heard, for example, um, the state of Washington has outlawed gas burning vehicles by 2030. And so we have to go back and explain, um, you know, what those boundaries are between uh, a policy or, in some cases, an executive order. Some things can be done by executive order or a law. And I was thinking that, oh, we're going to probably want to have these distinctions before we begin the presentations uh, from the energy and environmental sectors. But their, their presentations already uh, make it very clear, as you'll see in a moment, uh, which, what are the adopted laws versus policies and what's under, uh, for example, governor's executive order. So just very uh, quickly here, uh, law obviously has to be enacted by statute, uh, legislative body um, at the state level typically, but it could also be by city councils and an ordinance. And uh, only if you have a law, only that legislative body can change it, either uh, through uh, amendments or they can repeal it. Uh, there's one possible exception having to do with it. It's an unconstitutional law then the courts can overturn it. But laws are obviously um, the gold standard for trying to um, uh, implement a policy. One step down, perhaps, is an executive order, and that can only be implemented unilaterally, but only um, by the chief executive of the government. So in Nevada, that's the governor. At the national level, you've probably heard about presidential executive orders. Uh, but the limitations on those is that um, they can only really affect the law within the executive branch, things that the executive branch can do. And furthermore, and this is where the real debate comes in, uh, probably nationally you've caught this, there's disputes about what the proper role of the executive is versus the legislative branch. So those are uh, sometimes subject to disputes, but they are considered um, 
uh, laws, at least as it relates to the executive agencies. There's also regulations, which are uh, typically agency rulemaking that is um, in furtherance of a law or potentially an executive order. So if you had a law that said um, the state of Wisconsin um, is no longer going to sell a gas vehicle and it was a law, then there might have to be some regulations on how to implement that. So the agency could only implement uh, law, uh, regulations that are consistent with the underlying law. And then we step down to policies and goals, which are um, policies are operating procedures for within a particular agency or perhaps even a branch of government. Um, those are self-imposed uh, and they only govern the conduct of the agency. They don't really have any um, authority over individuals except for how you interact with those people. So if the DMV had a policy of we, we don't we don't process uh, driver's licenses on the second Tuesday of the month, that's a policy that they have and it does affect people, but um, uh, it has to be within the scope of their authority. And then goals are just that. They're, uh, you can think of them as performance measures or benchmarks. They're um, designed to guide long-term actions, and you can think of them as uh, governmental efforts at planning for the future. Um, however, they don't have the same legal basis uh, as the others uh, to compel action. So that's my disclaimer, and uh, we can turn to the presentations now. Thanks, Jeff. Um, with that, we're going to move directly to the presentations from our directors of energy and of conservation natural resources. Uh, Mr. Crowell, are you ready to begin? Thank you, Jeff, for that, that opening. Again, I'm Brad Crowell. I'm the director of the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and I'm going to be joining this presentation by um, my colleague and administrator of the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, Greg Lovato, uh, and also um, uh, our director of the Governor's Office of Energy, uh, Mr. David Bodzian. So I'm going to uh, start by giving a, an overview of where uh, Nevada has started and is going on uh, climate change under this current administration and how it relates to the transportation sector in these discussions. And then my colleagues will get into a bit it a bit further uh, with, on some specific actions and activities uh, being taken now or looked at uh, down the road. Uh, I will say to, to on just presentation about laws, regulations, etc. I think that was very helpful for this as a stage set for this conversation. Uh, with, with regard to regulations promulgated by state agencies, it's important to note though that Nevada, the final step is approval by the Legislative Commission, which is a group of uh, state legislators. So it's uh, always, a, always a, an important step that can be a high hurdle at times um, for uh, uh, agencies uh, promulgating regulations. Next slide. So in you know, since the beginning of Governor Sisolak's administration, he's been very uh, straightforward about the need to address climate change. Uh, the science is not up for debate. How we address it is what is going to define uh, our actions and our legacy going forward. One of his initial uh, 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 things he did to, to show his, his support for, for addressing climate change is to have Nevada join the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a, a collection of approximately 25 states um, whose uh, governors and therefore executive branch agencies have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, consistent with what's called for uh, by the Paris Climate Accords in the international community. Um, not, not easy uh, uh, goals to meet, but ones that are necessary to be met. Next slide, please. A few highlights of legislative things that I'm not going to get into too much, but that have uh, defined our actions uh, with regard to carbon emissions uh, uh, over the last few years. In the 2019 legislative session, two notable bills were passed. One was an increase in the Renewable portfolio standard for electricity generation. Another uh, was uh, setting uh, economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction targets or goals um, to be, which are consistent with not only the Paris Accords but also what the uh, governor agreed to as, as when having Nevada join the U.S. Climate Alliance. Um, it also, smaller um, but important element of it is it requires an annual update. By NDP of the um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions database um, in Nevada, so that we can track our our our, our progress and uh, the sectors that need less work. And then 
most recently in the uh, this year's legislative session, SP 448, which is a major uh, bill that will define transport uh, electric, electric transmission uh, investments as well as uh, EV infrastructure. And I'm certain my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Bobson, is going to get into that during his portion of the presentation. Next slide, please. So as uh, as we move forward on, on addressing climate change in Nevada, one of the governor's next steps after joining the Climate Alliance and getting through the 2019 session was to issue uh, a climate change executive order, which outlines uh, 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 is a roadmap and an outline for how Nevada will uh, coordinate and address uh, climate change across Nevada uh, and all the um, uh, sectors that emit carbon. So that's if folks haven't seen that it's 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 worth a read and sets the Department of Conservation Natural Resources and the Governor's Office of Energy to co-lead totally that effort. And we uh, work on a regular basis with our other colleagues in the cabinet, uh, very regularly with Director Swallow, uh, in fact, uh, on coordinating these efforts. But it's a um, it's a stepping it's a stepping stone to Nevada being able to set uh, larger policies. With that in mind, the big um, deliverable uh, from the executive order was the creation of a strategic um, climate strategy for Nevada that was specific to Nevada's challenges and opportunities. In the um, in the climate space, on both uh, reducing emissions, sequestering emissions, uh, transforming uh, our economy to be more uh, clean energy friendly and reliant. So, the, the we were able to pull off uh, putting this climate strategy together in a very short amount of time, even under the COVID context. And uh, it's a it's it's an online based uh, platform that I encourage you all to look at, but. The, the idea here is that it sets the framework for uh, to select policies that make sense for Nevada and then how to implement them while also uh, outlining the challenges in terms of uh, either funding, legal um, or other challenges to implement into certain policy, including technology readiness so that we can be smart with respect to where Nevada is now, what should come in the near term, medium term and long term uh, in terms of addressing our uh, statewide carbon emissions. Next slide, please. The um, <clears throat> so I, I kind of just talked about this. This is the overarching goal of the climate strategy, and I won't rehearse it. But it, the strategy then set the next stage for us uh, in addressing climate change in Nevada and organize ourselves in establishing the Nevada Climate Initiative. Um, and when we redo this presentation, we'll put um, uh, web addresses associated with all these things up here for everyone's access. Uh, later, but the Nevada Climate Initiative is kind of the clearinghouse for all the things, all the activities which we're taking to address climate change. Uh, uh, many of which will be talked about uh, when my colleagues speak next. But it is uh, a, a place where the public can go and and see what Nevada is doing, provide input, uh, get resources. You can see data, um, etc. So it's. Uh, it's a real valuable resource for any and all um, folks in, in Nevada who are doing anything uh, to address climate change from reducing emissions from electricity generation to land use planning, etc. Next slide. So this Nevada Climate Initiative, as I mentioned, um, was launched just last August, which feels like a really long time ago at this point. Uh, it does all the things I just described. I'm sorry, I'm talking a little bit fast because we have a lot on our um, our presentation today. But the uh, climate initiative is is, is is all the things enumerated on the slide there and uh, is uh, is also a place where you can get input. And as I said, um, provide input as well. Next slide. So here's the nut of our challenge in Nevada. Um, this is our most recent greenhouse gas inventory. You're going to see this slide probably a couple times before we're done talking. And what I want folks to notice on here um, and has been said before is that um, transportation emissions are uh, the largest share of our greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, more so than electricity generation, and they're the ones that are increasing most rapidly. So that's why um, transportation is the, the key, uh, one of the keys and the, the biggest key of those for Nevada in addressing um, carbon emissions. Um, the electricity sector is going down, is on a good trajectory pathway given the RPS. But transportation and um, uh, some other areas, including you know efficiency, residential, commercial, land use planning, and industrial emissions, um, 
are either flat or steadily, steadily on the rise. So we've got work to do in many sectors. Um, just so I get this out of the way, um, land use and land use change, which is, uh, you know, agriculture and, and forestry and things of that nature, not a big source of emissions in Nevada. So it's not a place we're going anytime in the near future in terms of any sort of regulatory frameworks at all. That being said, uh, wildfire, uh, can't ignore it. We see it, we breathe it, and uh, it is uh, it is overwhelming a lot of the actions we're taking on climate change. So managing our land is important is an important part of this equation as well. Next slide. So these are some of the transportation specific things that we're doing in the um, in the in the climate space in uh, meeting the objectives of the executive order. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, as you can see on here. Uh, uh, spending money from the BW settlement, um, uh, uh, working with with NDOT on the transportation and and uh, the Nevada Clean Cars Initiative, which Mr. Lovato will talk about next. Um, but these are we hope to have a much we hope that instead of just one slide, we have many slides on the things we're doing in Nevada that are transportation related um, that help help achieve our climate goals. Um, yeah. This Sorry. is Craig Madol yeah. from AGC. Uh, I just noticed that you know it looks like everything you're doing is the surface-based transportation. What what energy are you guys putting into? Because obviously, air travel, aircraft, that's all part of the transportation sector, sector, and a pretty large contributor. What's being done as far as those? So on, on air missions, it's a little bit complicated. You can put it into two buckets: planes flying and then the ground operations. We can't really do anything about the planes flying but we are helping some of the airlines electrify their ground equipment because that ground level it's mostly ozone not all carbon not all ghg uh, emission, uh pollution but um you know ground level ozone and things like that so we're helping some of those airlines electrify their ground transportation operations um and next slide please i think that's the last one i have um so I'm happy to answer questions on my portion if it's helpful before we go into the next segments. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Administrator Lovato. Hey, Brad, real quick, I think it would just kind of help. And I mean, this report that I read as soon as it came out, if you could just talk about some of the metrics that you guys use, you have four different keys that you use to analyze all of these different proposals going forward. Um, Happy to. Is there a specific one that you have well, in mind? I mean, so I mean, you're looking at you're looking at feasibility. You're looking at what it does to the economy. You are looking at the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and then you also have climate a justice. Um, climate justice mm -hmm. component as well. So, so, so some of these metrics are easier to define than others, and it will be a challenge and a balance to to make sure we're meeting all of them. But you know, like like on technology readiness, you know, we want to choose policies that we can actually implement that will uh, help us get to the emissions reductions we need on the timeline we need. Um, so that has to be thought of when, when implementing policy, uh, making sure there's equity is a, is, a, is a difficult but very necessary challenge. And, um, you know, quite honestly, until recently, I would have had a, a little bit harder time answering this, but now the federal government is actually uh, pushing some, some frameworks for how to achieve our environmental justice and equity goals and um, we hope to be able to, you know, either steal from or mirror those as appropriate in Nevada. Um, but uh, but it's important. And you know, Director Swallow talked earlier about you know the urban heat island in, in Las Vegas, and sprawl is a big part of that. Well, it's particularly sprawl without any corresponding uh, transit options or tree cover or climate-friendly um, infrastructure. And so you know, making sprawl go away immediately is pretty impossible. Doing smart sprawl so to speak, if that's not an oxymoron, um, is the way that we should be approaching this from a, from a Nevada perspective if we're going to be serious about our climate goals. Bill? Um, maybe everybody else knows this. I remember VW got trouble for something. Is that money? When you say VW settlement, is there some money yeah, or something? Yeah. Yep. Okay. How much is it? And what can Greg, what do we get? So, hi, Greg Lovato with NDEP. So the allocation to Nevada from the VW settlement was about $25 million, and uh, we are we've been going through some competitive uh, grant uh, cycles over the past few years since 2018. We're entering a new one uh, in October this year, 
and we have about 10.2 million left to allocate. Um, some of the major projects Brad talked about were electrification of ground support equipment at the airports. Some of those are on hold because of pandemic economic slowdowns because companion electric infrastructure was the responsibility of the airline, whereas we were replacing mobile equipment because we were trying to reduce uh, nitrogen oxide emissions. So um, that's underway and we can share more information about that as we enter our next funding cycle. And a, and a slug of it goes to, to GOE for EV infrastructure. Right. Big yeah, just to the extent, you know, as regional or as a partner in transportation, it's a resource that can help with it. You know, but if it's, you know, you guys already got it figured out. No, we do have, like I said, a uh, grant proposal cycle coming up um, starting, I think it's maybe late September or October. We're going to be doing some webinars on how to apply and all that kind of stuff. So definitely stay tuned in. I'll follow up. Okay. And it, right, this is the last year, right? Because it was a three year three-year pot of money? No, so there is, uh, once you allocate the money in a project, you have five years to spend it. Okay. We have up to 10 years from when it was granted to hand the money out, but we can apply for extra time if we need it. So, um, you know, I think when we first started out, um, we did two cycles real quickly in 2018 and 2019. Um, and now we paused for a bit uh, letting see how the success is going and and now we're ready for another funding cycle so we probably have at least two more I would say other questions for Brad Jace Jace for our UNLV um, is, is any of this money uh, passed down to the counties and cities or is this strictly state money you have any money? Yes. It's it, it's a competitive grant process, so yeah, anyone could apply, including okay. localities. Yeah. Gotcha. So this, this is just not a state grant. What is the money that, that anyone can get, and it goes to yeah. Okay. In this case, it was a settlement that resulted in the state receiving money that we're granting out to um, eligible uh, entities. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Brad, Kathleen Taylor. Uh, I was just wondering, um, looking at uh, similarities with uh, the climate with uh, between Nevada and potentially Arizona, as an example, are there any uh, like best practices that maybe we can learn from uh, that uh, Arizona has uh, has you know put in place to address any of their emissions with uh, emissions challenges in their state, given that. We, people tend to be have a similar climate as that state. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, this is one of the benefits of being a member of the US Climate Alliance is we get to learn and share the best practices amongst 25 different states. And the subset of states that are in the Western US that have similar, uh, you know, uh, ge geographic makeups and population makeup as us. Um, uh, including New Mexico uh, and Colorado, uh, we we do use those best practices, and um, uh, that's the best way to do it, rather than recreating the wheel. Um, but what I'm always wary of is a, you know, a, a pushing a policy nationwide that doesn't work in Nevada, you know, the way that folks want it. So, like, whatever solutions we come up with uh, to address climate change, I think need to be Nevada specific. Um, so that they meet our needs, they match where we are, and um, are best for our, our populace and our next generations. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Mr. Bob Seed, are you ready to begin your presentation? I think uh, Administrator Lovato has the next uh, portion of this, which is a briefing on uh, clean cars and other end-up uh, efforts, and then I'll uh, kind of come up with a caboose with um, EV infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, Greg Lovato with uh, Nevada Division of Environmental Protection. Um, to partially answer uh, why light-duty vehicles first and, and Craig's question earlier about um, you know, how we're prioritizing these things. Uh, with the transportation sector being the bulk of greenhouse gas emissions, 
really rank light duty vehicles up with 60 percent of those transportation emissions and heavy duty vehicles maybe 20 30 percent and so you're really handling the bulk of uh, emissions from the transportation sector by addressing uh, surface transportation first. Um, this effort we started last June. Uh, we've had a number of uh, partners in this. Most importantly, Department of Motor Vehicles is our main partner. We've also had a lot of assistance from uh, uh, the non-governmental organizations, uh, the national and the local, as well as um, the car manufacturers and uh, auto dealers. And so uh, even though it's taken us quite a while since last June, uh, we're ready to take the next step here and, and put these into practice pretty soon, uh, provided we get approvals. So next slide, please. So it is a, it is a complex picture of um, regulations across the country right now. Um, as many of you may know, uh, the option for uh, adopting light duty vehicle standards is that you not have a third car. Uh, and so you either have a federal fleet or a uh, California style fleet. And so um, looking at, you know, across the uh, country right now, most recently Minnesota has adopted uh, the zero emission vehicle standards. And you can see there that uh, New Mexico and Virginia are also looking to adopt them as well as Nevada. So there's two things that to, to keep in mind here. Um, not only do you need to follow one of those two standards, um, you also uh, need to have a waiver in place from the federal government, and that's from EPA. And so there was a waiver granted in 2013 to California that was uh, withdrawn in 2019. The current administration, starting in April, is looking at re-granting that waiver. And so our rulemaking is contingent on that uh, waiver being put back in place. The current administration is working on putting that waiver back in place. There's also future prospective rulemakings that will be overlaid. And so um, I'll give you some more context in a, in a little bit, but some of the future rulemakings that are, are being contemplated are new vehicle sales of 70% uh, zero emission in 2030 in California and 100% by 2035. And just recently, the Biden administration is targeting 50% of new vehicle sales by 2030 and 70 percent uh, in, in the future. And so you're 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 seeing you know, uh, more and more emphasis on moving to zero emission vehicles. And I think what we're doing now is just, I think, getting Nevada ready for these uh, ramp ups. Um, we'll go ahead. Next slide, please. So what type of vehicles are we talking about? This is for model year 2025 starting sales and calendar year 2024. These are uh, fleet wide requirements and uh, the requirement is, is, is on the manufacturer, but obviously uh, the cooperation and facilitation by the auto dealers is part of the picture to ensure full compliance. So when we talk about light duty vehicles, it's up to and including full size trucks. Um, it's not uh, just, you know, sedans. And so um, these uh, are increasing requirements over time. Uh, and you reach a certain uh, percentage target by model year 2025. As you see there, we're not looking at this time for this particular rulemaking at heavy duty trucks. One other thing that important to add is Nevada actually has kind of a head start. Um, the sales of electrics in, in Nevada actually, uh, and zero emission vehicles in general compare favorably, um, even to states that already have requirements in place. Um, and so we are getting somewhat of a head start uh, here in Nevada, a little bit of a tailwind. Next slide. So this is uh, meant to you know, impress you about how many emission reductions we expect to get over the next several years. But you'll notice um, on the slide that Brad had, he had million metric tons per year. On the y-axis, I have metric tons per year. So when we look at you know, 2 million light duty vehicles in Nevada, and we're selling about 120,000 per year. That's about 6% sold each year. And then our requirement is between 3 and 9% of those new vehicle sales. We're really affecting less than 1% of what's actually driving around every day with these regulations, despite all the effort we're putting into them. And so 
put another way, you know, we're looking at between 2025 and then, you know, and in, into the future, you know, we're looking at reducing uh, between 20,000 and 60,000 metric tons by 2030. Yet our goals are actually 1.8 million metric tons by 2025 and 8.9 million metric tons by 2030. So this doesn't look all that impressive. It just tells us that we have a lot more work to do um, and we just, you know, we need to start now or yesterday. Next slide. So, you know, we're, we realize we're not doing this in a vacuum. Um, you know, these we're focusing here on emissions reductions and air quality, which are clearly concerns for um, Clark County, which is in marginal attainment for uh, marginal non-attainment for ozone. And, and it's being threatened both in, in Washoe and uh, Carson City areas. But, you know, the, the considerations of costs and also, you know, accessibility of ele electrical vehicle infrastructure, affordability, electric vehicles are also concerns. So there's parallel efforts happening um, in other parts of the climate strategy. Uh, MV Energy is tackling some of these issues, infrastructure issues that Director Bobbigan is going to talk about. Um, I mean, the value proposition is over a period of time, right? And so uh, even though it's not explicitly considered in our rulemaking, uh, there is a, a long-term value proposition for the state and for consumers uh, to be able to move to zero emission electric vehicles. Next slide. So here's what's coming next. Um, we've gone through a lot of informal um, workshops and discussions. There's uh, a formal State Environmental Commission hearing happening in September. We are uh, targeting legislative commission sometime in 2021 to allow to apply to the model year I talked about earlier. And um, more information can be obtained uh, at, the at the links there. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh. Questions. Um, so this is Bill Thomas from RTC Washoe. Well, has there been any analysis either at the state level or national level of the hybrid as the transition? Because like you said, Greg, well, we looked at Washoe County and it's like a fraction of 1% of the vehicles today are electric. So we have a huge way to go to get to this. Has anybody analyzed accelerating by having more hybrids in order to get more, you know, uh, a low emission as opposed to a zero emission and how that would trade off to having a real aggressive move towards totally zero emission. Yeah, good good question, Bill. So the way the rule works is it, it doesn't actually mandate a certain percentage sales of zero emission vehicles. It actually mandates a credit requirement, a percentage requirement, which can be achieved through a combination of different types of vehicles. So more credit is granted for zero emission vehicles than for, you know, hybrids, but they also count towards achievement of the lower emission goal. So it's, it's, that's a little bit of, you know, the market, the consumer um, having flexibility, but the baseline requirement of what's uh, termed ultimately a 22% credit amounts to about a 9% eight or nine percent sales requirement of zero emission vehicles with the rest uh, being made up by a combination of other types. So, Marie Steele with NV Energy. Um, so the announcement of the federal administration with their sales goals Kind of going to your point, if that was an executive order, does this does that impact Nevada's regulation efforts at all, or are they completely separate? Not yet. Um, it could uh, affect um, Nevada in the future. I think um, I'm not sure. I know that we have to adopt regulations two years ahead of when, and I don't understand the math, but to get it to affect calendar year 2024, we have to adopt the reg by the end of this year. Okay. So the manufacturers and everyone else has time for supply chain and, and and so that's what the law requires. So I'm not sure if the federal government's gonna be able to 
get something going to affect model year 2025? Maybe, I don't know, but uh, so I guess it's to be determined. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, Marie, this is Brad. I'd, I'd also say that I think the, the bigger action at the federal level that impacts us uh, in the near term is uh, reinstituting the waiver for California, because that's what's critical for us to be able to follow along. Okay. Uh, and so uh, as, as long as that's in place, uh, we are able to get this new program going, even if it takes longer for the federal government to impose a new national standard that's as strong or stronger than at some point. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you. I have one more question, Bill Thomas, RTC Washington. So um, what you said, Greg, this kind of foundational thing in, in this whole dialogue we're going to be going into is you were talking about um, millions of times. About hundreds of millions of times. They're both Greg slides, but yes. Okay, so, okay, so here's my question. So is there's there, is there either just is there either discreetly or implied what we're trying to do that fuel taxes are used as a uh, method to accelerate or influence an outcome? In other words, either pricing, <clears throat> use of the money, is that is that going to be or has that explicitly been discussed as a way to try to get more people to move to electric? It hasn't been it, it hasn't been explicitly discussed in that way, but is it a potential tool to achieve? Sure. And if that's a discussion that's uh, consensus says we should have, then it's one we should have. Is that us that's gonna No, I think I think this is David Botson, Governor's Office of Energy. I think very candidly, in terms of the any adjustments to dual tax regime inducing behavior that assists with um, the climate goals has not expressly been discussed. That has not been discussed. The flip side of that coin, I do think, is a concern, and we'll and we'll bring it here. Is that and I'll get into this. I think a little bit more in my piece is that recognizing there is such a ramp up ahead of us. News today about the infrastructure package, um, its passage, a 7.5 billion dollar investment in EV infrastructure knowing that there are just so many of these streams of money that are headed our way, whatever conversation we have here, whatever outcomes we have here, we need to be cognizant of that context lest we find ourselves out of alignment with the most optimal way to make sure that that money is spent in Nevada for Nevada's benefit. So I think that's that's probably the, the, the point that we would want to stress in terms of the tax conversation. So you're scooping my final point well, my the, my but I, right I, yeah. I assume, David, you weren't going to be talking about cars, so that was my mistake. But no, 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 no it's, it's, it's all cars all the time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and trucks. And trucks. Light duty. Light duty. Light duty. That's right. Any other questions on this topic? That is something I think we're going to Jeff was taking a lot of notes, something we're going to have to revisit and have a better understanding so we can kind of feel how fast it is coming at us with electric vehicle. And any other questions before we move on to Mr. Bazian? Everyone that's here, and I, we have a few more slides, but I will not dwell on them for too long so we can just get right to any um, additional discussion. But uh, David Bobsian, Governor's Office of Energy. Uh, my role in this is just to kind of talk about the significance of Nevada's uh, investment in the infrastructure and a little bit of a preview of what's to come. We can go right to the next slide. You've already seen um, the inventory piece of this. This is just a reminder of um, the governor's uh, climate executive order. Uh, Director Cole talked about this at the outset about the work that was directed uh, to the administration that we completed sort of the initial rounds on uh, during uh, the outset of the pandemic. And that was the creation of the strategy in response to this executive order. But you can see in this order that uh, it specifically calls that uh, transportation uh, electrification uh, as uh, an area of, of, of work. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the Nevada Electric Highway was actually born out of the prior administration uh, in large part uh, supercharged by the Volkswagen settlement. And what began sort of as a, a, a tourism economic uh, development opportunity imperative uh, has since uh, under the Sisolak administration uh, taken more of a, a, a climate 
um, uh, imperative uh, to the work, and that is the development of charging infrastructure across uh, five of Nevada's major highways. Um, phase one was really designed to connect Reno and Los Angeles on US 95 with five different sites. Uh, the sites are free uh, for use, free to use for the first five years. Uh, phase two was that broader expansion with uh, the assistance of BW, and that was really focused on I-15, US 93, US 50, I-80. Uh, we also have some additional sites on US 95 with that. And of course, we partner with uh, MB Energy, uh, Rural Electric Co-ops, uh, site hosts, uh, as well as uh, NDOT has been uh, very uh, helpful in this endeavor as well. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, we've, uh, right before the start of the pandemic, uh, we had our last ribbon cutting uh, down in Mesquite. Uh, and with two um, stations that we're uh, we are now uh, able to put up those signs uh, with FHWA's blessing that uh, the Nevada portion of I-15 is an alternative fuels corridor uh, for EVs. We go to the next slide. We are also part of a larger uh, regional collaboration called Rev West. Um, this is states, uh, eight signatories. Uh, you can see them listed there. Uh, so you can you know, look at that list of states. You can imagine that there are a variety of perspectives on uh, climate and the reason for support for transportation electrification really is a mix of uh, tourism opportunity, economic development opportunity, and, and, and climate perspectives. But there's a lot of coordination in the community of practice from amongst the Western states uh, on uh, EV charging when it comes to corridors. Go to the next slide. Nice photo of uh, Western governors uh, assembled in Las Vegas soon after they had upped, re-upped uh, the MOU uh, in uh, December of 2019. So we've got some extended commitment at this point um, to Rev West. So if you go to the next slide, um, here's just a, a slide to give you a sense of the scale here to four of the investment that has happened with phase one, phase two, uh, and you can see phase two is still in progress. Uh, we've got a, a number of sites that were kind of coming down the home stretch uh, in partnership with MB Energy uh, for completion. If we go to the next slide. Uh, and this is the big, this is the big piece that I want folks to, to remember it is that number one, uh, the, the big omnibus energy bill, um, SB 448, uh, you have uh, one uh, important uh, bill sponsor in the room with you in Las Vegas. And I'm sure she'll correct me if I get any of this wrong, uh, but it covered a lot of different topics, but I'm, I'm going to look specifically at the charging infrastructure piece that uh, MV Energy is directed to come up with a transportation electrification plan uh, with a spend of up, up to $100 million in EV charging infrastructure. Now, uh, this won't be the be all and end all, but the first plan uh, needs to be filed by September 1. Steele, uh, she can also correct me if I get any of this wrong. I may put her on the spot and invite her to, uh, at, a, at a later meeting, uh, give an update or provide some more uh, perspective on, on how this is going to go. But we're very appreciative uh, at the administration. Uh, we have a number of departments that have been meeting with uh, Marie and her team to, to talk about their planning as they um, move forward with September 1 planning date. But I think the important thing that the legislature did here was not only did they uh, identify a number of buckets, uh, interstate corridor charging, urban charging, public efficiency charging, uh, which we think is going to be very helpful uh, in our uh, fleet electrification efforts, as well as providing value to the public, as well as transit, school bus charging, and, outdoor recre and an outdoor recreation programming. In addition to putting out those buckets, there was also the establishment of a minimum of 40% of the total expenditures must be dedicated to investments in or benefiting historically underserved uh, communities. So low uh, LMI communities, uh, there's a lot of um, mapping that's happening. And I know that MB Energy is spending a lot of time in being very targeted in their um, investment plans such that the benefits are, are really um, uh, accrued to uh, frontline communities uh, in, in Nevada. So that is a, a big step forward for us. It will represent a big step forward um, for EV charging infrastructure in the state, but that is a drop in the bucket compared to what just passed the Senate, which is a $7.5 billion nationwide investment in charging infrastructure. Um, we are already, I think, at the administration, well, we're, we're, we're all tracking all of the infrastructure um, streams that are headed our way to make sure that we're doing our best um, to receive them and put them to work. But specific to the transportation pieces, 
for instance, there's an additional $300 million that I, um, I know Director Swallow is looking at as well, that is specifically designed for state energy offices to coordinate with um, state transportation departments to make sure that these funds are guided and targeted appropriately. So there's multi layers to all of this. We've been in regular contact with um, our, our senators and their offices to make sure that as this thing has moved forward, uh, we, we know it's going to um, work very well in Nevada. Um, there has also been mentioned, of course, uh, I think Marie brought it up about the federal target that was um, announced uh, last week of 50% uh, of EV sales uh, by 2030. So that's another piece of this that's coming. I also this afternoon read a story that there's a group of House Democrats that are calling this $7.5 billion number far too short. And they're uh, looking to up that uh, tenfold uh, in all of the conversations that they're having around reconciliation. Now that's a group, you know, it's a minority group of Democrats, but just to show you um, just where the winds are blowing uh, kind of in Washington as it comes to this spend. So um, that last slide really just to end on and, and, and Bill kind of scooped me, um, but I think what we're trying to impart uh, to the group here is that there is a lot to come. Uh, we have a long way to go when it comes to transportation electrification, but that is clearly uh, a strategy that is uh, really taking a, a, a national uh, prominence at this point. And uh, we need to make sure that whatever decisions we make are sensitive to that context and with an eye toward optimizing whatever potential support is coming from uh, the federal government to Nevada to go to work uh, for Nevada. So final slide, uh, we'll just end with uh, our contact information and uh, invite any questions. <clears throat> any questions for the chair? OK, uh, MJ Mano, RTC, Southern Nevada. So I noted uh, that the electric highway will that for the first five years, there's no charge. The question is, after that, is it going to how is that pricing structure? And I ask that because it's a, a, something that we'll be working closely with MV Energy, but as we transition <laughs> uh, to uh, better electric vehicles, we know it's, we're going to pay more. We're going to pay more than we do right now for compressed natural gas. We're going to pay more than we do now for the, when we previously had diesel. So it's going to cost more for us to electrify our fleet, particularly depending on what time of day. So I'm curious to know if you have an electric vehicle and you need to fill up, is that similar that, that if you're driving a, a, a car and you're going to go to a gas station? I'm curious what that what that impact is to the public. Director, thanks for the question. Thanks for picking up on that breadcrumb in the slide deck. Because um, <laughs> it's, it's a fascinating topic and I could proceed uh, an entire afternoon um, for this group kind of exploring that um, we'd want to potentially um, hear from the Public Utilities Commission and the energy as well kind of on this topic. Phase one of the highway, uh, the commitment that host sites made was to say, look, just have it open, let people charge, don't worry about it, your uh, energy bill is not going to be impacted. We had one agreement with one particular site that had concerns that they'd be in incurring uh, excessive demand charges because of use of the site. We actually provided a backstop agreement whereby we would cover uh, and, and hold them harmless if they did um, in, incur any such demand charges. They have not, and I think they're three years into this at this point. With phase two, we left kind of a blank slate understanding that there was a lot of evolution that was going to happen in this space, that entrepreneurs are still trying to figure out what the appropriate models are for deploying the infrastructure for charging for the electricity use, and that consumers it's still kind of uh, up in the air as to how it's going to go. And I think um, Administrator Lovato might want to weigh in on this as well. Hi, Greg Lovato. So um, we didn't do any independent research, but we surveyed the literature and relative to other states, uh, gasoline more expensive, electricity cheaper in Nevada. And so uh, what we saw was um, actually, uh, you know, all things being equal with respect to how things are sold and how they're bought there is uh, likely going to be a cost savings for uh, consumers based on that differential in Nevada compared to you know, many other states. Obviously, that certain things have to hold true, but as it stands now, we saw 
fueling electric vehicles over time cheaper than fueling gas vehicles because of that. And I would say back to the, the business model for hosting these sites, uh, and I will just offer anecdotally, uh, what we have found is that the advantages that accrue to the host sites, uh, it's more from selling chips and high fructose corn syrup uh, carbonated drinks while a vehicle is plugged in than necessarily, necessarily selling um, the electricity. Now, that said, um, again, I think there's a long way to go in the models for how um, you uh, interact in a business environment with uh, a, a, a charging EV. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely something for us to explore further when it comes to uh, electricity, uh, prices for electricity in, in Nevada, which are incredibly competitive compared to many other surrounding states. Um, but it's certainly, I think, uh, something that this group should, should spend some time looking at. Thank you. Other questions? One last one. Uh, Kathleen Taylor, yes, um, with the transition of fuel use, uh, gasoline fuel use vehicles to hybrids or electric vehicles, that's a lot of fuel used vehicles that's basically going to, they're basically going to be abandoned, so to speak. Is there a plan in place to address what is going to be, what is, how these vehicles are going to be recycled or going to be, you know, uh, properly disposed of? Because it, it would be quite tragic to, you know, to create a, a massive junk pile, so to speak, of these uh, vehicles that are no longer being used because of more advanced models. So uh, thanks, uh, Greg Lovato. I'll try to try to answer that question. I think we're we're not anticipating an increase in abandonment of vehicles because people are going to buy new vehicles at the rate they're going to buy them, regardless. But you do raise an important question about uh, sustainable materials management in general. I think that um, you know Nevada needs to start uh, having conversations about. Um, how we manage used materials um, going into the future. Um, actually, our team at NDEP is going to be engaging with a group of stakeholders uh, coming in the next several months to talk about what do, what are our goals for reuse of materials in Nevada and recycling? How much do we know? Are we counting the right things? Um, and so that's definitely another conversation we need to be having in parallel. Thank you. And I think just to round that out, um, I think I think the administrator is correct is that a lot of this anticipates just sort of the normal replacement cycles of existing um, internal combustion engine vehicles and their replacement with um, you know battery electrics. Uh, but again, I think from the economic development uh, and opportunity perspective, uh, as as Senator Brooks uh, is fond of saying, you know, and reminding people, Nevada is an auto manufacturing state. We manufacture battery electric vehicles, uh, but we're also seeing, and, and this is, um, you know, kudos to, to, to Greg's team and what he was just referring to, um, a lot of entrepreneurship around the total life cycle of, of lithium uh, in, in this state, including um, activity now in lithium recycling. Uh, we're seeing some startup activity there. So uh, there's, we, we see tremendous opportunity uh, in this in this space uh, economically for for Nevada. Thank you. Other questions? Bill Thomas, RTC Wash. I had a question for you, Greg. Have you guys have you figured out a way to compare a kilowatt hour of electricity to a gallon of gas? Like yes. so with the apple to apple. Yeah. Diesel diesel gallon equivalent. One kilowatt hour. Equal. Paulino, so sorry. Paulino, <laughs> <correct. laughs> diesel gallon equivalent, one gallon of diesel equals 40.3 kilowatt hours in terms of energy. So then my next question is, when you do the comparison of fuel costs to NB energy kilowatt hour costs, have you factored in the gas tax? Like you just look at like the, it may be 349 a gallon for gas and 14 yes. cents a kilowatt It's hour. about seven tenths of a cent. 
uh, interrupt you all for just a sec. I think we're getting a little ahead maybe of, uh, of where we're going with some of these presentations. It will definitely be a topic for the future. So, Bill, those are great questions. Um, and we will and probably appreciate you filling in the gap there with part of the answer. But um, we will be revisiting those issues. So, thank you for the questions. Are there any other for our last three presenters? Okay, we're going to now um, return to the agenda. So this is the time when we'll review and consider possible adoption of the description of the transportation revenue challenge for the AWG. And before we have that conversation, Jeff, I would like for you to kind of get us all a little refresh on the conversation we had uh, when we just when you laid out the challenge. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think almost everyone was at the very first uh, online meeting, and if you recall at the end, uh, what we tried to do is draft a statement, what we were calling it a transportation revenue challenge for this group, that um, was guided by and faithful to the enabling legislation, AB 413. So there were two slides that we used, and they're in front of you again today. On the left, you may remember, is an excerpt from AB 14, which is the pertinent part about what this group is supposed to be doing. The rest of AB 14 were mostly mechanics about you know, who's appointed and, and reimbursement procedures and so forth. So this is the pertinent part. And what we did at that meeting last time is uh, highlighted the essential elements of AB 413. And then we summarized them, moving over to the right box, in a way that we could construct uh, the transportation revenue challenge that you all have to wrestle with. So essential elements were over to the right, which brought us to this draft statement that is uh, now back in front of you again today uh, for your consideration and hopefully adoption. Uh, I, I might add here, if I'm, uh, Madam Chair, the intent of this, this is how it's going to be used. When we have the website as we do now, um, it's a public website. We want to be able to accurately describe what your work is um, to the public as there is potentially increased interest by the public in this topic or policymakers. Uh, the second purpose is it helps us as a group uh, make sure that we address all of those elements and that we don't get ex too excited and carried away into other possibilities that weren't within the original scope. So it's both a floor and a ceiling. Thank you, Jeff. Um, can everyone read this okay? Do we need to read it or do you want to take a minute and read it to see if we captured everything in the statement? Anybody have any questions about the statement? Or suggestions? <laughs> Uh, uh, Jerry, so, uh, so we, talk, we, keep, we talked quite a, a lot today about the fact that public transit has been part of the solution. Uh, I don't th know, I think maybe I need some clarification. It, when we're looking at sustainable funding, this is really related to um, the gas tax and, and the fact that that is not a sustainable funding source, not necessarily that any other modes of transportation will be part of the study in terms of identifying uh, some kind of funding solution, correct? I, that sounds a little bit out of the scope of okay, what the legislature it. intended, so okay. I don't know if uh, we have a sponsor here, or I don't know if Jeff or Christina, you want to respond to that, but it, we, we're going to stay pretty focused on... Yeah, I would always defer to the chair for the interpretation, but the first sentence was intended to capture that. Um, as far as we could go within the legislation. Okay. We have the chairman here. So, chairman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're not specifically calling out transit, but we are talking about the the, the broad transportation funding needs. Okay. Is that yeah. is that language on two A and four thirteen? Is that is that right out of the bill where it does mention yes. public transit users? Yeah. How do you map that? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to get back to the last yeah. slide. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't literally say, well, it does say public transit, but it also says drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists. So we have just interpreted that as 
all the needs of all users, all modes. There's a different way that you all would like to characterize that. It's consistent. You can do that. We go back to the other now. It does say meet the multimodal funding needs. So you're using the word multimodal to capture all users, all modes. So I think if we agree in this room that that includes transit, then we're okay. But then we need to remember that if we start talking more, you know, so we don't forget that piece. Or we can be more explicit. Well, when you walk over to Bud, though, it says sustainability is a safe highway fund, which does not include transit. Mm -hmm. Correct. It doesn't, but it could. So the concept that the state highway fund demand, the needs will continue to grow at a rate that makes sustainability unachievable unless you also find a solution to transit. But the solution to transit may not be within the highway fund. It may be something else. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to go that way, the nature of this conversation would be how do we fund the highway fund? And what else does the legislature need to consider with regards to transit funding? So it, it, it would be this and this, and then possibly, and what else does the legislature need to consider when it comes to land use? Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that. So I think this is Danielle Monroe Moreno, State Assembly. I think on the, the next screen, when you have everything put together, perhaps you need to add to include the things that came directly out of 413, so there's no question about what the multimodal needs. Multimodal funding needs as expressed in AB 413. Correct. That would be good. Okay, we have. Um, um, I thought I heard First sentence. Evolve to meet the multimodal funding needs as expressed in AB 413. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Because that will encompass yeah. everything that is specifically stated in 413. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't edit this on the screen, but I'm writing it down and I'll send it back out. And uh, this is Craig Madol of AGC. And I agree with everything Christina just said, but shouldn't that mean, though, that the line of an examination of the financial sustainability of the highway fund must be undertaken. Shouldn't that be the first sentence of this statement? Because really that is the purpose of this group. That's why we're here. All these other things affect that, but we're we're here to, to examine the financial sustainability of the highway fund. Are you suggesting then that we reverse the order of those two paragraphs to put the emphasis more on the second paragraph? Yes. Anybody have any concerns about, about doing that? This is uh, this is Doug Busselman from Nevada Farm Bureau. I would I would agree with that concept of putting the the first sentence of the second paragraph first. And I also think that the land use and smart growth should be incorporated into the uh, first paragraph from Sarah, and, and that would become the second sentence. In other words, you separated out the. Okay. Uh, you know what? We're going to whiteboard. Can I? Yeah. I, I do want to. This is going to be kind of our our overarching goal. So okay, we're going to we're going to try to type these changes in here and try to think with um, um, the chairwoman's recommendations. We do kind of capture what's in 413. So. Um, uh, no. pull this up so we can see these edits as we go and try to get this, try to capture yeah, everything. Yeah, I, I think you're still the other thing. One moment. Uh, okay. 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 Okay.
an examination of the financial. It's the first sentence of the second paragraph should be the first sentence of the whole thing. I think is where. Yeah, and I'm I'm good with that. But then you know the whole second piece of and provide a recommendation to the legislature based on the examination is totally missing in a, in either paragraph, and I think that's a crucial component of. We can we can study things all day long. I mean, we're at this point we're going to make a recommendation. So everyone's watching. I hope to see what's happening on the screen. Yeah, so we can I might introduce a new concept on that sentence you were just on, though. So I don't know if you want to go to the. <laughs> <laughs> So when I read it, it, this as stated, it feels much more like as as a person, as my personal rights. I don't read it a business in there, mm -hmm. and I but I do see that in the all users that like if you just put in AB 413 of of all users or in Nevada for all users, because I this just seems very individual centric to me when we have a lot of businesses to answer to as well. So that's the needs of all users on that, that, that part. Yeah. Yeah. So how, well, how do you we would put that where So like in AB 413, but I wouldn't have struck up Nevada. So like in AB 413, hold on, like for, for all users or something so like we that. we would use the language of, um, of different limitations. I don't know if it, it, does anyone, is that idea crazy or does that feel? <laughs> so what you're saying, I'm sorry, uh, Marie, this is Jake's farmer. So what you're saying, uh, uh, transportation funding was uh, meet the needs of all users. That was multi modal funding needs of all users. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let me try to find where you all are at so I can change uh, the second line on the, on the, on the second paragraph. Oh, <laughs> Too much fog on these glasses. Thank you, Jason. And then when you go back up to the first paragraph, mm -hmm. it does need to add in the report to the legislative um, body, the findings of the first paragraph. <laughs> 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 Finally, it could be that last sentence. Finally, the role of land use smart growth right. strategies can play must be considered and included in the report mm -hmm. to the legislature. Yeah. Uh, and that would include everything. Yeah. I think the first line, uh, Herschel decide ACEC, the first line can say an examination of the financial sustainability of the state highway fund must be undertaken and the recommendations should be included in the report to legislature. So the first line says clearly that everything is going to the legislature and then you don't need to include that last and include it in the legislature. You say it in the beginning itself. Okay. And recommendations. And recommendations okay. must be reported or included in the report or should must be reported to the legislatures, however you want to And then, yeah, and then the, next, the last line, you don't need to just say must be considered and you can do anything like that and include it in the report. So Bill Thomas, RTC Washoe, um, we get, I'm not even sure we get any of the state highway fund. Is this silent on the MPO's fuel tax revenue or how are we to be considered in the equation, I guess, is my question. Well, it's still part of the multimodal system regardless of where you're at. Um, so I don't think we could possibly do an analysis of the state highway fund primary funding source, the gas tax, without also saying, and this affects the RTCs, if that's the concern. Just want to be clear about what we're doing, because again, we don't, 
I can sit in this meeting and say, whatever you guys want to do with the state highway fund doesn't affect me, but that isn't the intent. That's all I'm saying. But I, I it very definitely does. Because so well, much for the highway system, you're right. <laughs> I mean, if I if I can't build new interchanges, it does very directly impact the the MPOs. It also impacts in terms of if we're adjusting our the revenue for the state highway fund, it could have a direct impact on the revenue available via other means mm -hmm. to the to the MPOs. So um, I, I think it's I think they are very interlinked. Bill, when Even you if there's not a money ability mean that revenue has to replace whatever you're currently receiving. Well, or I think all, all users and multi-modal needs of all users in the entire system. This is, uh, this is Doug Busselman again from the Nevada Farm Bureau. In the first sentence, right after the word recommendations, I guess I'm wondering if we should uh, say something about which accomplish sustainable results. In other words, instead of just examining the financial stability, shouldn't our recommendations also incorporate what we believe would be accomplishing that result? I, I guess maybe you want to resume the outcome. I, <laughs> Or I guess does that roll up under recommendations? You think? Okay. This is Danielle Monroe Moreno. For me, having wording it the way it is, the recommendations are going to go back to the legislative body. This working group won't make the final determinations. The final determinations are going to be made by the legislative body from the report that's given to the legislature in cooperation with the governor. So I think the recommendations that come out of this group, what you just said. It's just included in the word recommendations. All of that would be in that report. That's how I read it. Madam Chair, MJ Maynard, uh, RTC Southern Nevada. So it's not uncommon in the uh, in other states that the state highway fund also uh, provides some funding to the transit agencies, not just rural, but transit agencies in general. And I want to make sure it's very it's very different when we talk about the constitutional limitations of fuel revenue indexing and the fact that that can never be used unless you go through that whole laborious process you talked about change the constitution. So I, I, I'm I'm hoping, and I hate to use hope is not a good business strategy, but I'm, I'm <laughs> really hoping that we we have an opportunity when we look at ensuring that the state highway fund addresses the issues that we know we're facing, but potentially could also we could have evolve into you know thinking about is there somebody carved out for, for transit not just rural transit but transport and, and there are many many transit systems that are funded strictly by their state so I, I think that's important when we talk about there's an opportunity I think here that whatever recommendations and I don't know if it's I, I don't know if it's in the Constitution of state how we fund that this is strictly for rural transit but the model around the United States it's not uncommon that state uh, the state but funds also provide trend, uh, uh, funding for more than just roadways. In my head, <laughs> that is exactly what some of the conversation we have, but it may not be the highway fund in and of itself. Okay. Because yeah. the highway fund is based off of some sort of user fee right, right. now, the right. way, but it may be some, it may be another funding source. Like many, as you said, many states do provide funding, mm -hmm. but the funding they're providing comes from lots of different sources, okay. not exclusively a, a fuel okay. tax thing. Some right. of them come through payroll taxes, mm -hmm. some of them mm -hmm. come through general fund allocations. Right. So trying to figure that out and designate and make a recommendation, which, and it may or may not come out of that. I mean, <coughs> I think all of that's on the table. It could still. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, MJ, are you okay with the language as it is, noting that uh, we may include recommendations regarding the funding of transit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this. Yeah. Because I, I, I go back to to um, then to our um, to our chairwoman that we worked with in past sessions. That it really is going to be up to the state. To, once our recommendations are brought to you, it, you know, you'll determine the best way to again enact. Or, or or direct us to do more in terms of create, coming back with other recommendations for more of that multimodal uh, funding source. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Any other comments on the statement, Ms. Taylor? Well, I 
I have a question. So, in section four of the booklet on uh, that is unfunded transportation needs, is that included in this statement, or is that totally something that's like supplementary, something to think about? Well, I would read this to mean that getting a sustainable transportation funding to meet everyone's needs means all of those unfunded projects also. Okay. okay. Unless it, it may not meet all of them. May not meet all of them, but at least okay. that's what we're going to look at. Some of the unfunded needs that are presented in the booklet are local unfunded needs, which are not highway fund unfunded needs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I just want to be clear. We are focusing here mm -hmm. on the state highway fund, mm -hmm. which is different than the local needs. Correct. It's good for us to have a perspective and have an understanding of what the local needs are as well, because they're not they're not going to be addressed by this work. They might be helped by some of the conversations we have around land use and smart growth, um, but but we're not trying to address the condition of the road out your front door. Okay, so section four is just like for your information, this is all it all ties in. It's not necessarily part of this this particular statement. Um, um, let me just look at it. Section four is informational it's just and more informational. Okay. I just but, wanted to be clear. But it's large. A lot of what is presented in section four would be covered by this work. Okay. So all the NDOT needs would be covered by this work. A significant part, um, some of the MCO needs might be covered by this work. Um, and then that transit piece is that conversation that we're having. So a large, a large part of it would be. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Any other comments on the statement that we? The we have before you. Yeah, I guess I do belong on that uh, contract. Just based on what you just said, Christine, I guess I coming into this thing, I thought we were talking about all, and that's exactly what the reading here with the book that you said. Needs of all users of all different modes of transportation, including the block. But we you reported that you don't do transit. Do those particular things, but this is very specific. He said it's transit, so public transit users. So how does that fold into the, from the local state? In other words, I, I'm thinking that we're talking about going away from, or hoping to, finding some method, some kind of road user fee that's something other than a gas tax at the pump, right? Vehicle mile travel or something like that, which would kind of fold into everything. Transit, I think, is completely separate because it doesn't work. We had a little sidebar about that earlier. Right. But it needs to be discussed and try to figure it out if we can, right? So I, when we say state highway fund only, I guess I'm a little bit confused. Or but what we're talking about is at a minimum, we have to address the state highway fund because that's the reason, based on your last why we're here. At a minimum, we have to address the state highway fund, and it can't be in isolation. It has to be in the context of the other transportation funding methods that have to evolve to fund the multimodal needs. In my head, it's three recommendations. It's, this is the highway fund recommendation. This is the transit recommendation, which may be linked or could be constant, right? Mm -hmm. Highway fund, transit, land use. It's three pieces, mm -hmm. but what it's not, unless we choose to do it, which makes the when well, we started with the problem is challenging and complicated. What it's not is trying to figure out a path to fund the local agency shortfall because if you add that local agency shortfall in, the that need is exponentially greater than what we've talked about here today. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm Jamie Major, RTC, Southern Nevada, and I totally agree. I think I brought it up. This is an opportunity, and I, I mentioned earlier during my presentation that most transit agencies have multiple buckets of funding. It's not just sales tax. And so I think uh, if, if there's a recommendation, even if, if there was some funding that allowed us to, you know, help us with our electric uh, vehicle, vehicle conversion, something that is uh, that helps us in some way offset some of the costs. It's certainly, you know, our, our need is, and once you get this updated number, the need at the local level is, is, is great. It's, it's, a, it's a big number and there's no way that this, uh, the intent, of, it's my understanding the intent of this working group is not to address that. But I think when you look at, uh, do states 
Um, do they assist in some way, some, some finance, sometimes financially? Yes, so maybe there's something that comes out that can again help with some initiatives at the local level, but certainly not address the total funding challenge that we have. Thank you. Anyone in Northern Nevada have comments on this statement? Oh, sure. Can we can you put it up again, please? This is uh, Julie from DMV. Mm -hmm. So I I don't for for the way that it flows, I would on the paragraph two, I would strike that first sentence altogether and say new approaches to multimodal transportation funding must take into account blah 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 blah. And I think it flows better. Take the first sentence of the. Yep, take that out. Take it out, Kevin. Yep. Don't delete it yet. We're still looking at it. Thank you. <laughs> and then on the second sentence, the, the new first sentence, the one that starts new approaches and then add to multimodal transportation funding, you must take into account blah, 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 blah. Continue with the rest of the sentence. This, this is Brad. I agree with Julie, but maybe at the front of this new sentence, it should say consistent. With AB 413. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Good. Let's give Jeff a minute to work on that and take a look at it. This is Sandra from NDOT. I just wanted to make one clarification and it, it may need legal review too. But I, I think there's some confusion about the state highway fund versus the sources of funding. So the constitutional protection is on the user fees. That happen to go into the, the state highway fund. I don't think it prohibits other fund sources from going into that fund that can be used for other sources. So, you know, True. just the fact that it says the state highway fund doesn't mean that, that can't be used for other modes. It just means we need a new source going into it. I believe. Well, I think that's <laughs> our, our lawyer is, is not nothing that more. We can. We will be discussing uh, constitutional. Language typing at future meetings. So let's try to. We're we're getting close to our our <laughs> scheduled time here. So I'd like to wrap up by getting this overarching statement summary. We lost all users in the last change. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Bring them back. No users. Did we lose all users. We're, yeah. We're well, probably well, you can say funding for all users must take into account the need. Multimodal transportation funding for all users. All modes. Oh, okay. Yes. All users. Yeah. Transportation funding for all users. Transportation for all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this part, the funding is important because that's the that's the yeah. tax, that's the revenue. It sounds like we're funding users. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, that's how I initially read that first. Yeah. Um. Oh, that's well, true. I think Marie's point was it's not just the people who use it, it's also businesses. businesses. Well, it's like it, I want to be practices, but there's also fleets. Like there's more than just individual users. There are businesses that also are going to be very interested in how we approach this. Yeah, users of the system. It's still the system users. I'm fine with system users. I just the way it originally read, it felt very individual rights versus thinking about this. Any any other comments on this statement? Are we good with the statement? <laughs> okay, so um, if you are in favor of adopting this statement for our mission for the next eight to 12 months, um, then I would ask for a motion to adopt the statement. So moved. Do have a motion? Okay. Um, any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. The next item, the last item on our agenda, is public comment. This is our second public comment period. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. So we'd like to ask at this time if there are any members of the public who would like to make some public comments. Anyone in Southern Nevada? 
Any public commenters in northern Nevada? Okay, seeing none in southern Nevada or in northern Nevada, then um, I want to thank you all for your attendance today. Uh, reminder, the next meeting is Tuesday, September 14th. There will not be a meeting in October. So thank you all for your participation today. We're adjourned. If anybody wants it. All right.